halfway through homework and then I realized, oh shoot, I I I think it's time for me to join now. <laughs> oh, that'd be a good idea. Speaking We're even live. Yeah. Yeah. And we are live. Uh, if you're still in a turn out okay, even in this pandemic world where schedules and changes happen at the flick of an eye. Today, we were originally going to have a, a talk about bear monology and Jackson Lee, but he had to work. And we were also going to have an after show with, with Eric, but Kent had the water, a, a water incident. So now it's a pre show. Yeah. yeah. Debate right. prep and pre show. Who would win? Who would win? Kent Hovind or a cup of water? <laughs> water. Uh, oh. Water. Yeah, the water. <laughs> okay, from top, from top left, right, across. Everybody introduce yourself. Uh, hello, my name is TD Lane. I, I'm going to have a video coming out tomorrow. Awesome. That is all. Nice. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I run the Dapper Dino YouTube channel. I mostly do some creationist debunking, but there's some other stuff in there. I just recently had a video about Star Trek The Next Generation and the things they got wrong about linguistics. Um, I also do some uh, a Leaving Young Earth Creationism series, which I think... Th what half of the panel has been on. <laughs> uh, let's see. I also have uh, an off topic channel, but don't bother with that. It's just me doing silly things. And uh, yeah, come check out the channel if you want to. Alrighty. And uh, I am Eric Birthaler. I go by Eric Birthaler92 on YouTube. I've probably been the one that has been on YouTube the longest out of all of us i've been on since april 2009 when i was just a freshman in high school holy crap time flies so i started off my channel as a movie channel but then as time went on eventually it started to branch off into other things like i i would talk about some philosophy religion and just some stuff going on in the world and and um i recently got into doing creation and evolution debates and which we're going to be talking about one that was supposed to happen on the 30th but because of technical issues or or so they say it's and for all of you who do not know it is rescheduled to tomorrow five o'clock central time so i just hope that no problems are going to happen that will prevent it <clears throat> and uh, I used to be a younger creationist, but I uh, I left it around August 2018, and I'm now a theistic evolutionist. I'm going to school for filmmaking and uh, paleontology, and and yeah, and that's all I got. Thank you. Well, my name's uh, Colton. I go by Corporal Anon on uh, Reddit and also on these YouTube streams. Um, I'm a geology student. Like Eric, I'm a former young earth creationist uh, turned theistic evolutionist. I've been on this uh, show a couple of times before. Hopefully I'll be able to show up again in the future to do other presentations of my own. That's all I got. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny from Jen's Little Corner. Um, I do um, science... Um, Debunking videos of, um, you know, uh, young young earth creationists and flat earthers and people like that. Um, I cover a lot of science um, and LGBTQ issues. Um, I put out a video yesterday, um, which was about the math of why Mercury is the planet in the solar system that is closest to all the other planets. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, if you guys are talking about your qualifications, uh, I, I, um, in, I did maths and computer science. So, uh, that's my field. So. Awesome, awesome. And, um, I, w I was a Christian, but I was never a young earth creationist. Um, I was, um, more a secular Christian and then moved from there into a form of paganism and then into atheism. So, so, sorry, Dapper, no, no new guest for your show. Oh, well, that's all right. You know what? We I think I have a new guest. Yeah, I do have a new guest scheduled for next week. So it's, it's not like a thing that I have to do every week. But, yeah, don't worry. There will be more leaving Young Earth creationism. So, <laughs> so uh, how many of you have been in debates before? I've debated Kent Hovind. There's, there's one. Two. All right. So what goes, in, what goes into prepping for a debate? Like what? 
So I, I'm I, sure you have the gist of what the other person generally thinks. You definitely yeah. don't want to go in unprepared. Oh yeah, yeah. and uh, and probably and probably your biggest ally about that is do as much research about your opponent as much as possible because if not, well, and then when they throw a bunch of stuff at you, you'll get stumped, and and then that could seriously affect your performance. Yeah. I, I would say that the two big things we want to do is take a look at what your opponent has said in the past about the, whatever topic it is you're talking about. And also um, get together, get your opening uh, thing, your opening statement. Your opening statement should be able to give a complete rundown of all the major aspects of your evidence for your position and practice it. After you write it out, after you get the outline, try to write it out and then practice it and see if you can time yourself and get within that time without seeming like you're rushing and without going over. Cause you, you don't want to talk like a, you know, a, uh, an auctioneer, right? You don't want to be going a mile a minute, but you also need to come in on time. And I know that um, Kent's debates are a little less formal with the time, but he still tries to ask for 10 minute openings, I think, or at least he did with me. So um, oh. yeah, when I that's a ridiculous that level of opening. You know, when I listen to when I listen to Erica's last debate, she could like all information like ten minutes. Like she could go, she could go like really fast. I cannot do that. I yeah, think. and uh, you are talking about the one that she had recently with Standing for Truth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I got about like halfway through it, but I just didn't have time to finish it. And uh, and uh, and yeah, and and as far as when that person said you need to practice, I think that. That was one of my downfalls for when I debated Cody. I think I should have practiced it a little bit more and had the time limit. I was trying to force as much info as I possibly could. And that's why if you go back and rewatch my debate with Cody, I was talking fast. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah. So, You're yeah. much better off covering the basic points um, yeah. to get your yeah. point across and then leaving it for the central, central debate to pull apart ideas. Yeah. And I guess you you should know your your opponent's topic as well as your own topic too. Well, fortunately, with uh, well, Kent, that's, well, that's easy. Yeah. Well, it, it depends who you're debating. I mean, if you if you're debating somebody who's intellectually honest, it's it's a lot easier than if you're debating somebody like Kent Hovind, who's yeah. um, because who who because isn't because I mean Kent's Kent's plan is to gish gallop and run yeah. you over with topics so that you can't keep keep up with where he's at, which yeah. then makes you look like you don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's his plan anyway. So if you're going to debate somebody who's going to be intellectually dishonest like that, you've got to hold them to their points. So, you go, oh, no, hang on a minute. You've just given me one point. I'm going to answer that. Right. Yeah. And that's hard to uh, do against. Yeah, but I, 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 that relies on you having a very good moderator. Yeah, I remember uh, Erica's debate against, uh, was it, I think it was Bill or Matt or something like that. that. And, and apparently, did he, did he not even know that her topic? He apparently he didn't, didn't even know his own topic, according to Erica. Like I think I might know who you're talking about. I think you're talking about Raw Matt. Maybe. Yeah. He, she was like, like, don't you? She, like Erica or somebody brought the other creationists, you know, the point, like, I don't know those, I don't know those, who that is. I don't know who that is. Like, like, he didn't know his own topic that, that well. Was that Bill Morgan, maybe? Yeah. I think that that might be who he's talking about. Yeah, because then Bill Morgan came on uh, to my channel for an after show, and it was, well, I'll, I'll just, my favorite bit was, I, I mentioned to him that in previous debates, he had promised to do some research, and then because the same topic came up, it, <clears throat> sorry, during the after show, I asked him, have you done that research? And this was, you know, months later after he originally said he would. No, hadn't even looked at it. I was like, well. But they don't care, generally. No, they don't. Um. I mean, you you get the same thing with um, Ken Hovind, who um, you know his his run of the mill thing is uh, I don't know anything about that, and then move on to his next topic. So, I, which is fine as long as he's going to admit the point that he actually doesn't know what he's talking about, but he never does, and then he'll go and claim victory just because he gish galloped the person. Yeah, I would I would highly encourage to stick on things if he doesn't know. Make him yeah. make him explicitly make him state it. it. That's yeah. that's. Um, yeah. That yeah, was, I, I think, the best part about my debate and Conspiracy Cats' debate. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, you hold them to it. I know Kim Kildia of this and the other, 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 other ones, but how many of them actually like, like stick on the topic 
of the thing, like the, talking about evolution, or whatever, and they, they bring up like what well, well, yeah, 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 movies or whatever, and people bring like oh the Big Bang and and this and that and and cars. I'm like, what's that do with evolution at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, Kent, Kent has a massive double standard. He can bring up whatever he wants, but you can't bring up anything right outside of the specific topic. Essentially, yeah. Very, very telling if you were to ask me, and and. You know, and as far as Kent not knowing what he's talking about, I, I mean, we all have known that for a while, but, but you know, but probably the one that um, that blew my mind the most it, it, it is when he actually admitted, and, and this was something that I used against him during my last debate with him, and I was, well, I don't want to give away spoilers, but, <laughs> but you know, but the fact that he admitted to Dapper Dino that he doesn't know what a dinosaur is. And he's been calling himself Dr. Dino for 20 years. I mean, that's like saying you're, you're going to call yourself the Dr. Teeth, but you don't know anything about dental care. Right. But let's yeah. be honest about him. He's I think, been calling himself a doctor for years, and he doesn't even have a doctoral. He, he's got a piece of paper that says he does. I think I think my favorite... I think my favorite... <laughs> I can have one Kent of those in five him. minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite uh, screw-up from Kent was uh, when I found out that he thinks that apparently each chromosome has your entire genome. Mm -hmm. And oh. also that uh, nucleotides um, are base pairs. A and and each nucleotide is a gene. Oh, that too. And also that he thinks that entire chromosomes completely unspool uh, during cellular division. And he said that huh? he taught science, but, you know, but as far as my knowledge goes, he has never said, you know, where he taught science at. So honestly, I would not be surprised if he's full of crap about that, too. Oh, it was just preaching creation science, like a ministry thing for yeah, so uh, some church it, group of kids. It was, an, it was a, I believe, two or three different <coughs> places that were characterized as private Christian schools, but one of the things is, yeah. for one thing that you'll find not too infrequently is that um, various churches, uh, especially evangelical churches, will start tiny little schools where they'll get whatever it is that the state requires for them to say that they're a school and for people attending there to not need to also go to the public school. And then generally speaking, their English and math is actually usually fairly well taught. Um, I, I've actually known a number of people who've gone to these schools, and yeah, they actually came up with pretty good English and math skills. But the science and history is um, pretty biblically bad. based. <laughs> yeah, it's they basically would have been better off just not having attended those classes. Honestly, and that does not surprise me at all. Hey, real fast, Colton. Yeah, did you, did you delete your account or anything? Because I can't find. I think I had before. I, it's not working now. Yeah, I'm not really into making YouTube videos myself. Because I mean, you had one before, like one video. Yeah, before. but it was it was so much work just for doing that that I really didn't find it that inspiring. Yeah, anymore. and with how my life is going, you know, I just haven't had as much time to make videos. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, as I mean, I try as often as I can, but you know, but when life gets in the way, it can be easier said than done. Lately, I've had nothing but time to make videos. <laughs> Going yeah, back to the education that. thing you were saying, Dapper, um, we, down here um, we have quite heavy rules about um, the curriculum that schools have to teach, but I've seen the education papers, uh, paperweight that comes out of uh, a fundamentalist Christian school that teaches young earth. And, um, yeah, they teach the science, but they will teach it like, and then God created this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like, so, so it's sort of there enough that they get past the rules, <laughs> and then it's like, that doesn't matter because this is what the Bible says. Well, so many public schools already push evolution like to the end of the course just to not stir stuff up with parents that I'm not really surprised they can get away with that. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there was this one uh, science teacher who I met in, like, shoot, I would say around... Uh, winter time 2018, somewhere around there. Uh, uh, he said that he was a biology teacher and he said that he was a Christian. And th then after that, I th thought to myself, hey, he teaches biology and biology is the main idea of all about evolution. So that means he teaches evolution. And I thought, oh man, 
he must get the backlash of of his entire lifetime from young earth creationist parents and so and then i walked up to him and, and i was just asking him hey so if you don't mind me asking i'm just curious like how you handle all that and yeah and and, and yeah and pretty much he i mean it's pretty much this the same thing that mary schweitzer has to deal with like getting all this constant hate mail from young earth creationists i, I mean mary schweitzer has gotten more hate mail from young earth creationists than she has from anyone else. And so, what? But I thought the scientific community was putting a gun to her head and saying, prove this is biofilm or we take away your job. <laughs> That's the Wait, impression you certainly get reading what the Young Earth creationists talk about it. Which is yeah. funny that you mentioned that because the very first time that I went to this Young Earth Museum in my state, that was when I, I, I full on converted to YEC. There was this one Young Earth creationist parent there with her kid. And um, and then she lied a a about the whole soft tissue thing. She said, "Oh yeah, oh well." Museum of the Rockies had to fire her is because they said, "Oh well, we're gonna have to let you go." It's because that you know, because of what you found goes against our whole model. But but that never happened. She is getting a lot of money to continue this research project on this stuff. People aren't freaking out about it. They're saying, wow, if we can get some sort of protein information, that means we can reconstruct the DNA, which is really cool. But no. Yeah. Assuming no, no, no. the DNA is smart that length of time, though. Yeah. yeah and, uh, oh, sorry. sorry uh, about, no, but they can yeah. use, like, the protein to, I think, reconstruct what the DNA code would have needed to be to get that. To some extent, uh, yeah. Every, yeah. So you, if you get a uh, amino acid sequence out of a protein, there are only there's only a limited number of post possible ways to ex to get that protein out of DNA. But each uh, amino acid can be coded for by more than one codon, so you can't fully reconstruct. Yeah, it gives you a range, though. It's useful yeah. information. It, it, it would be cool if that. It, it, yes, it useful it, information, but you couldn't reconstruct the genome of of a creature just yeah, from yeah. the it, from the cool. protein. I mean, it'd be right. cool, could a little bit, a little bit to see if if the D are are if it matches what we already know of the with the uh, bone structures and stuff of the dino, like dinosaurs, or whatever. If the well, the peptides she did have marked are uh, pretty close to birds, so I mean, yeah, it's confirming one, what we've expected. I mean, that would be expected given that yeah. birds are dinosaurs. So yeah, you yeah. you can. Potentially, if you can get this reconstruct uh, one of the stable genes uh, sequences used for phylogenetics, potentially use that in those. Albeit, there's numerous issues with how complete they could be. Uh, but, I mean, but, in all honesty, you'd be better off starting with an emu or a chicken and going backwards if you wanted to make a dinosaur. Yeah. About a, exactly. a month. That's, about that's a being month. worked on. Oh, oh, sorry, fast. About a <laughs> I month. hope it's not being worked so, on, to be honest. About it is. Can you hear me? Am I dead? Am I muted? Oh, yeah. Can we let Vendalia speak? <laughs> yes. About a month ago, I had like I had James from Martin the day debate on the, on the show, and we talked about you know debates and stuff, and how they've kind of like changed or evolved through through the day. It's not the before you know they had the debate, you know the, the opening, the, the rebuttal, all that stuff. Now it's more like an opening and a, a discussion. Like, you think debates have changed like from the time like from a few years ago when. And they had the the Ken versus Bill debate to, to debates now. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you were to go on that channel, Modern Day Debate, and then you compare, you know, like the video production and the quality overall from like the older videos to the ones now, yeah, you definitely can see a uh, you definitely can see a con a uh, like a contrast. But yet, it is understandable. It's because, you know, that is how, you know, most big channels, you know, start off, you know, all of them start off small and th then they work their way up. But, you know, but I it just I meant how, how debates themselves, have they changed? Oh, yeah. Like, they have, like, you know, like, yeah, like. Significantly yeah, higher quality. Yeah, like, now it seems like that they're really doing a lot of flat earth debates when, when they used to not do those at all and then okay, 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 not, not, okay, okay. different question altogether different question i mean like old school debates like like uh, in front of people you know right i'm not talking about the quality of the debates and stuff i'm talking about you know the uh how debates the change of format yeah tell how they're structured themselves how they used to have 
uh, this happens now, this happens now, this happens now. Now it's more like an open discussion than an actual debate. So, not, they're not, they're not counter out. From what I see, they're not counter arguing with each other. There's like, there's talking now. Well, I think yeah, that makes I think sense. Think that's because... the need for people to see dumpster fires more than anything else. Because if you have a structured debate, you generally don't end up in a dumpster fire. But if you have an open discussion, you will get there. But yeah, definitely the most heated debate on there, at least the one I've seen, was definitely the one in, that was on like that uh, Texas tour with Nathan Thompson and a team skeptic. <laughs> oh man, that one got heated. And, you know, as much as I love team skeptic, you know, as much as he's right on the topic, I kind of think he let his emotions get to him a little bit too much during. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he actually performed well in that debate. Which is sad. It was because, trust me, I really wanted him to win. But but the fact that he just had to resort to ad hominem attacks without actually trying to refute what he said, man, that was a debate I was so disappointed about. Have but you ever, ever got angry at the, at the in the middle of the debate? Like you had to hold yourself down. Yeah, Nathan and team do have a past in, together, so that could probably play into it. It doesn't help that Nathan's a bit of an asshole too, so he it tends to wind people yeah, up. And if you can't only, control only that, bit. you're just going to respond and be part of that. Only so, a bit. All right. Uh, there actually is this video. I, I have it shared in my favorites of Nathan. Thompson like screaming at this girl he was dating and and yeah and I mean that this video really showed his true colors man if you want me to share it to you I definitely can but yeah I mean that was very very telling of his character and that's why that I'm not a fan of yeah, it. Yeah. So what about you Dapper you ever, you ever got angry but you didn't hold it down in, in, in any of your debates? Um I would not say that I've been angry. I have been annoyed. Um, I was particularly annoyed, really, in the Kentoven debate. Um, the things that annoyed me the most were, um, at one point, during a phone call with Kent, trying to help set up the debate, um, I answered a particular question for him. And the only reason I consent to, to answer it is because I said, the, I will answer this question for you right now, off air but only if it is not brought up during the debate. Then he decided to bring it up. And I opted to simply move past and not engage with that at all, explicitly so. I, that annoyed me. Uh, the other thing that annoyed me was uh, his continual shifting away from the actual substance of the debate. So that annoyed me. Um, or birds at all, like talking about something completely different. Oh yeah, he went into things like you know the a, a fictional biography of Charles Darwin, which is, I, I mean, it follows barely any of the actual events of Dar or Darwin's life, and instead he makes things up like Darwin hated birds, or that Darwin like was bad at school or something, or that he his dad tried to get him a job on the ship, which is like literally all of that is just completely wrong. Yeah, if if you actually read anything about Darwin, you quickly find, oh, hey, Kent's lying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, like, but don't you know the winners to, write the history to book? To be fair to Kent, he is a tiny bit stupid as along with being dishonest, so uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he thought it was real. Well, he does seem to be very likely to simply credulously accept anything from a source that yeah. has similar biases to him. And... No extremely unlikely to fact check anything. In fact, oh. <laughs> no, he fact checks so nothing. Our, our, our five-year-olds, even a five-year-old know the difference. Well, actually, I did, I did that experiment. Um, it's on my channel. It's one of my, it's not very, one of my very well-performing videos, but um, last August I was in South Carolina at a, uh, at a rental property with some of my family, uh, my parents, um, one of my brothers, my sister, their spouses and their kids. And, um, I had young kids around and I could ask them a question. So I put up, uh, I believe it was a Utyrannus, a Microraptor, um, some other non-bird, but some bird-like animal. And then I, 
some Mesozoic actual bird. I don't remember which one it was. doesn't really matter. But none of them actually picked the bird as the one that was the odd one out. So apparently, by Kent's own technique of asking small children to pick which one is in a different kind, birds are the same kind as dinosaurs. And since they answered inconsistently, all of those animals are the same kind. So Eutyranus is the same kind as a bird, apparently. There you go. Yeah, by Kent's own chosen method. Yeah, there have been a lot of things that have irritated me about him. Like, uh, like when I was setting up this uh, new debate with him, I made it very clear the debate topic is are birds dinosaurs? But then uh, his uh, secretary said, oh, well, the topic is going to be did dinosaurs live with people along if if birds are dinosaurs? And I was like, wait, wait, wait. No, I never said this topic is did people live with dinosaurs? And besides, I already did that debate with him. And then right before the debate, Kent had on his screen, the dinosaur turned to birds. I was like, Kent, are, are, are you kidding me? I have told you so many times the debate is are birds dinosaurs. And then right before the debate started, he changed. Well, and, well, then you can say, it. It, 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 do people with dinosaurs say yes? Yes, they did. I'm eating one right now. <laughs> and I'm yeah. oh, sorry, but this is something that I, I should address. So right before the debate, we were we were all in, you know, the chat. And then he brought up that he thinks that this pandemic is just a big hoax. Oh, oh man, oh. it took so much willpower. Go outside, Ken. Have fun. That's all I, I mean, I it took so much willpower for me to just not burst out yelling at him, calling him a moron. It's like, you know, th this thing is definitely not a hoax. People have died from it. Yeah, I, I have a video about his COVID-19 conspiracy theories. Well, so I can't wait till he finds another damn apple seed or something that cures it. Well, all of his people are, probably all his people are, are, are clustered together in that little <coughs> compound of his now. Well, so he's he's hosting a fishing competition. Oh, fun! Yeah, he's, he's he already did a stream about how um, taking lots of vitamins is going to cure COVID. Yeah, that was what I covered in that video. I did um, so I do a regular show every Tuesday. Yeah, every every Tuesday I do a show called Kent with Bent, where my friend Ben, who for comedic purposes is going by Ben Tovind, no relation, um, comes on and we need we watch some ridiculousness that Kent Hovind has put out. Usually we go through some of his seminars because he at least stays on a topic. So we can have like a, a conversation where we don't have to shift gears every 20 seconds. But after he put out that video that uh, Jens, you were just talking about, or Jens, yeah. Jens, your yeah. name probably isn't actually normally in the possessive case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that Jens was just talking about. Um, yeah, so we did that as like a special episode. We we're going to change gear because it was bad. And he had some <coughs> pushes uh, vitamin pills and Kent Hoven himself shell sells Shackley vitamins and Shackley vitamins is a pyramid scheme company. They're one of the multi-level yeah. marketers. So it's like, oh yeah. And this guy, Bill party was his name. His, one of his main things is if you eat enough grape skins, you'll just never die. Apparently. <laughs> uh, uh, it, uh, it was disgusting. That it whole was, thing. Um, speaking of Kent and and Kid and stuff, was there any fallout of that incident a few weeks ago or months ago? Now, so <clears throat> I don't think that there has been any criminal investigation. Um, it's How? so it looks like right now the family is probably not going to be suing him. Um, so one of the reasons for that is that people are informed at entry to Dinosaur Adventureland that they are entering at their own risk and that Dinosaur Adventure Land does not accept liability. Uh, so basically the only way you could really get any kind of case is if you could prove that it was basically manslaughter. And I don't think there's evidence for that. It does look like it was a case of the boy slipping on a dock, hitting his head and going into the water. I never so, heard about this. Oh, you didn't hear about this? A few weeks ago, uh, a seven-year-old boy drowned. It's about a month now, isn't it? Oh, it, it might be, yeah. It's like a really him. run-down, lame theme park. Yeah. So, Liability uh, and all. Whoa. Yeah, it's oh. Kent does not have any insurance at Dinosaur Adventureland for uh, guests, which is why... Surely that would be a requirement? Yeah, that's what I thought. So I don't know about the laws in Alabama. Somebody I should look into that. that. But, um... 
so that's one of the things is I don't know what he's technically characterizing this uh, enterprise as legally. And um, there are ways to reduce your liability by pe having people sign waivers. So, I mean, yeah, I don't I'll, know how much he's doing legally, but I do know that in this, the one time he talked about it publicly, he went on the stream, mentioned that this has happened, and his response was, well, the rest of his siblings had a great time, and they can't wait to come back. And then he started to talk yeah. about someone who had called him out for having a kid drown in his park on Twitter. That's who we talked about afterwards. Oh, like, yeah. Only because this is the same guy who'd been investigating him. I mean, yeah. I'm sure, sure, From, their, uh, sure, um, their, like, sure, their brother died, but they had a good. Besides the, besides the death, traumatic, traumatic death of someone dying in front of them, they had a great time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember. No, he's, he's full of shit. Oh, don't him. worry, I, my I, girlfriend I, fell off the top that deck of the ark. And you know, <laughs> I think that he knows that he's full of crap. It's because of the, the fact that he's been corrected too many times. And well, there have been times where he'll say, oh, well, I know that you're going to say that they're you who carry oats. And so and then he already knows. He's, and so that he already knows what the answer is. Think about this. Yeah. His, his level of dumbassery is so high. And his level of um, idiotic self-confidence is so high that he won't accept corrections. Not even from creationists. When, yeah. you have, okay. when you have a PhD geologist, Andrew Snelling, and a physicist, uh, Russell Humphrey, say, hey, look, dude, we agree with you completely, but magnetic reversals happened. Plate tectonics is real. And he'll still say, well, it's okay. They're wrong. I'm right. When he's and, got no relevant education at all. I, I will, I will say one thing. I did successfully correct him, and he accepted the correction one time, and it was in comments, not in live. He actually accepted one? Yep. I, he went on, on a stream and he was talking about Roman Catholics thinking that holy water would turn into the blood of Jesus during the Mass. And in the comments I said, uh, Ken, I think you mean the wine, not not the holy water. It's not relevant to his script and that's the only reason he accepted right, exactly. it. And he said, oh yeah, that is right. Yeah. I did mean the wine. Uh, and oh. Although it, it still baffles me that he got something so basic wrong. Like, I, I, we'll I don't think he cares out. when he's rattling off his script. We'll yeah, it's, it, it's we'll getting probably, from point to point. I, yeah, I don't sorry. Believe that or not, so, but according to him, probably Catholics aren't real Christians anyway. Is going to him. Oh, he is one of those. Uh, the, the Catholics aren't. Is he real. also a King James only weirdo? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yes. That was not always the case. Actually, that was something that developed, I believe, and finally took hold during um, his yeah. prison time. Uh, he also changed his eschatology during prison. And according to according to even to even one of like one of Erica's videos, King James isn't the oldest English Bible. It's not. It's I think it's like number three or four. Although it's hard to say because there are always people translating various bits into English. Like um, we have significant portions of the New Testament in Old English, dating all the way back into like the uh, the ninth century. <coughs> Some of which I've read. What language was the was the first printed Bible, like the Gutenberg Bible? German. German one. Yep. Das ist gut. When it yep. became, when the people besides scribes can, and priests could actually start reading now. And <laughs> yeah, well, it's it, it was basically just because, you know, if you're handwriting things, it takes a lot. Like, try handwriting any book of any size. It's going to take you a long time. Yeah, uh, and yeah, sorry. and you know, just me by and writing. Every time you screw up, you have to like whole, redo the whole yeah. page, or just like screw it, don't notice. Yeah, <laughs> well, that yeah. often happened. That's why you get a lot of insertions and um, changes throughout history because you know, if you uh, mistranslate a word or you misre miswrote something, you just left it. Yeah, it was too much work to rewrite the entire yeah, although, page again. Although generally, um, scribes were not doing translation works. There's actually very few translators. No in the history of uh of the bible up until modern times because most, most, most of the time it was still in latin because <coughs> so after read it well so after jerome's translation um in the western roman empire it was almost entirely just um transcribed from latin to latin and and then back to latin again and back to latin so it was always being in latin but um in the eastern roman empire and the subsequent states that grew up after uh, Muslim conquests a few hundred years later, uh, the Septuagint was used for the Old Testament, which was in Greek, and then the Old Testament itself maintained its Greek form, and that was what was copied consistently throughout all of those centuries. 
And when um, people started making translations in the West, what then primarily happened is that they went to um, their own language, the Greek Old Testament, and translated it to their their language. And then there was some inconsistency for a while. But nowadays, most translations of the Old Testament come from the Masoretic text, which is a text compiled by Jewish scholars uh, around the fourth century. So, because yeah, I, 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 I think that's what. That's, so something like that, sorry, reference and stuff trying to happen because you know once you read the Bible yourself instead of having it having it read to you, and, t- and having the priest or whatever tell the, tell you what it says when you're reading it yourself, you're like like oh, wait a minute, that's not what that priest did before. Yeah, yeah, it did allow for them to start calling out um, on biblical teachings. Yeah. Oh, actually, interestingly, with the whole translation thing though, there was a lot more translating going on in the Eastern Roman Empire than there was in uh, in the Western Roman Empire and the subsequent various states that grew up after its collapse like the, because, like the, um, like the orthodox brand yeah of it. yeah so in the in the orthodox church the typical um the the typical thing that would happen is that when missionaries went someplace they would then translate their scriptures into whatever the language was and that's why you get um cyril and methodius creating a uh, a church slavonic bible which was then updated to new church slavonic a few hundred years later and has since then kind of fossilized but it's also why you get uh coptic copies of the bible in coptic which is the latest form of the the language of the egyptians before it basically became arabic um you also get uh bibles in georgian um things like that so those are if you're looking at pre-modern bible translations they almost all occur once almost always directly from greek and then they tend not to be updated with the one exception of Old Church Slavonic turning into New Church Slavonic, and that's about it. Have you guys ever seen the uh, Church Schism series from Extra Credits History? I, I don't, don't think so. No, no, no. I like to tell you, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's 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 the pre, well, it's 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 the early. So it's pre Protestants and pre Orthodox split. So like in the like the early early days, all these uh, all these you know they were talking about during the time of the um. Uh, Canceled Nicaea Creed, you know, we're talking about this stuff, how, how the, they're trying to prevent fractures from happening. Well, every every one of the major uh, councils did end up causing some kind of schism. Um, so, for instance, um, if you look at the first council of Nicaea, it's not like the teachings of Arius, who was the person that the council was basically convened as a trial for. I and mean, they did other stuff, too. But that was the big topic. Um, like, when he was exiled, he just went yeah. into the Persian Empire and started his own churches. And that happened pretty much every one of the major church councils. So um, actually, there really aren't any surviving uh, Aryan groups, at least not ones with historical ties to the original Arius. But there are still uh, groups tied to Nestorius, who was the subject of a later uh, church council. Yeah, appa- apparently, from the, the videos I, I watched, apparently that's the co- that was one of the causes of the barbarians in the they when they came they didn't kind of they didn't really uh what's the word at first they didn't really like can glow with the romans because they were more Aryans than the, the romans were that that did happen in some cases uh because there were uh Aryan churches that heavily proselytized in uh germanic areas so there were actually a fair few um Germanic Aryan churches, and it did cause friction with when uh, those Germans would move into the heavily Catholic um, Roman areas. And of course, they didn't have very many cultural or historical ties to the uh, various Latin and early Romance language speaking populations. So it was a uh, was a bit rough. Only a bit. And and hey, this is how I prove that I do in fact have that history degree that's on my wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From from what I remember, it involved a lot of barbarians, um, mm-hmm. Rome practically burning to the ground, and various successor states fighting over the remains. Yeah, I, I sent you the, the the video playlist in the private chat. Oh, cool. And also, uh, my my video is in there about if you want to see Kent Hoven getting genetics amazingly wrong like just to a level that you will have hard a hard time believing actually occurred that's there and um it's also one one where i like to thank uh dead kennedy in space i don't know if you guys know who he is who? yeah uh, yeah but dead kennedy in space did me a really big favor because um this was recorded back in december where i had been sick for like a week and a half 
and I just couldn't record. I recorded like the intro or something. I don't even know if I did that. It, but, but yeah, he did all the audio work for me and I am eternally grateful because I think it came out really well. He's got a great voice for all this stuff. And yeah, it, <laughs> thank you very much if you are, are watching this or ever do uh, Dead Candy in Space. I so, really appreciate it. I just realized I wasn't subscribed to you, Dappa. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so, well, sorry about that. Now you are. I oh, there now I am. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate it. Yeah. So, Jen, you're from Aust you're from Australia, right? So you so so you're more in the area of Ken Ham and Ray Comfort. Uh oh. Oh well, yeah. Ray wow. New Ray Comfort is New Zealand, but yeah. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> and Ken <laughs> Ham's yours now. We're not taking him back. So yeah, you you guys shipped him over here, and uh, we can't get rid of him now. She so, can't. Yeah, but you got you guys. The heard we don't want him. <laughs> I have a problem with that. So, well, are, are they dumber or smarter than Kent? Smarter. Oh, uh, I wouldn't call Ken Ham smarter than him. I, I would wouldn't. call AIG smarter than him. Well, Ken well, Hovind dumb. does not have the brain power to look at a piece of folded rock and say. Huh, does that seem like it's consistent with the rock being solid when it was folded? Or could it maybe have been not completely lithified? Andrew Snelling can do that. Andrew Snelling just puts people in front of the cracks he says aren't there. I will give credit where credit's due. Ken Ham does seem smarter than Kent Hoven is, though. But, but yeah. Well, he hasn't gone to prison, so that's got to count for something. <laughs> yeah, because that yeah. Too, he also he just has a successful has... business in general. Oh, yeah. I do want. Have you guys heard about the the fallout with the Australian branch of AIG. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, Which eventually yeah. became CMI, yeah. Right. They're no longer the same organization because oh, basically... they haven't been since, like, 2001. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a long time. But, yeah, it was. it's amusing because we really... Ken Ham really has become sort of the American's problem for that reason. Like, he couldn't even maintain friendly relations with the Australian branch of AIG that was run by his brother, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And when they had they had their split because Ken Ham kept trying to take like financial moves at what would then become Creation Ministries International. And apparently that also stemmed from tension that existed from an earlier issue back in like the late 80s where uh, somebody was accused of necrophilia and witchcraft. What? Oh dear. Yeah. I never yeah. heard about that. Yeah, that's, that's like heresy. <laughs> well, that's well, there's a reason I can find the link on the NCSC talks about it. Hold on, hold on. What was that, Jen? Sorry. Uh, his original reason for leaving Australia was because he'd um, pilfered money out of the um, religious organization he was involved with before he um, created Answers in Genesis. Shocker. And uh, I, I sent the link to it. Yeah. So that, I, that was part of the whole thing. You know, he... Um, that it was sort of like a um, he couldn't stay here and be accepted as part of the community and uh, that part of the community anymore. He had to get out, but he actually uh, does have a degree, unlike uh, an actual legitimate degree, unlike um, Hovind. Yeah, I can't remember that, what it's in, but that he does is actually the have only one. thing that makes him smarter than Hovind. Well, he also he surrounds yeah, he himself. Degree. He also surrounds himself with people who also have degrees, whereas Kent Hovind uh, yeah. surrounds himself with. X cons primarily, it seems like Kent Holman really is the the Joe Exotic of creationism. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's no it, wonder his son doesn't want anything to do with him. I, yeah, I know. Oh my goodness! And, and, and yet his son his son mouths off his dad's whole rhetoric. Well, no, not so much now, but he used to. Oh yeah, have you seen the um the I can't remember what the series is called, but it's a it's a collaboration. No, well, I mean, go watch that too, but because um, that's on my channel, of course. But it's a it's a collaboration between um, Apologia and um, Logic, Logic, where they take Kent Hove, or Kent Hoven and Eric Hoven, and they they sort of play them over each other because they're saying oh, the exact yeah, same yeah. thing with the same timing and the same jokes. And it's a, yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, they're only marginally modernized by Eric. <laughs> hey, right. hey, hey! You want to know what Eric Hoven is? An what? imperfect copy of Kent Hoven. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Some may right. say he's the he's evolution the of Kent Hoven. Exactly. I, he's not. He's not improving uh, the well, Kent I'm Hoven not model. Oh no, he's proof of genetic entropy. Actually, uh, I, no. I, I'll say I'm this. Actually, I think you know, he... I'm actually old enough to remember those merry go they are talking about. I used to have there'd be one in, in the park. Oh, a few miles right from my right. I, I used to live growing up, so I actually nice. had one of those merry go spin around and around, and around, and I threw up on one. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> never went never went 55 five miles an hour went to a tree like they, they said we should do be doing but you know i still but if you had you would have conserved angular momentum thereby proving that evolution is false somehow because uh, yes because problems with the solar nebular hypothesis are completely relevant to evolution <laughs> and the thing is none of the things he talks about are actually problems <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, the solar thing, the angular momentum, is an actual issue for the hypothesis, but it's, it's not in the way they describe it. Right. It's like, oh, Venus is rotating the wrong way, so the nebular hypothesis. It's like, no, no. There are no. still questions as to why the total angular momentum of the solar system is what it is, but that's not part of the problem. No, if, if Venus is spinning the wrong way, therefore, cows don't give birth to dogs. Which makes yeah. no sense. Yeah, it's... Who the hell said that? <laughs> Oh, but that's basically a summary of Kantovans. Is but, oh, <laughs> you think a speck decided to explode, therefore alleles don't change over time. And <laughs> apparently, Mevolution says you come from a rock. Oh, the classic. Yeah. And yeah he what's, what is great is seeing people drill him on. Uh, no, you don't know what a rock is and what a mineral is when they right. start when he starts going down that. I would yeah. honestly kind of like to see you do that. I think it's now. Rock, <laughs> and, and soup, right, right. Or whatever. Man, actually, I'll be honest. He does a better job of characterizing evolution than um, a bit of Orange, who's a, a fairly minor YouTube guy who I've responded. Did he to. get picked up by Eric Hovind or something? A bit of Orange? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he might have been. In which case, that's a big boost to his career. Cause... Yeah, I think Vice Rhino did it. <laughs> oh yeah, Vice Rhino, Jackson, and Dapper all. Um, did videos on him. He, he's been properly destroyed. Yeah, well, so his... He has this diagram of quote-unquote evolution, and it, it basically starts with a, a picture of a rock, a picture of, like, Campbell's chicken soup, then a picture of an earthworm, then a picture of a goldfish, then a picture of a frog, I'm gonna go then a picture of, I think, a squirrel, then a picture of a chimpanzee, and then, or no, the squirrel branches into a wolf at one side and then a, goes to a chimpanzee on the other side. And then the picture of the chimpanzee has an arrow pointing to a picture of a human. And it's just like, I, I can't great. imagine how you could more incorrectly characterize evolution than by picturing all of these modern organisms evolving into yeah. each other. He forgot the he, and having he forgot the squirrels. amoeba. Well, yeah, he did. Actually, he might have had an amoeba or a bacterium or something in there. I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah, don't you know, yeah. if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? That's a good question. Uh, Classic. Yeah, well, <laughs> watch Jackson's talk uh, with him. You'll see how eh he is. Yeah, it's it's uh, really bad. I, I, if, I, dinosaurs, if birds came from dinosaurs, then why are there the dinosaurs still. Oh wait. <laughs> well, I actually those are just bones in the dirt. Remember that one. So oh, I have Satan to. Oh, oh they were put there by the devil to confuse us. Oh, and, and you can't. Prove I have met people who you can't prove those bones had way. any kids. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> no, no, oh, no. You're all wrong. You're all wrong. Humans. You're all wrong. Um, dinosaurs oh. are aliens from Planet X. Oh. Um, oh no! It's oh, it's no. that what what's it called like Nibiru or something? The planet that oh, is yeah, always Nibiru. somehow <laughs> somehow like a year away from hitting Earth. Oh, you I know what's just... great about Nibiru is that the orbital mechanics don't even work. If you actually try to set that up in like a simulation, uh, Nibiru like a Nibiru thing because the idea is supposed to be it has like a ten thousand year orbit and it's extremely eccentric, right? Well, okay, you can yeah. establish an extremely eccentric orbit that has a period of ten thousand years and you can make it so it crosses Earth's orbit. But what you find is that if you run that after a few orbits, one of two things, actually well, one of one thing is going to happen. Nibiru will have a gravitational interaction with Jupiter or Saturn, and it will be ejected from the solar system entirely. Model and universe sandbox. I think it was, I think it was Bill's debate that, it might have been another debate too, but Bill, it, was, it was Bill's debate that, that, that make, that he told Kent where it was, it's population, not individuals. Yeah, Bill Ludlow, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, one prove, thing. You can't prove those bones had kids. Like, well, maybe they didn't. But other other people, there are other people besides him in, in, the, in the world. You know. But we know we know that those species had kids. You know why? Because we found them being buried, giving birth after they get kept, caught in an unfortunate landslide. And, yeah. Which is funny about that. It's because YECs actually use that as something like to try to prove, you know, the worldwide flood. But, but yes, yeah. because termites and sandslides don't happen. 
Uh, well, uh, they do though. I love him trying to convince people that the Grand Canyon was all made at one time by the flood. No, see, you, what you got to do is you got to find where they contradict each other because you'll have creationists like Andrew Snelling who say all the layers were soft so it could be carved fast. And then you have creationists like Michael Lord who say, no, 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 no. There are so many instances of the layers in the Grand Canyon having boulders and blocks of underlying layers mixed in with them that they had to have been solid within days mid flood. Yeah. <clears throat> As if the heat from that lithification wouldn't metamorphize them. Yeah. Mm. You, 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 you see, I remember one scene from Logic's video viewing Kent's thing where he's like, like this flood water Grand Canyon, it went this way, I was like, turn around, went back around, went backwards for a second, went back that way again, and yeah, <laughs> zigzagged a bit. It, 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 doesn't Kent always try to compare it to the scab lands? I don't know well, that uh, actually Mount did St. happen. Helens. Yeah, I think he usually uses Mount St. Helens. I don't. Does he actually use the scablands? I don't remember him doing so. Uh, uh, somebody yeah, has. Never. So somebody does. It so, might have been yeah. Kent doing that more recently, but I'm not sure. It could have been even been Eric that they used the scablands, and I'm just confusing them because they're so much alike. And so, um, oh, oh, and there was like uh, Eric has a question, guys. So, yeah, uh, sorry about that. So you know when. When I was a YEC, when I used to watch his sermons, this was something that I would always go like, "What in the world?" And and, and a lot of people probably think the same thing too. Maybe he's trying to be funny about it, but if he is, it's it's really not that funny. It's just stupid. Um, you know about how he calls National Geographic National Pornographic. Yeah. My response, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry your funny. wife won't show you some titty because you're too fundamentalist, <laughs> but that's not anybody else's problem. <laughs> Which, which, yeah, wife, which wife? The fact he says that at church. Ah, good question. At church, out of all places, it's like yeah, I've I've heard a number of people who are actually generally Hoven fans be somewhat shocked at that, and it's like I I don't think it's a good idea. I know what he's doing. He's trying to do the Rush Limbaugh thing, because Rush Limbaugh has that thing where he's like, oh, I'll take some name and I'll I'll make a little pun out of it, and it's extremely childish, and I don't know why he bothers any of them. I and it's not like it's a, a thing isolated to you know, crazy right wing people or anyone else. I mean, I've heard lots of people do it. I don't know why anyone does it. It never works well. Oh, don't do it. At first, I thought that maybe it was just something that slipped out of his mouth. But the fact that he's repeated so many times, it's like, oh, no, it's his buzzword thing. Yeah. Yeah. He has, he does that for nothing. Like, yeah. um, you Cal, uh, Berkeley, he calls it berserkly. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. If he's trying to be funny, then, then oh, he, he is. Does typically. You yeah, mean it's where he's randomly bad. going against people on the airplanes, or whatever. Or... Fundamentalist has no sense of humor. <laughs> Sky's. I was gonna go there, Vendalia. The, yeah, the, he, he's. Oh, I met. I met this scientist on an airplane, or when I was on a bus. And I go, no, you didn't, Ken. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I know scientists. We had a fifteen-minute talk, and I convinced him of the truth of the global. Because I know, I know scientists on the planes and buses are like, like, hey guys, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist right now on a bus. I'm sitting right here. Even when we're talking about evolution, you know. Well, see what the thing is. You can always tell because scientists are legally obligated to wear their lab coats everywhere. And if they ever take it off, it means they're no longer a scientist. So they even shower with them. So you can have always I been, tell have I been doing it wrong. I've been leaving I my beakers Kent wrong. Does that because he thinks he's a scientist. <laughs> well, oh God, Kent does. You know, what, you know what I love. Nathan Thompson even said the same thing. He said that he's a scientist. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. I, I need to correct you guys. Uh, scientists always wear blue shirts. <laughs> oh, is that the rule? Yeah. What were you saying, Colton? Sorry. I, I want to know where Answers in Genesis goes to, like, have a picture taken, because they have a blatantly, like, ninth or 10th grade chemistry class uh, room set up somewhere where they take pictures oh, of all the yeah. scientists. So you'll have Nathaniel Jensen, that, like, replacing Darwin guy, who... All he does in any of his papers is take other people's data and try to force fit it into a creation model, mess with it to make predictions that actually don't come out true, and then he ends up misrepresenting what the data is to says that he got it right. And then they'll take pictures of him in this, like, chemistry room with beakers as if he's doing any of that. So, uh, and he'll have, like, his, his papers printed out and taped to the wall, and it's just sad. So I think that, that is that actually is. a location at the uh, the Creation Museum because not that long ago. So AIG has been doing a lot of live streams recently because it's all they can do because of all the various shelter in place or stay at home orders and whatnot. Yeah. 
Um, so <clears throat> not that long ago, they did a a live stream where it's this guy. I don't even remember his name, but he did this a bunch of really cringy young earth creationist kid videos where he and an anthropomorphic ceratopsian would go around finding evidence for the flood in the fossil. Mark record. Armitage. No, it wasn't Mark Armitage. <laughs> oh. um, no, but I know. But like, they just did this thing where like they put a, a fossil inside some sand in a plastic container and they showed people how to plaster wrap it. So you could tra for transport. So I didn't actually really pay super a lot of attention, but at the beginning they said where they were and they said it was some like science discovery classroom or something at the creation museum. So apparently that's actually a room somewhere in the creation museum. That's not on the normal. That wouldn't lecture. surprise me then. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise. And it looks just yeah. like, like a, a high school <laughs> chemistry or bio lab where like you might, dissect a frog or something yeah, except most high school labs don't actually have the chemicals sitting out where people can get to them well they didn't in that video i don't know if, <laughs> like I don't, I don't know what they do with like chemicals and parts i don't even know what they normally do in there when they're not live streaming oh, yeah, come on it's going to be water with food coloring i mean you can learn stuff from that too diffusion that's what I, that's what I was thinking too. yeah I mean, I like what colors mixed together to make what other colors? Yeah, that's all. Hey, you know what? As someone who does a fair bit of art, that's an important thing. It is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll give some credit where it's due. You can learn a lot from water and food coloring. Water, water. <laughs> well, I, oh, that's that's Ken Hamm. This is more of a Ken Ham, but yeah. Um, oh, well, I think his name is Buddy. That guy. Yeah, Buddy D Davis. That oh, might God, be it. Him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Buddy right. Davis. Is he Canadian? Because that would be brilliant. I don't know. I don't believe in evolution. I agree. Hey, you, might, you might remember, uh, I think it was Ray Comfort's blob to dog analysis. His what? Uh, don't you know that this like meatball has to grow eyes, four legs, and a tail, um, somehow learn to survive on land, and then has to find another meatball, which turned into a dog and grew the exact same things, but happened to be a girl. That's like his thing, I'm pretty sure, is what oh. Ray Comfort says. Yeah, that's one of the crazier things that you get out of creation is, is like, yeah. oh, wouldn't there have to be two of them at the same time? It's like, well, no, because no... With the exception of instances of polyploidy, which are easy to happen as a, you know a second time, you don't generally require, or you don't generally give birth or hatch or lay or an egg that's going to hatch into anything that's going to be reproductively incompatible with previous generations. In fact, my favorite version of this, um, I did a video called "Let's Talk About Sex," where I, um, there was this creationist. He's he's fairly minor, but he used to do like a weekly show or something in front of a bad green screen, but. Um, he had these series of little rants that he went on about creation and evolution. One of them was about sex. And his main argument seemed to be that because uh, any change in the shape of an intermittent organ on a male would be make it incompatible with this whatever thing. reproductive tract of a female organism is, that, that that invalidates the possibility of any change in reproductive strategy among any clade, I guess. And it, it, the thing that one of the points that I made in the thing in the video is that he belongs to a species that has a fairly wide range of size and shape of intermittent organ. And I don't think that's ever been the major cause of fertility problems for humanity. Like, Oh, it just doesn't fit. So we can't have kids. Like I'm not aware of that being a major problem for fertility in humans, despite I'm their. Aware of that. Yeah. It, it, it could be a major problem for enjoyment of sex though. Well, yeah, but he's talking about <laughs> species where enjoyment of sex and sometimes Involve. I mean, he's talking about the whole animal kingdom where that can involve things like ripping penises off or stabbing other members of your species through the abdomen with a penis. Yeah. Well, I, so, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's I, a factor. Well, wow, I remember, that's pretty gruesome. Well, welcome you know, to remember, the animal world. You know, I remember yeah. one argument where he says all farmers count on evolution not being right so they can breed cows and the corn and stuff. Like, well, it's not. Right. Which is literally the opposite of what's true. So, well, it's 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 kind of strange how if um, evolution went the way that um, most creationists think it does, then it'd be solid evidence that evolution wasn't real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, basically creationists tend to want evidence that would disprove evolution before they believe evolution. I, I've compared it to like, yeah, it would be like. T telling someone, oh, I'll accept Christianity when you can find me Jesus's corpse. 
It's like, well, right if Christianity point. is true, you shouldn't be able to find such a thing. So yeah. you're you're asking for evidence that would disprove Christianity before you accept Christianity. It's it's like, the same deal. Like how a dog will just one day pop out a cat. Right. It's something that evolution says will never happen. And cat. The one that the one that stood out to me was somebody saying, "You need to show me a hippo giving birth to a monkey." Oh, trust me, man. Uh, I've heard things that are so much worse uh, than that. I, I, that one hurts my head a little bit. Frank, yeah, I've heard worse. <laughs> I, think I, said, I think I said one time in a future debate when you were debating a creationist, you should bring in an evolutionist, a, a chemist, and a physicist, and a, a cosmetologist. They all can counteract whatever they're going to say because it's crazy to bring up anything, everything from the Big Bang to planets, planets and abiogenesis. You got to have all of them on your, your hey, side. Hey, don't forget geologists. We got one right, well, we got one in training right here. Yep. Because, you know, they bring up everything besides yeah. the actual topic. You're also... <laughs> yep. Oh, we, we, oh yeah, you, we, I guess we do have two because uh, paleontology degrees usually involve a pretty... Pretty heavy amount of uh, geology. geology yeah, yeah. yeah ba basically, he's the guy that I have to go to to be like, "Hey, I found this little microfossil in this uh, drill core. What does it mean? Yeah, yeah. tell me what this is from." Not a scientist yet, but Chances are the cododon. But yeah. sorry, I, I, your, I, stuff I, is, I, your stuff is not not yeah. important because you're you you you're a uh, historical science, geology, historical science. Of, you know, oh, yeah, it doesn't count. Right. Oh, well, let's not argue about disciplines. <laughs> well, no, that's that's the Ken Ham thing. He likes to divide science into historical and observational science. Which I, I, know that, um, I know that Dapper saw it, but I was in a conversation with an actual guy who works for Creation Ministries International. He's just like an events organizer for them, but he's, he's one of their, you know, he's an official member. He's not just some internet nobody. And he and I got into a big conversation about what does it mean to test something in historical sciences. And I brought up that's the same thing as always. You make predictions and you see if they bear out. And he was saying, no, that's not a test. You have to witness the event in real time with your own eyes. And so I brought up, you know that you've had like Russell Humphreys and other creationists do exactly what I described and call it a testable idea. And are you disagreeing with him? And he just said, yeah, no, that's not a test. So, okay. so, so Take it up with your own dude, then. So that means, that means, don't you? None of our parents were ever born because we never saw it with our own eyes. Essentially, you can't. Yeah. The, the earth is the earth isn't round because you can't see it with the naked eye in most cases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any sort of indirect uh, observation. Of way, yeah. yeah, and uh, Dapper, uh, remember during the after show of my debate with Cody, like when Cody brought up the whole thing about observational science and historic science. Um, um, and then you told him straight up a, 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 by the fact that, yeah, you know, and nobody saw that car, you, you know, like that's now in a ditch hike with skin marks on the road because, because, you know, the driver's dead, but it's safe to assume that, you know, there was a car crash. And after right, that, right. he didn't say anything. Yeah. And I also, Colton, Colton, I think you would have been proud because he made a number of ridiculous geology claims. And even though I'm not exactly a, a, you know, super high quality geology guy there. I was able to counter every single one of them immediately. At a boy. Yeah, yeah, it was like, oh, there's no erosion marks. It's like, well, here's some erosion marks. And then afterwards, uh, just, pull the, just pull the Nephilim free thing and say you're pointing to the exception. Literally look at any disconformity. There you go, yeah. erosion marks. Yeah. Then afterwards, he said that you were being rude, which, I mean, you, you're the one who invited him in the first place. So I think that he said that. Because of the fact that he didn't like the fact that you were debunking all of his all the fallacious things that he was saying, <laughs> which I refused to do during the debate, except for the exception where you both tried to use Greek and Hebrew, and I was like, "No, nope, you guys don't know those languages. Don't don't use Greek and Hebrew." That's one of my pet peeves: is people trying to reference some language they don't speak as being evidence that a text says what they think it does. Unless you actually know the language, don't do that. Speaking of debates. It has has Ken like uh like what's the word like distance himself or like made enemies of all the debate channels out there besides his own because you know he's no longer on that one show. He's no longer going on Modern Day Debate. I don't think he's going to go on um a Marvel Girls channel anymore. Yeah, he's, I, I, he's not on the not... McCray show either anymore. So. Yeah, like Steve, he he got uh, pissed with Steve because Steve uh, didn't let him talk over Aaron. 
Mm -hmm. Um, he got pissed with modern day debates. I don't fucking know why. I know why. Uh, and he seems to be pissed with Marvel Girl because AT2 told him to stop grandstanding. Yep. So <laughs> AT2's told him to stop grandstanding, which was perfectly fair. And his thing with um, modern day debate, it's, I'll say it's a little bit more reasonable than the other ones, which is that after he had to leave, um, it was the debate with uh, Professor Dave Explains. Uh, Dave then continued on to speak disparagingly about Kent for a fair bit of time. And I can, that's the one that seems the least unreasonable, but even then, like, I'm pretty sure that James would have done the same thing for Kent. If Dave had had to just bow out early, Kent would have been able to continue on answering questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, but, uh, Kent, talks disparagingly about everybody constantly on his oh, yeah. channel. I mean, he's a, he, uh, look at any of his whack and atheist things where he basically his entire argument is you're a dummy and I'm going to explain why by referencing things that have nothing to do with what you're talking about. It's yeah. ad hominem, the show. Well, it's insult the show. Yeah. There is a difference. I, I do like to maintain the difference. If I say, oh, hey, you're wrong and you're an idiot, that's not an ad hominem. If I say you're an idiot and therefore you're wrong, that is. Oh, he, he does some of that on there. It, uh, it's, really not the one, one it's been bad. Reddit, and he said, oh, yeah, that's typical. I mean, you don't have to say uh, any sort of therefore, even in a, a, a subtle sense, in order for it to be an ad hom. Basically, he was just saying, if I say it's an ad hom, it is. So, oh. Eric, like, so that it, is not how it works. It should, you're, you're, you're basically the moral now, hopefully, right? Eric? What? You're the base tomorrow, right? Yes. It, so, yes, uh, it is. Yes, it is tomorrow f at five p.m. Central Time. So, so, so yeah, um, we so will just that? have to see if there's not going to be any technical. That's three Pacific. Uh, let's see, so it'd be five his time, uh, four my time, and so I'm not sure where else that you all live as far as time zones go. Yeah, yeah. I also see that's why I said you should have other people do your debates for host your debates for you. That so stuff like that don't happen. You, you can't. Oh, it'll still happen. Kent has had plenty of on-air technical glitches with on other channels. Um, True, I guess. And in fact, during my debate, his router reset, according to him. And so, um, if you watch it on my channel, I have two versions. I have the uh, the original version that I just straight uploaded right from what I was recording on my computer, and then. Um, <clears throat> I have the the audio remaster where I took sound bites from Kent's audio and mixed them in with mine, or well, from his version of the debate, mixed it into mine to make the audio a little bit better. And um, I also had to, well, I chose to cut out almost the entirety of that little glitch because it was like two or three minutes of just me on a blank black screen talking to Kent's audience and saying, Hey, Ken's audience, I'm sorry about this. I hope we come back if you want to check out my channel. And, like, that's, I got like, I wasn't going to be a jerk about it, but, like, yeah, it's, he does that a lot. He's done it on Steve McRae's channel. He's done, he's had audio, he's had audio and visual glitches um, on Modern Day Debate. I, I, he doesn't understand technology at all. Oh. No, well, he admits that too. To, to, to be somewhat fair to him, he, he admits that he has a tech guy and he's the one who controls all that. And he, how much of Ken's the, I don't think all of debate, but how much of his kids debate is, is, or other people's debate, crazy debate, is them uh, up trying to sell their, their own merch? It's yeah. big with AIG. They're the ones who are the worst at, at just adding in commercial pitches everywhere. And, and what's funny, last time when I debated Kent, he did the same thing like, with like his uh, closing statement. They were saying, oh, well, buy this DVD. And, yeah. And Kent does it. I find it less obnoxious than AIG just because he makes it a smaller part. Like every time I watch an AIG talk, like they, cause you know, they, they drag someone out to talk about something that's not even in their field every once in a while in their little room where they did the Bill Nye debate. Um, I shouldn't say little, it's actually a pretty big room, but, um, and yeah. every, every time it ends with at least 10 to 12 minutes of just putting up merchandise on screen, whether it be yeah. books or whatever. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it'd be, yeah. it'd be like, oh, they're awful. And, and everyone listening is wrong. Therefore, by the way, I'm supposed to buy Coke. Anyways, <laughs> <you're wrong. laughs> Yeah, buy our books, buy our videos. I mean, okay, look, I show on my channel too. Every single one of my videos ends with a little thing like, oh, hey, you know, if you want to help the channel out, I have a Patreon and I have a Oh, Amazon wish list, and you can do these things, right? We all do, but we don't like do the middle of a discussion of of something, right? Like 
and we don't do it for multiple minutes. Like my entire outro thing where like I tell people like, hey, you can go support me if you want. It's like, I think it's about 30 seconds to 40 seconds each time. Actually, I have to record a new one because um, patron, there there are new and changed patrons. So now I had to update my uh, my end credit scene. So if you guys have suggestions as to what I do for the new end credit scene, let me know. <laughs> and there have been a few, well, not a few, only one conspiracy going around as to why can't as to why we have to reschedule uh some people have said that it was because of my opening who was just that powerful and like that it made him run away i don't now, think he's self-aware enough for that i will be more convinced of that if the same thing happens again tomorrow so is, is, yeah so is the same debate you're, you're gonna have or is it the, the brand new debate that they want you to have so and so and so if they try changing the topic again I, again i'll have to make it clear to him it's our birds, dinosaurs, but you know, this is definitely going to be my last time ever debating Ken Hoven. And now, it was enough to deal with him the first time. The only reason why I'm debating him again is the only way that I went. The the only reason why that I went out of my way to debate him again is because that before Bill Ludwell passed away, uh, when he found out I was going to debate Hoven on if dinosaurs live with people, Bill wanted me to. Uh, Ask Kent the question. So, if dinosaurs and people coexisted six six thousand years ago, well, then why haven't we we ever found any fossilized dinosaur saddles? So, unfortunately, I forgot to ask him that, and then I felt really really bad about that. And then since Bill passed away, that that made me feel even worse. And so, and then I thought that hey, maybe a good way, you know, like to you know, maybe a good way, you know, to mem you know, like to bring memory to Bill Ludwell and whatnot and to show my respects and whatnot is if um, is if this time I, I will make it a 100% guarantee, I, I have to write it on my hand or something so I won't forget, is to make sure to ask him that question. Uh, maybe put then, a taking note above your uh, monitor along the yeah. uh, classic top of the monitor. So you yeah, can do that. probably. And, what and, are you going to do if he actually follows your rule and he doesn't bring out people being with dinosaurs? Because then you're going to have to do it, and he's going to then he'll run with it. <laughs> yeah, that was one thing I thought about, and so I've been trying to think of ways, you know, to work with that. So I thought up that at I the end that during uh, during like the very end, you know, like uh, during questions and, and answers. So I thought it'd be best the answer or in the questions. Yeah, so I thought I could just do it that way. So. And, so uh, so Unfortunately, you have somebody in the audience who deliberately asks it for you. Oh, well, yeah, that could be. I didn't oh, think Kent. about that. Actually, um, Bent Hoven has been hoping that he can get, if there's a live chat, I don't even know if there will be, but he's been hoping that he can get in a question that is basically just repeating my question about Kent not knowing what dinosaurs are word for word. Because I asked Kent um, to get him to admit it. That's one of the tricks with Kent. To get him to admit ignorance, you have to phrase a question in a way that doesn't look like it's obviously asking that, that particular question. So, for instance, when... When I got him to admit he doesn't know what a dinosaur is, it was by asking him how he could identify a dinosaur if he found one in the field. And of course, the only way to be able to identify a dinosaur as such is to know what it is. And if you don't know what it is, you can't identify it. And he said that he didn't know how he could identify a dinosaur as such in the field. And that is exactly the same thing as not knowing what a dinosaur is. So, by the way, that. What's the deal with, I think everyone can't can especially bringing up uh, cars and word processors in the evolution debate? It's just an analogy to try and take man-made design things and then pretend that, that the vague similarity of complexity makes them analogous to biological organisms. That's all yeah. it is. It, it is something that's been around for a while. But, uh, Does Kent get confused when you mention that there's two different families of dinosaurs? Um, I think he's vaguely aware of this because every once in a while, I think he makes fun of the idea that um, birds are supposed to be, quote, lizard-hipped dinosaurs rather than bird-hipped. I, but but now that I think that's about as far as he gets. But, See, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, hey, guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to pet out now, so thank you all so much. And, uh, uh, Eric, uh, Right, right before you go, I have one thing for you. Okay. Have, if you're doing slides, which I recommend because they're helpful, 
have slides for all of his common retorts so that when it's time for you to, to come back from them, you just have a slide for it already. It was one of the more effective things I think I did. So like have a slide. It would be really cool is if you had his slides with his wrong stuff crossed out and the right oh, things yeah, put in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like I had, slide, I had a slide for his thing about, oh, you can't tell if the fossils had any kids. I had a slide for his SpongeBob imagination thing. So yeah, work I on that. Away spoilers. I do have something planned for that, but I'm not going to give away spoilers. So okay. look oh, forward to my debate tomorrow. Whether or not it will be live, we'll just have to find out tomorrow, 5 p.m. And, and Dabra, you told the after show on your channel afterwards or... Uh, we're, yeah, we have to, show yeah that's that's currently planned. I'm not sure when it will be. We'll have to work on that. Yeah, so. the after show was supposed to be today, actually, but mm -hmm. yeah. So happens. we're uh, Eric and I will talk about that. It probably can't be this Saturday, but we might just do an extra stream in the middle of the week for just some time. But uh, later, Eric. And unfortunately, I also have to get going pretty soon. Um, all right. Well, but, all right, so before we, uh, before we wrap this up, then you bet. Can you want you guys want to plug whatever happened on your channel soon? I'll let Eric go. I think he's on a time, closer time crunch. Yeah. So um, anyways, like I said, I'm lacking time to make a video. So I really don't know what all I got planned. Um, if I got anything planned, they're, they're going to have to be short videos, maybe a few debunking YEC stuff, maybe a few movie stuff. Uh, it's really kind of up in the air. Uh, and so it's unknown right now. But the obvious one is uh, my friend and I, Michael, We'll be debating Ken Hovind on if birds are dinosaurs. Okay. All right. You're coming. Uh, for me, uh, let's see. Hey, Tuesday, bye. Oh, bye. Bye. Tuesday is uh, Kent with Bent 25. We're going to be starting up with uh, Kent Hovind Seminar 7, where he does Q&A. So it's actually a fairly interesting one to watch if you're uh, a fan of Kent Hovind getting things horribly wrong and being unable to actually think on his feet. Um, so that'll, that'll be, uh, Tuesday. I think it might actually be earlier in the day, like noon Pacific, just because, um, I think my co-host is not expecting actually to go into work that day because, uh, he works in the, uh, he works in a hospital, but his particular job has been largely, uh, furloughed because the hospital is no longer performing anything that isn't uh, like an immediately necessary thing. And he works in a field where, his job saves people's lives on the order of like months to years most of the time and not days or hours, which is what the hospital is restricting itself to. So, yeah. Um, so we might be doing that early in the day. Like uh, when he doesn't work on Tuesdays, we usually do them sometime around noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. So um, look forward to that. Uh, let's see. That'll be Tuesday. Thursday uh, will probably be the final episode of Noah Zookeeper, where we talk, go through a... Um, a seminar given by Karina Altman, the uh, AIG zookeeper or head zookeeper or something like that, where she's Yay. talking about biological evolution because as everyone knows, nothing qualifies you more to talk about biochemistry and genetics than taking care of llamas. <laughs> so it, it's, it's more qualified than geologists, but still not um, Barely. Mm. Um, then let's see. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's see. Um, then Saturday, so a week from today, uh, we'll, currently I am planning on having another uh, Leaving Our Earth Creationism. Then um, the Tuesday after that might actually end up being another episode of Eric with Erica, because I believe at that point, uh, rather than stopping with most of the procedures that my co-host normally goes on, instead they're going to be ramping them up like crazy and trying to get in as many as they can. So he's probably going to be doing a lot of overtime. So we might go to an Eric with Erica, which is where I do a similar thing with Eric Hovind instead of Kent Hovind. And instead of having my friend who goes by Bent Hovind, no relation, we'll have Erica from Gut Sick Gibbon. So that way I still get to keep with the uh, the wonderful wordplay. Erica Hovind, no relation? No, no, she's not going by Erica Hovind. She's she's going by Erica from the Gut Sick Gibbon <laughs> channel. And also, if you haven't checked out her channel, uh, she is go, absolutely amazing. Yes, go check her out. Yeah. She she and I do a lot of stuff together. So she's been on my channel uh, a dozen times, maybe. I've been on hers three or four. Um, I think when she starts live streaming, which after me having taught her yeah. how to do it, she's saying that she was planning to do it a little bit more. So if she's starts- have to introduce us because I've been dying to meet her. Yes, yeah, so oh. she's, she's been on here like three or four times. Yeah, that, I mean, she, Erica is- She's a very nice woman. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Erica. That's why I have her on my channel so much. And um, as far as I'm concerned, if you're subscribed to me, you should be subscribed to Erica. Because if I, you're- well, yeah, I am. 
<laughs> yeah, well, good, good. Because basically, my, my point is like, if you're not subscribed to both of us, you're missing a fair bit of the content that each of us put out, basically. Yeah, it's like a, like, a, like 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 school and stuff. No one's no one's like you can't learn everything. You gotta focus on one. You gotta focus on one uh, topic in school. Yeah, and that's topic. that's one of the reasons I, I I like to have Ron so much is because like my knowledge on things like primatology and human evolution, it's it's not terrible, but it's not very good. Whereas you know. I have a lot of the stuff about like, you know, Mesozoic uh, diapsids, especially dinosaurs and things like that. And, you know, the various uh, organisms showing, you know, the evolution of uh, birds or other groups of dinosaurs, ceratopsians, all this stuff. And um, so, whereas Erica doesn't have a lot of that. So we basically, when both of us are together, if it's to do with paleontology and evolution, there's a really good chance that one of us is going to know what's going on. <laughs> so, and, and, and I'm the expert on Japanese visual novels. Well, there you go. Well, well there when, you go. When, when I start to cover that, I'll know who to talk to. Uh, although, spoilers, I'm probably <laughs> not going to cover it anytime soon. So even the covering Star Trek was a bit of an anomaly. And it was only because um, my top patron requested it as a video request. That would, and, be, more, that would be more of a topic for your Top Hats Off channel. Yeah, that's true. I do have a top hat, a channel called Top Hats Off. Uh, you can find the link on my main channel. Um, it's where I do stuff like um, I'll. I think the last time I did something, I streamed some art because uh, I have a speculative evolution project where it's it's primarily community driven. Although I'm sort of the arbiter of what actually gets through, but um, for each entry in the project, I'm trying to do a nice little 3D render of whatever the organism is. And so my last stream was me creating that organism, starting with just a cube in a 3D program and ending up with a, a little animal with you know four eyeballs and tentacles and whatnot. So um, I do that there. Uh, also, after Kent with Bent, I'm usually there streaming games for an hour to two hours uh, while drunk, of course, because Kent with Bent is a drinking stream because it's you got to drink if you're going to watch that much Kent Hovind. Is that, why it's, is that why it's only two hours uh, or three hours at a time? That way, that way you're not uh, kind of poisoning yourself? Basically. We did a five-hour one once, and I took like a day and a half to recover from that. I usually am okay I, the next morning after Kent with Bent, but sometimes. All right, well, I'm going to get that one. Um, yeah, yeah check, out, check out my stuff. But also, I, cool nice on. to meet you, Dapa. Uh, oh, it was nice to meet you too, and thank you for. I really appreciate you subscribing. Uh, and I was following you on Twitter, so I have no idea why I wasn't subscribed. Oh, you were one of those. Huh? I have a few of those. <laughs> yeah, I follow lots of people on Twitter. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Vandali, for having me on, and yeah. I will talk to you guys later. See ya, See ya Dapa. Yeah, I gotta go too. See ya. Bye. Thank you. So, so Jen, yeah. anything coming up on your channel? Um, I'm going to bring out a couple more mass videos this week. Um, I'm going to be describing, um, how we got to figure out that, um, the area of a circle is pi r squared, uh, and also discussing how we calculate areas under a curve. Um, so a little bit of calculus, but I'm not going to go deep into how, how it is. I'm going to take it from Archimedes principles of, um, uh, calculating the infinites, which um, which is was the basis of, w which is what calculus is, but Archimedes took it from a different set of principles to derive the concepts of um, areas of a circle and stuff. So, uh, Tita Lang, what about you? Anything coming up your channel? Um, I've got a video coming out at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning about uh, radio, not radio, um, relative dating uh, in oh, geology. Cool. Um, so yeah, I actually am going to go re-record the audio of a section of that after this and, uh, right. re-edit it and re-render it. Right. Oh, I guess I'm also going to cook some bratwurst for dinner. It, because, well, uh, for me, uh, the rest of this week, if, if I can really record it today, I'm going to, going to keep on doing the Let's Plays of Steinsgate and Dagnaropa. If you want to check those, check those out, you should check it out if you're individual novels. And then next Saturday... Barry, hopefully, no no emergencies. Jackson will be on the channel to talk about bear monology. I'm going to need to come for that because I know he has something planned. That's going to be such an interesting topic. That right. that's going to be that's going to be something. So oh, guys, I, I guess if anybody wants to come look at the uh, Side Strikes movie night has been moved to today. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll sh I'm, I, I'm going to be watching there. that. I, I'm going to be on. Um, um, Nevermore Tavern in uh, nine o'clock 
with um, Jay. And hopefully if that ends soon enough, then I'll, I'll, God, my butt's going to be so sore from sitting in this chair. Um, <laughs> then hopefully I'll be on movie night as well. So do you guys have a, a, a closing catchphrase that you say on your show? So you want to say it now? Oh, I do. No. So please, guys, because I know you're all wonderful. Try not to choke on that selfie stick. <laughs> Right. And as I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. All right. You just do it. It'll turn out okay. Yeah. Hey, everyone, welcome to Talking Time Caffeine, the only podcast where we drink caffeine or whatever and we talk about whatever the hell we talk about. Yeah, this cup doesn't have caffeine in it. Sorry, guys. It's not oh. caffeine, it's iced tea. You're sure right. oh, you're doing straight alcohol or something? <laughs> I didn't say it had alcohol. I just said it didn't have caffeine. Come on. Uh, lately, I, I have been um, I've been listening to a lot of debates with YCs, and it seems like they, so for a few times, maybe they they pretty much said the same thing. So I was just wondering about where do they all come from? Because as as I mentioned with. Uh, as me and uh, RJ talked about in our, in our th th talking about synapsids back in the day, even Owen, who hated Darwin evolution, was an OEC. So yeah. So when did they start that transition? Ellen G. White is is the name that you want to look at there. Um, so in case people yeah. don't know, <laughs> the Ellen 20th G. White, century. Yeah, Ellen G. White at the turn of the century, um, and this is a period when there's a lot of sort of like a revivalist sort of new movements popping up. Um, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses yeah. start popping up around this time. Um, the uh, Mormons had already popped up, but it wasn't that long before. And now Ellen G. White comes along, and she's another one of these new sort of Christian-y prophets. And um, she creates the Seventh-day Adventists, and they're two big distinctives for most other Christians, at the time at least. Or I guess there are three big distinctions. One is they accepted that Ellen G. White was a prophet, which... You know, no one else yeah. does by definition. Um, <clears throat> they also accepted um, that the proper day for Christian worship and, and Sabbath was Saturday and not Sunday. So Seventh-day Adventists Seventh are called day. that, right, because they go to church on Saturday and they're pretty strict with um, with not doing work or even a lot of different play things. Like they're not – they don't usually play sports on Saturday. But then that last really big distinctive that was – it's no longer a distinctive, but it was at the time – was they were very insistent on taking things like Bishop Usher's estimates and the sort of genealogical estimates that you can come up with for the age of the earth from the Bible very seriously. When that had basically been previously unheard of, basically every Christian, with very few exceptions, by that time was perfectly okay with the earth being many millions of years old. Although at the time, you know, we didn't have radiometric dating and whatnot. So it wasn't clear exactly how old. And people were thinking, like RJ had said a little bit before when we were off air, like maybe uh, 50 million years or 100 million years, um, which was a reasonable guess at the time, right? It's, it's yeah. not to knock people yeah, because yeah, they didn't Kelvin have... had the science behind that. It, he was uh, just yeah. doing it by earth cooling calculations. So everybody scientifically could accept tens of millions of years as a ballpark. Right. I mean, we know now that that was incorrect, but that was just because of lack of data. It wasn't because they were dumb. Yeah. You know, but so, um, yeah. But and then LNG on top White, of which... Oh, go ahead, Dapper. Oh, so Ellen G. White was really the, the the genesis of an insistence that the Earth be young and that the chronologies that you can derive from these, uh, honestly, quite fanciful um, genealogies should be taken very seriously. And um, but well, then, not only that, she had a dream. An angel came down and showed her the flood. She watched it like a big movie. And that, that all the world's geology was formed from that. And that's what got her going. So she had it right there in the CinemaScope. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an odd thing. But then the thing is that um, at this time, fundamentalism as a movement hadn't really begun to exist. There might be things that we would today describe as fundamentalist. But you got to remember that the word fundamentalist actually comes from the self-description of a group of Christians from the early 20th century. 
a bit later than, than her. Yeah, it, it, but, it was the same context. If you're familiar with the Scopes trial that came to a head in yeah. 1925, that subculture is coming out of that big fundamentalist revival that was really mm -hmm. kicking in in the early 20th century. And they sort of imported some of this excessive biblical literalism that Ellen G. White had insisted on. And because the Seventh-day Adventists were the only ones who were really teaching like real biblical literalism in this area, it was the only mm -hmm. source that these fundamentalists had to draw upon, which is also why uh, non-Seventh-day Adventists, young earth creationists, are very uh, loathe to admit their ties to the theology of Ellen G. White. They do not like to admit oh, it. Yeah, they him, like to pretend. If you read, uh, I've noted it in the books that I've written, is that the ICR has gone out of its way, that Henry Morris founded, has gone out of its way to deny that there was a connection between Ellen White's mm -hmm. flood geology and their flood geology, that that was where he got it from. But they're just wrong. Uh, if anybody is um, uh, wants a, a way more detailed history of this than you would ever want to uh, get otherwise, um, uh, Ronald Numbers' classic, The Creationist book, which was, I think, the 1990s, and then there was a reissue of it with some modifications, I think, in the early 21st century. That one is still just a super-duper classic going in where every possible person that was involved in the creationist movement from basically the 1880s on into the 1960s and 70s is covered in there. So it, it's just a, a, a go-to resource everybody needs to have. So, so what's the scope? Oh, sorry. Say, say, what's the scope trial, the first major debate with YCs? Well, one thing is, uh, well, no, uh, you no know, younger debate. creationists weren't playing a part in that at all. That, yeah. Um, the, 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 it was a generic anti evolutionism. And uh, uh, technically speaking, William Jennings Bryan was an old earth creationist, although, whenever William Jennings Bryan was quizzed on it at the trial on chronology, he really was still thinking in that 6,000 year ish frame. And that's the, the seed corn that modern creationists are built off of that the, uh, back in the 17th century when Bishop Usher, and not just Bishop Usher, a whole bunch of people, when they were getting all science-y, were trying to figure, well, can we figure out how old the earth is? We know it was made for Adam, and there's Adam's had kids, and the kids had kids, and the kids had kids had kids, and you can total up the ages and come out with a ballpark figure of six, 7,000 years-ish. So that's where those numbers started to come in in the 17th century. Um, the young earth creationists, Ironically, uh, there uh, the Seventh Day Adventist uh, pseudo geologist uh, uh, George McCready Price was almost called as a science witness for the creationist side at the Scopes trial, and then they backed out of it at the last minute, and then decided to put no witnesses at all. So all the evolutionists that were waiting, chomping at the bits, to present their evidence at the trial didn't get presented at all, and so it turned into a fist fight between verbal fistfight between William Jennings Bryan and, and Clarence Darrow. But uh, although the creationists today want to give the impression that young earth creationism was a dominant and going concern back prior to the 1960s, nope, it wasn't. No, mm -mm. It was a tiny no. fringe thing that, that, that once uh, Henry Morrison company came in in the 1960s, they decided to get, they were Baptists, so they got rid of all of that Seventh-day Adventist Association. And by the way, the Adventists haven't gone away uh, often you'll find uh, people that would be writing in creationist journals. You'll see that they are a scientist with a PhD from Loma Linda University. Well, that's mm -hmm. a Seventh-day Adventist university. And and to this but, day, they still pop up. But one thing is um, when they pop up uh, in creationist journals or media, very rarely is it mentioned that they work for Loma Linda. For instance, um, in the uh, is Genesis history movie, uh, Dr. Arthur Chadwick features fairly prominently yeah. in um, in one section. And actually, I called him on the phone not that long ago. Um, he was he was polite. I'll give him that. He's also a fraud. But either way, uh, it, no no attention was drawn to the fact that he worked for a Seventh Day Adventist creationist um, well, university. This is like, often that was the, right over. This is a common element of hide the ball. Uh, you find it pathologically over in the intelligent design camp where the young earth creationists that are in their group, you never see them identified as such. So uh, uh, Paul Nelson and uh, John Mark Reynolds uh, popping up there and, and you find Salvador Cal or Cordoba percolating into the field. You find them cooperating more and more with uh, uh, John Sanford and that that come from the direct young earth creationist community. So there's a great deal that at least you get a bit more overt 
uh, labeling of things when you look at the old earth creationists that are they're very fussy about not associating themselves with the young earth creationists. But the intelligent designers don't, don't give a rat's ass on it. Uh, once you get into the 1960s, you see um, creationism and the kinds of debates that we're going to be talking about in the rest of the show uh, starting to emerge. And the, the, the great personage here is Dwayne Gish, who was the most ferociously powerful defender of the creationist paleontology worldview? And that's where we get that, uh, that you that, can ever find. That's, and that's where we get the thing from. If everyone uses still the Gish Gallup thing. Gish Gallup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Gish Gallup is yeah. named for Dwayne Dwayne T. Gish, and the the idea is, okay, it is trivially easy to spout nonsense claim after nonsense claim. However. In order to adequately explain why any given nonsense claim is ridiculous, it's going to take, obviously, at least a little bit longer than it takes to say the claim. So Dwayne Gish's debate tactic, by all reports, although we don't have uh, a lot of records of exactly what was said in his debates, was that he would simply get up, say so much nonsense that no debater could ever hope to counter all of it, and then anything they didn't get around to, Gish would just say that, uh, he would essentially imply that they had you know, just conceded on those points, even though. Yeah. And one of the, one of the problems we have as scholars today is that very few of Dwayne Gish's actual appearances in debates were recorded in any way, let alone where you could watch them on YouTube. Uh, uh, even some of the debates, I think the ones he did with Ken Miller, for example, you don't even have transcripts of these things available to know exactly what went on. You only have little side yeah. comments and stuff. Yeah, because um, of, because of, and that, that the, made it awkward. So, because because of, of the like at least at least with professional debates, you only have so long you have you have prof you have you have so long to, to debunk or whatever or three yeah. three bottle stuff like ten. And years I think or they tended to have, uh, if memory serves me, the debate formats that that Gish was fond of would be to have about twenty minutes or thirty minutes to just run them up on their presentation statements, not 10 or 12, like we're getting on some of the debates that you see us do today, but we, we have a faster sensibility on here. Where One of the things that classifies Gish as a disreputable character from a scholarly point of view, uh, came up with uh, the people who would be following Gish around to record what he did in a debate and then another debate and another debate. Because it, it would often be the case that somebody would challenge him on a fact and he would seemingly back down. He would seemingly admit that there was a problem with the fact he had just claimed and that it wasn't a fact at all. And he'd say, oh, I, I, I won't repeat that again. And then he would go to the next debate and repeat it again. And it yep. was that that's where you move from just being uh, wrong, but you're correctable to being wrong and disreputable because yeah, you're just we, repeating the same material over and over again. The la, 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 I'm not hearing this. The, we we see that in current in current creationism, um, two or a few glaring examples that would come to mind would be um, Kent Hovind has been corrected and admitted fault on certain aspects numerous times, and yeah. does not ever bother to change. And then we'll simply say, well, I don't have to change if I'm not right. And it's like, okay, but you admitted you were wrong. Yeah. So uh, another example and, and might Ken, be um, Ken, Ken Hovind is is distilled Dwayne Gish. All of the worst features of Dwayne Gish on steroids. Mm -hmm. Another example might be say, uh, and this is less in, in a debate realm, but um, uh, not that long ago, Standing for Truth admitted that um, my arguments in favor of birds nesting at least taxonomically within Dinosauria were in fact reasonable, and that he had concluded that yes. Um, birds must be dinosaurs, at least in the taxonomic sense, which I was like, okay, that's, that's fair. But then he then had, um, uh, Jonathan Sarfati on and Sarfati th said things that I know that standing for truth knows are wrong. And did standing for truth give any pushback or correction to any of these things? Nope. Just laughed about how ridiculous the uh, ev quote unquote evolutionists are. So he's completely backtracked on now, that. Can't open it. Kent Hovind is a great figure in here because he is the next stage of creationism. Uh, unlike Dwayne Gish that operated from the quasi-scholarly side of serious creationism, Kent Hovind is a bottom feeder doofus, but he was far more prolific 
So his lectures and videos, and he was entering into that video yeah. market where, uh, as uh, Dapper mentioned earlier, he's giving his stuff away. This copyright free. He wants people to see it. So he is is slipping into that public marketplace on a scale that Dwayne Gish never did. And that's why in the real world, I bump into people who have become creationists because they're watching Dr. Kent Hovind videos way more than it's because they've read some Dwayne Gish book. What was... Um, Speaking of doctor, was Dwayne Gish? Uh, how was he? Any, was he like a, a? Did he claim to be a doctor or anything like that? Or oh, he had an actual biochemistry degree. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he actually yeah, was. He had, doctor a, he had a real life life PhD. PhD. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funky the ones that have that because uh, a Gish is a biochemist. Michael Denton is a biochemist. Michael Behe is a biochemist. Are you get the pattern here? Uh, that that's the kind of ones that are just used to looking at chemicals interacting as chemicals not necessarily how they're indirect grading in a biological frame. And also, uh, I a, think that kind of mindset that's just looking at the chemical bonds and forgetting how the biology connects up makes it easier for them to be an anti-evolutionist. So um, Creo Debunk asked, uh, do we know about Walter, I think is Vyth? And I am not familiar with his work. Um, I don't know about RJ. I imagine RJ probably yeah, is because RJ knows everything. He's one of the little fringe creationists. Uh, I think he's from Germany. Um, if, if memory serves me. And um, th there's uh, a, a, a small but burgeoning creationism movement in Europe and uh, South Korea and a few other places. There's kind of an intelligent design bunch uh, uh, coming up in don't Brazil. Don't tell me about South Korea. I like my trips to South Korea. I don't want them tarnished by the idea <laughs> yeah. that they're YEC is running around. Yeah, they're, they're all, they all travel through the evangelical uh, support network. So the, yeah, the creationists then go and visit the fellow believers in the new country and spread the material. Plus, the stuff is available increasingly <sighs> online, so people can get it that direction. All right. Well, I'm still going to enjoy myself some kimchi whenever I can. So <laughs> that's not going to ruin it for me. But it, it, it does make me sad. I see a question from Eric the, Tricer the Tyrannoceratops. Uh, what got him interested in the creation versus evolution debate? Uh, I really, um, I described it a bit in, in my writings at the, uh, the TIP project at www.tortukin.wordpress.com um, that I had a long abiding interest in dinosaurs and that had estimated Yay. for years from when I was just a kid uh, and all through the 60s and 70s, I kind of had lo lost track of it. And then in the 1980s, as you found the new upsurge in dinosaurs and scale model dinosaurs and all of that, I really got into it with a vengeance at exactly the time that the young earth creationists were putting up their equal time rules and trying to tell me that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. So that's when I got involved with it because I'm going, oh, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and my interest in that then never stopped. Um, the intelligent design movement as it happened some of the big poobahs of that were in Spokane, uh, Steve Meyer at Whitworth College at the time. And so I gradually discovered uh, more and more of what was going on and started researching this stuff by the late 1990s in considerable depth. And that's when I thought, yeah, I'm kind of into this. I'm going to keep at it. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Speaking of that, is that a new, is that Noah's Ark thing a new thing? Because I, I think before maybe they are, they are like, oh, they died in the flood, but now they're saying that they, they were on the ark and died after the flood. Uh, oh, well, so that, it's, that was a logical... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dapper. I was going to say, so it it's it's gone in a few different directions. You can still find a few people out there who, who think that dinosaurs are just the devil's trick. Um, I do believe that most of the whole dinosaurs are a hoax by paleontologists. I think that's pretty much just pose. I don't think really too many people legitimately yeah. believe that. There's no, there's um, no clarity of it anywhere across the, the boundary. Of yeah, you can you can also still find people who say that uh, dinosaurs just didn't get on the ark, and they all died in the flood because they just didn't get on. Um, but I think that the most recent is the the current idea that uh, say uh, Kent Hoven and Ken Ham are pushing, which is that they were on the ark, and they just didn't survive to modern times, or maybe they did in a few isolated areas, but not by and large. Because they um, taste delicious. Also. Well, I, I honestly <laughs> think that the biggest reason that they say this is because. Um, it's fun to think about non-avian dinosaurs in historical times. You know, like it, it would look, I'm not going to disagree with Ken Hovind that it would be cool if St. George fought a dinosaur. Right. 
Like, that would be cool. Yeah, well, Kent, Kent Hovind didn't come up with that argument. That was circulating around in the Dwayne Gish worldview. And and one of the infamous books well, I mean, that he wrote he for kids, Dinosaurs arguments? by Design, he was explicitly, oh. there's a picture of St. George slaying a baryonyx in the yep. book. There's a fire-breathing Parasaurolophus. Uh, all yep. of that's hey. in Dwayne Gish in the uh, by the 1990s. By the way, uh, Gutsa Gibbon has a review of that book on her channel, and she has the physical copy in her hand while she's going over it. Yeah, so do I. So Isn't you, that a hoot? Yeah, if you want, if you want a fun They're little really breakdown thin of that book, they're very oh, thin I don't think books. I ever had that. Kids. There's a, a whole market. He did another one, uh, a, a, a creationism book. I've acquired quite a few of those over the years, uh, but the um, uh, the dinosaurs on Noah's Ark is a logical consequence of the idea that the ark was there to preserve all the animal life. So they were yeah. kinds, they must have been on the ark. But the problem is, is they don't tend to think about that like with therapsids, with, you know, Dimetrodons, they don't think about well, it with giant Eurypids. Uh, they they you know, don't, because they're RJ, largely unfamiliar with that stuff. RJ, there are some Dicynodons mm -hmm. in the, uh, the ark uh, encounter program, if I correct, if I remember. Oh yeah, they, they have now. Oh yeah, the, the Ark Encounter now has had to include those things. Although even in their own accounting, they still have about half of the animals aboard it dropping dead, going extinct, and that's because they can't get past the fact that they can't really resolve that fossil issue about what happened after the Ark. Now you get non paleontologists like Andrew Snelling seriously trying to argue that the elephant kind on the ark turned into all the mammoths and mastodons after the ark. Not just, just that. just a period all, of a few hundred years. Also, also the, they they go with all of proboscidea. So all the gompotheres, all, all of the, yeah. you know, um, uh, moetherium, gompotheres, all of the four-tusked quote-unquote elephants, like just a whole host of families. Because the thing that your average everyday creationist, like, you know, I, I, I'm a... I have a regular old job, but I go to church on Sunday and it's a young earth creationist church. And like I send my kids to the Sunday school where they get taught creationism. Those guys, they don't have any, any idea that anything past Mastodons and mammoths and modern elephants has ever existed. Yeah. Like if you were to show them like, um, any of the ancient proboscideans, they just, uh, what? what was that? I don't know. Is that a pig? Maybe. I still, I, I'm still not sure how a flood causes an ice age, too. It does. Oh, this is this is what's so hilarious about it that they've got this incredible funhouse of continents sliding around, of of forests being flash fro heated into coal, baked, and other areas flash freezing uh, frozen mammoths and glaciers cutting stuff. All of this happening uber fast. But yet they don't really work out where and exactly when all of this is happening. And this is true of all of the serious yeah. young earth creationists that it never gets past the cartoon level. Uh, the thing that all of what we're bouncing around in here now brings up the thing that got me into the debating angle, which is source methods, which is how does the creationist manage to miss all this data? How do they yeah. manage to not work all of that out? Those are source methods issues. And that's well, why and similarly, when I've been debating creationists, I want to find out where they're getting their argument from and show yeah. why they really shouldn't be relying on the people that they do. And, and conversely, what well, you said, you know, like, why aren't you dealing with the data? But yeah, like you just said, there's the other thing where it's like, where does this idea that you're positing come from? And it, it just happened to me today. Um, yeah. I was, it wasn't a debate, but I was discussing, discussing a blog post that uh, a creationist who goes by uh, in his image, although he, he says his Ooh. actual name at the beginning, he, he says his actual name at the beginning of yeah. his stuff. He, he's Henry. And so um, he, he just today posted a blog, blog, I can't talk today, blog, that's how you say it, a blog um, oh. about how you measure fitness and how apparently it's inconsistent. And one of the things he said in it was that, um, Apparently, quote unquote, evolutionists think that tetrachromacy is a, um, a beneficial mutation. And now, if you don't know, um, tetrachromacy is a condition where you actually have four different kinds of cone cells in your eyes. Normally, you would have three, right? You have a red, a blue, and a green. Um, in tetrachromats, who are always uh, double X individuals, by the way, because the genes controlling this are on the X chromosome. 
So if you've ever seen one of those online tests to test if you're tetrachromat, and I've seen a whole bunch of people who I know have Y chromosomes say, oh yeah, I am. It's like, no, you're not. The test is bogus. Just a little PSA right there. Those tests are all bogus. Um, but actually what ends up happening is one of your, one of your types of uh, uh, cones gets two different alleles that are co-dominant that shift the peak uh, spectrum for uh, peak uh, stimulation of that, that cone cell in two different ways. So one goes a bit to the left and the other one goes a bit to the right. And what actually happens is you end up actually getting lower ability to uh, detect color differences. It's actually a minor form of color blindness. And it's one of the only forms of color blindness that is prominent in uh, homo sapiens females and not in males, because um, as a result of the, a lot of the cones, the genes related to vision being on the X chromosome, males are much more likely to have defective copies than females who are more likely to have a good copy of at least one of their chromosomes, right? So, um, but this is one of the, the rare forms where only uh, females can get this form of mild color blindness. And so my question to him was, where did you get that this was a, a fitness advantage? He's like, well, I've been told that. I was like, well, do you have any papers? He's like, no, I've never seen one. I was like, well, if it's not in the literature, it's not in the science. And if you're trying to argue against yeah. The science, you can't claim, oh, some guy once told me. That's not how this works. Yeah. And, and it, so that's a, all a natural source methods thing. Well, I've been delighted to see so many people who have been moving in their own direction towards a source methods approach. I didn't have to prod them on it. Dapper was doing that. Vice Rhino has been doing that. Apologia, Erica, uh, Dan Stern, Cardinale, you know, the whole, uh, Jackson. All of these are ones who are uh, asking these fundamental questions of who says? And is it true? Yeah. And how do you go about checking that? And that's the essence. It's not rocket science. It's very so, straightforward. And, and it, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, so yeah, you, think, you think like uh, the the... I can't say the word. Think because they're doing on videos, videos then and now the internet. It's easier to debunk them. Oh, it's it's certainly In easier. Respect, to, to, yes. Yeah. One one thing that is is great now is um, I don't have to necessarily leave the internet most of the time in order to get a source. It used to be, and I remember a time when it was yeah. basically the case where in order to get a source, I would have to find a place that had a physical publication, and that could often be a hassle because like your local public library probably doesn't have a subscription to all oh, the even college journals. libraries. I couldn't yeah. do a proper source analysis of Dwayne Gish, his books, even though I had them back in the 1990s, because none of the obscure journals in there were available at the universities in my, I have three universities in Spokane, Whitworth, you, uh, um, uh, Eastern and Gonzaga. None of them have a serious paleontology department. So they didn't have any of these things which means I can't check them. I would have to write off to somebody to get me a copy of the thing. This was laborious. Now it's all mouse click. And mm -hmm. so it yeah. makes the, 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 the thing where you get into the difficulty of, of uh, source analyzing creationists is they're a pile of fog a lot. So a Nephilim free and uh, Mr. Batman that I have my debate with, this was just oh. a nebulous nothing. Whereas at least we, you get sources dangled at you by standing for truth and some people of that caliber. Uh, RJ, you and I have both had this pleasure of interacting with Mr. Batman. What a what a <laughs> waste of space that man is. It is. Yeah. Look, I try to be polite, but did you see his his? Uh, in, I'm not even gonna call it debate. Did you see his interaction with Jim Majors? I can't recall that because I haven't watched all of all of his stuff. So I'll take your word for it. I, well, <laughs> if you okay, behave I'm the not, way he did I'm with not, me. I'm not necessarily recommending that you see it, but I'll just say this. It very quickly devolved to a point where I am now um, uncomfortable with the idea that he is allowed near children. Let's mm. just say that. Oh, he has this weird obsession about pedophilia. He was uh, uh, ranting about well, that in, in the debate he had with me. Yeah, I, in hopes of keeping this... I don't even know if this this channel is monetized. I was hoping to keep it there, so that's why I didn't mention it by name, but yes. Oh, yes, yeah, true. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I just blunder in with the terminology on there. Yes, uh, I, was, Eric, I was trying to be... That's a good point. Internet made my journey, too, in a way from YEC a lot more convenient with research. That's the, that's the wonder that we have available today. Nobody, but yeah. nobody, has a legitimate excuse for stupid 
in 2020, not with the availability of the information that we have today. Well, one thing I would like to say about that comment, um, if you if you could bring it up again real quick, uh, Vandalia. Um, so it, it gives the, sort of the double-edged nature of the internet, right? Because it says my journey to and away. And so one of the problems that we get with the internet is that while if you want to be careful and intellectually honest and check for rigorous sources, you can. It's also really easy to fall into an echo chamber of nonsense. Yeah. Because well, the, internet the truth does that. Right. He, he is knee deep in sources. The problem is he doesn't really understand them and he doesn't read much outside them. But he remembers the big words, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which Created heterozygosity. Big words that he doesn't really understand seem to be about 80% of SFT's content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never, never be thrown off by jargon. And if somebody tries to throw you off with jargon, do the, the simple question is saying, can you explain that? What does that mean? And if the person can't explain it, then they don't really understand it. Yeah, I, I, I love this is with all the YC debaters and stuff. At least what most of the ones I've noticed is how often they don't stay on topic of the debate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well, you're not you're, you're not misinformed here. That there is a degree yeah. of wandering uh, and a, a tendency. For, for one thing, if you start pushing back on a point they raise, rather than engaging on it, they jump to another rock. And the mm -hmm. way I described this with Kent Hovind in my interactions with him, I said, willing neither to defend his position nor abandon it. That's characteristic yeah. of Hovind. And there's a bunch of people online that behave exactly that way. Well, it also even comes down to what topics creationists will suggest, because creationists have a tendency to suggest just absurdly broad topics. Like, I would like to debate mm -hmm. Evolution, including the Big Bang and abiogenesis and nucleosynthesis yeah. and uh, Nephilim is like formation. that. You want to discuss the and the mechanisms of evolution when he means like the reason why there's like matter, <laughs> right? For for creationists, evolution essentially is synonymous with the mainstream scientific consensus on almost everything. Which, to one extent, it shows you just how completely insane the position is. Is because I'm sorry, you want to dispute essentially all of science, like yeah. all of it. Okay, I guess you can, but like, can you see why that's kind of silly? But then on the other hand, it also is a is a good debate tactic because if you agree to a discussion about essentially all of science, who who here or anywhere is an expert on all of science? I, I will wait for someone to yeah. volunteer themselves and then I will pick an area and I will show them to be wrong because you're not an expert now, uh, on Creo, all of science. Creo mentions those magical words, a uh, two second law of thermodynamics probabilities. I would put in information. Oh, okay. That's one of the real yep. big buzzwords that pops up in there. But it's interesting. Now that second law of thermodynamics argument, that's a diagnostic almost exclusively of young earth creationists. And mm -hmm. so sometimes you can be able to pin down where somebody's coming from, the moment they start asking you, well, how do you know that's old? Don't you know there's problems with radiometric dating? Uh-oh, we got a young earth creationist here, folks, because so, that never comes up outside of that framework. So I want that, to, um, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I was saying, does this, this all go back to this Gallup thing we were talking about, about different subject matter? Oh, yeah, that, involved in yeah, that yeah. comes back to the Gish Gallup. Gish likes to do these broad debates, um, but the problem was at the time, he was sort of the, the pioneer of this whole thing. So his his debate opponents didn't really have anything to fall back onto in terms of what to look at to prepare. And so mm -hmm. he would pull out these things from wild left field that didn't have anything really to do with the topic of evolution. But and his his poor, you know, biologist opponents would be stuck trying to answer questions about like the Big Bang. And it's like, what the why? But Going back to the second law of thermodynamics, I have a favorite question to ask uh, creationists when they bring it up. And it's it's very simple. If you understand thermodynamics, you should tell me what units entropy is measured in. Oh, you've been nasty on that one. I don't even know that I would be uh, terribly good at that. The neatest explanation I've had of, of from, I think, Steve, uh, uh, Ken Miller. Uh, no, it, it was, oh gosh, I think it was Steve Bauman who brought it up. Uh, that, that that second law of thermodynamics, if a creationist tries to bring it up with you, you have got them by the balls because there's an aspect. Thermodynamics is the transfer of heat from hot to cold. And so if you do this, 
feel how warm your fingers become? It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. So if all of the stuff that supposedly is happening during the flood, continents moving around, and all of this, it all involves thermodynamic <laughs> shifts. Too much is happening at the same time. Your thermostat gets hotter and it's way beyond just uh, uh, warm fingers. You're vaporizing the earth. And they, That's thermodynamic. The, the you can't get away from it. The, the top level professional creationist, quote unquote, researchers admit to it. They all like, know this, and it, they, it, often it's buried in the footnotes in their papers. And one, one, uh, there was an article, uh, I think, at the uh, Acts and Facts from the Institute for Creation Research, and buried down in the footnote, where they were saying there is a, a still a legitimate controversy over this matter of the heat issue. <laughs> yeah, legitimate controversy, yeah. to put it mildly. And look at how Standing for Truth has waffled on the heat issue. He just kind of oh. like, oh, I don't want to think about that. He, he, he has now gone on to say several times that he doesn't think there is a heat issue. It's like, I mean, oh, your creationist pal disagree. Yeah. Well, so yeah. one of my favorite ways to illustrate this is because, okay, so the numbers are hard to understand, right? Because they're they're just gigantic. They're, they're literally astronomical. Like we're talking about Earth, Earth becoming hotter than Earth the sun, the right? Yeah. Right. So one thing I like to say is, okay, um, you know what viscosity is, right? It's it's the ability of a liquid to flow freely. Well, it's if you look and, at and your molasses is more viscous than water, right? But the asphalt that is the the road surfacing for most roads in say you know most developed countries, right? The pitch, which is the stuff that surrounds the little pebbles that you see in there, that is actually a liquid. It's a very high viscosity liquid, and its viscosity is about ten thousand times that of water, right? So compare how solid that seems and how much heat you would have to use on it to get it to flow like water. And then realize that the mantle, which is technically a liquid, is about as much more viscous than um, asphalt as asphalt is compared to water. Now think about how much heat it would take to get the continents to slide into place from Pangaea to where they are today in the space of a year. I joked about it in the Dynomania uh, in the ch old chapter three of tip, I said that all of the, the creationist lawyers, Philip Johnson and uh, Wendell Bird and all these others should, should engage a class action suit against God suing on behalf <laughs> of the Harappa culture of India, because they were all killed off when the super fast continents of India slamming across the Indian ocean at breakneck speed slammed <laughs> into there. And all those poor little Harappans died of whiplash. <laughs> actually you know there is actually a legal history of people attempting to sue god um but having trouble serving him usually means that their lawsuits exactly. fall there flat is, there is part of the problem he said that's what happens when you try to sue an absentee landlord actually um there was a case of someone suing themselves and winning and thereby actually recovering damages from his own insurance company who was liable for his Ooh, lawsuit it's yeah. And now so he's a he lawyer that, for Donald Trump. He said he said he was negligent in his in, in the course of his injury and that he should be held liable. And because he had the insurance who wasn't wanting to pay out, the courts made his insurance pay out because he lost the lawsuit against himself. Yeah. So that's a thing that happens. Please. Good old uh, law system. I am saying that on the one thing I do when I'm watching a, a, a it's a different thing when you're in debate with somebody live as opposed to watching a debate or watching an, a, a, a lecture that you're going to be criticizing. And there I sit down, I got my iced tea and I'm watching the video and I'm ready to do the freeze frame because the most of the time it's just blither, blither, blither. So if they're just stating statements, they may or may not bump into the data field anytime during that. But if they stop and put a slide up where there's a quote attributed to an actual person. Nephilim Free will do that sort of thing. Or a fact that's supposedly from a particular technical journal and they make the mistake of putting the information down. That's when you do the freeze frame and you write it down and you track down because now they're intersecting the data field and you can yeah. now analyze whether or not it's a fair representation of the data field or an unfair one. And odds are 70% of the time, you're gonna be able to find the original source reference on that stuff and be able to inspect it yourself. It's that accessible yeah. nowadays. <laughs> Although also, I will also say, sometimes you get requests from creationists for sources on things that are just like so trivial that it's like, why would you want a source? Like, um, 
Mm. Going back to just today, because it's fresh on my mind, when I was talking about fitness, and uh, in his image, had said that there's no reproductive advantage to he being uh, heterozygous for sickle cell anemia in malarial areas. And I was like, um, if you don't die so much, you get to reproduce more on average. Like, wh why Pretty would bad. you want a source for that? If you're not, if you're dead, you're not reproducing. Yeah. If you're alive, you can be reproducing. It's like, well, they don't have to. It's like, okay, but on average, dead people don't reproduce. Living people do. It's just like Therefore, there was a, a sudden drop off of Carl Sagan's book writing after he died. Right. Exactly. It's although I mean, there wasn't. Is that like what? Is that like with Kit, uh, Kit Hovind's claim? You don't know if that bone had any kids or had any different kids. It's it's similar oh, yeah. in the same vein that it's like, I, why would you, you really, care? Did you hear the answer I gave to him? I told him every was, single one of those bones had parents. Yeah. So we know they were part of a reproducing population. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if that particular one. And I told him the same thing. Um, I don't remember if it was before or after you did. And he was like, oh, but you see, you just said that they had parents and they reproduced something like themselves. I'm like, right. Because that's yeah. sort of a requirement for evolution that offspring generally resemble their parents. Yeah. And uh, which also then comes back to, um, or not back to, but it, it also reminds me of uh, an interaction, not an interaction, but I responded to, um, oh, what is his name? He's that sort of pudgy Canadian guy who hosts uh, a creation, not creation today. What is it? Uh, like Genesis today or something like that. Um, in, in Juby? Ian Juby, that's it. Ooh, that's it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen much of his, oh. but I have read some of his crap. So Ian Juby had this video about the supposed evolution of sex, where he seems to think that any minor shift in the reproductive organs of one sex will require an identical, like, compatibility shift in the sex of the opposite sex. And I'm just like, Ian, you... You belong to a species that has considerable differences in the size and shape of reproductive organs, but tab A won't fit into slot B is never something that I've heard in terms of fertility problems for a couple. Like, that's not a thing that comes up a lot. You, your, your own species disproves your point completely without even having to argue about their evolutionary history. It's just... Are all penises the yeah. same size? No. Are all vaginas the same size? No. Is physical incompatibility the normal cause of infertility or even just one of the ones you ever hear about? No. So it's yeah. not Another that big of a problem. Another advantage of the source checking thing on videos is that you learn shit. The very mm. act of tracking stuff down, especially on subjects that you didn't know before and you go, Oh, wow, that's fascinating. I, I didn't know that. And then you start researching more and often um, uh, do something as simple as uh, when you put in uh, a search for a technical paper, put in most of the title, because then you'll often be pulling up other material in addition to stuff that's been citing it that are on related themes. And you go, Ooh, I didn't know that there was that much out there. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 joke. What comes out? What gets out? A little joke here. What gets out? Did faster? Uh, this, 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 the science, uh, letters or or computers? <laughs> I would still say computers, but it's close, and it depends on the field. Um, for instance, in some very fast-moving fields like um, genetics, if you're not on top of the literature, you you just have no reason to talk about it. Um, whereas on the other hand. Yeah. Um, if you're doing like paleontology, it's there's still good reason to cite papers from like the 1880s, because I mean there are, there are fossils that have been described in the 1880s and not touched since. And if you're going to write Although about that it's fossil, it's fair to say that if you're relying on older material for perspectives, holy shit, you're going to be in a mess. Because yeah. um, uh, in paleontology, like bird evolution is a perfectly fine example. When I was first diving into bird evolution in the 1990s. There was like three or four Mesozoic birds known. And starting in the mid-1990s, that went from five to 15 to 30. To, <laughs> and, and so now we have an mm -hmm. enormous glut of Mesozoic avians that have been just discovered since the 1990s. So if you're relying on books, uh, particularly if you're a poor, lowly creationist, 
who is relying on a Kent Hovind video from 2000 that's relying on creationist writers from the 1970s, oh boy, already you're completely off the map on there. Uh, geology, anything that's pre-plate tectonics uh, in genetics, anything pre-1990s, because that's when homeobox genes were de developed. So it's really, with the, well, the fields today advancing so quickly, it can almost be argued that, that anything predating 1995 be more wary of because that's a long time ago in scientists' years. Yeah, it's one of the things is that um, it's. I'm not going to say it's never appropriate to cite an old paper. Sometimes it is, right? And it's going to be somewhat case by case. But as a general rule of thumb, yeah. if you're citing things that are more than ten years old, um, unless you can show me that, that no work has been done on this topic since then, you are probably citing something that's too old to be taken seriously. Oh, and that's also a dead giveaway, Dapper, uh, uh, is that if somebody is trying to throw a paper at you from 1980 on a on a particular subject, you would go, like, science stopped then? And that should immediately pique your curiosity as to why they're relying on such an old work. It's the, speaking of that, it's the most recent thing that, the way I see, that I know about, might be more recent now, is the... Is the is Mary Schweitzer's dinosaur thing? Is that the most recent thing they use? Uh, so it is one of the more among them. You things. get the cold slab argument is fairly recent, but but it's it's the hot button thing because it's supposedly the smoking gun of recent uh, thing. That why those those giant textured bone blood vessels, blood tissue can't possibly have survived undeterred for millions of millions of years. It must be only a few thousand years old when in fact we discover that they're tiny little microscopic sniplets that are buried down inside a bone that they had to put like acids on to soften up and that, no, 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 no. That, that, that's perfectly oh. feasible. And hey, wait, can I go on my my Mark Armitage soft tissue Tyrannosaurus? Yeah, go uh, rant for us. Triceratops. Talk about God, Triceratops horns in quotes. Okay, so Mark Armitage claims to have pulled out these sheets upon sheets of soft tissue from a, a supposed Triceratops horn. What there are numerous problems. One of which was that in his pictures of the finds, you can see obvious contamination from bacteria and plants and fungi and he admits to having found as much but there is nothing in his methods where he said how he separated out this contamination from the fossil when he then dissolved it in acid to recover these so these soft tissues or but even ignoring that right that that's the big thing ignoring that we don't have a sam a map for the samples that were taken we don't have adequate uh, pictures of the samples in situ. We only have one picture of the horn in situ, and it's a terrible picture that doesn't even let you know how long it is. We don't have a picture for the rib or the vertebra he found that show it in situ. We don't have a site map. He didn't even properly identify the formation where it was found. He gave yeah. a name of a formation that isn't found in the literature, which means he has to, if he's trying to name a new formation, which you can do, I mean, that's fine. But you have to adequately describe it with a whole geological, you know, the, the geological context, and exactly where you can find outcroppings. Air quotes, technical paper. It, the, the, yeah. This relevant information that ought to be there ain't there. So basically, all we can say is Another one time Mark found a horn of something and he recovered something from it yeah. that was stretchy. That's all we can say. And here's again where we get into historical issues. Because we've been down this race course before, the creationists will have their hobby horses that are just ubiquitously presented, and then they kind of fade away. The Paluxy River tracks were the um, soft tissue issue of the 1970s, where supposedly there were human and dinosaur tracks together in the same deposit, Paluxy River, Texas. That's proof positive, proof positive, until... Um, Henry, uh, John Morris, uh, the son of Henry Morris, was finally brought down there by uh, critics, and he's looking at there, and he's going, no, actually, this is just the heel mark of a standard uh, theropod. Uh, it's not a human footprint. And well, it wasn't just so a standard theropod. It was a, it's an ornithomimid, uh, yeah. to be fair. Yeah, but the, 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 the issue is that you have this was ubiquitous in anti-evolution apologetics and creationist apologetics oh, in the 1960s it. and 70s. 
And now it's very rare, but yet the people who bring it up will be somebody like Kent Hovind relying on Carl Ball, reviving on the thing, repeating it over and over again, or people who have been reading old creationist literature and not knowing that there's been more dust settled since then, not realizing that. So uh, the same Actually, way that, that you constantly bit the Piltdown case that constantly gets mentioned. That, that's oh. the one that's a recurring favorite. They, I, they still trot that one out today. And almost invariably Nebraska Man. Why? Because that's what's in the creationist discussions of it. I actually, I hate the Nebraska Man one even more. Because at yeah. least Piltdown Man was taken seriously by some scientists for a while. A fairly long time, really. Oh, but yeah. Nebraska, Nebraska Man was, was like never... A shelf life of like six months. Right, and it was never taken very seriously by anyone but the person who said, who first found the tooth and, and said it was a, a hominid fraud. tooth. It was just a misidentified tooth. Right. And it, it was a mis to misidentify. Again, and even uh, he, uh, and even he didn't like the, that the artist wondering that guy did. Even he was like, no, that's not, that's not right. Yeah, it's. Yeah, that it's, was just it's a very popular frustrating. newspaper article. That I, I covered it. Planet of the Apes chapter uh, at TIP, I go into uh, how the Piltdown story built up and also the Nebraska Man story. And whereas Piltdown is a legitimately bad fake, there's also even a reason why it lasted so long. Every, you put the chronology in. It's that it was found in 1912, 13, 14. The guy that found it died during World War One. World War One kept everybody really busy they made casts of it and kept the precious fossils stuck away in the British Museum so people couldn't look at the originals much anymore. They were all using the, the casts. And then World War II came along, so that was keeping everybody occupied. Then um, almost immediately, though, by the time you get to 1945, they now had all these African Australopithecines and newer fossils coming along, and Piltdown didn't look like it fit anymore. That's why they immediately started studying this thing again and realized, no, uh oh this was a fake. A fraud and it disappeared kapoof and worse no creationist claimed it was a fraud creationists claimed it wasn't a transitional they didn't say it was fraudulent it was the scientists yeah. that proved it was fraud <laughs> yeah in fact the the only up until very recently the only actual frauds that i've ever seen creationists really put forth in terms of like we think this is a fraud but the scientific community doesn't agree uh has been Ar uh, archaeopteryx except that there have been too many yeah. fossils now of Archaeopteryx for the Except Archaeopteryx the to have really been a fraud. Who was still pushing that Archaeopteryx fraud thing just last year. Oh, but here's the other thing. He also argues why Archaeopteryx doesn't count as a as a valid transitional, even if it's real. It's like, well, pick a lane, dude. Is it yeah, it doesn't yeah, count? Well, that, or yes, is it a fraud? A He's all over the map on everything. He's uh, he's the he is the Donald Trump of creationism. Mm. You know that's surprisingly accurate. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about yeah. it, but um, yeah, I, I did a I did a, a, a one of my very earliest YouTube's was on uh, Kent Hovind is the Donald Trump of creationism, or Donald Trump is the uh, 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 Kent Hovind of politics. Either way. Uh, that they are the, exactly the same kind of exceedingly narcissistic ignoramuses who mm -hmm. will have a fundamentally bad method, who are never wrong. That's why uh, if, if Trump ever goes to jail, he won't be contrite any more than Kent Hovind was contrite. I don't think Trump's going to prison anytime soon, I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I, I don't I think so either. I want, I want something much worse for him. I want to lose all his money. That is a possibility. Yeah, that's already happened. He got one point one billion dollars in debt. Anyway, we digress. Another thing I hear a lot of them saying is that the uh, quote, "It's a common designer." They they, they use the same template for every, all the animals or plants or whatever. Yeah. And so there, there, yeah. it's a cat. Oh, go ahead, Dino. And I, then I'll I'll put in any comment that I okay. Want. So. There, there's a there's a couple problems here. One is okay. Common designers do sometimes use common templates. Um, that's that's a valid thing to say in terms of divine. But one of the problems is that um, common designers don't just follow the template. They grab what they think will work best. So, for instance, if you need something that's going to swim through the water and catch fish and be a bird, there's still no particular reason why you have to go with the relatively inefficient design of 
shifting a bird wing into a flipper. For instance, uh, sea turtles have much better flippers yeah. than penguins do. Why not just grab the bone structure from a sea turtle and shove it onto a bird torso and neck and then go with it? Yeah. It would be a much better system because the the additional flexibility, the ability to actually use the elbows for something, all of this stuff is actually more efficient. That's one of the reasons why sea turtles can get respectable speeds with relatively low um, like uh, rates of flapping their, their fins. Whereas if you ever look at, uh, say, a, a, um, a penguin swimming, they're frantic. They're flapping those poor little wings it's just so often just yeah. to get any kind of speed. And you could come up with and much it, better it's designs. It's one of the rare cases of where birds have been able to invade an aquatic habitat. The dinosaurs mm -hmm. finally made it with those birds. But boy, it's it's not pretty sight. Well, the, the problem with, with dinosaurs is um, their eggs are super dependent on being laid in air because the way that they yeah. get oxygen is through air diffusion through tiny pores in the eggshell. So they're, they're sort of hardwired to be really bad at, at being aquatic, which is why it's so uncommon to get truly aquatic birds or dinosaurs in general. Yeah. But um, what I, my, another... my go-to example on a, a weird design that the common design argument doesn't explain are tooth enamel genes. Oh yeah. You make a toothless, mm -hmm. You make a toothless mammal, like a baleen whale, all toothless mammals, and you put tooth enamel genes in them? This is like putting a gas tank on a, tes on a Tesla or a bale of hay in the back of your car for your horse. This, this doesn't make sense. That, that if you're going to make a toothless mammal, why would you do that? But in fact, all, all toothless mammals have tooth enamel genes as pseudogenes, and even... Mammals that lack tooth enamel still have the tooth enamel genes as well. Yeah, and they also, I, I think also, they, back to Kevin's other thing, they also use, they use non-living things like, like cars or planes or skateboards to say, yeah. see this, all these are similar, so that's why living things that, that can reproduce are, are created. <laughs> That kind of an argument has a double-edged sword to it because if you look at designed objects, you could say uh, a 1959 Cadillac and a 1959 Lincoln and a 1959 Imperial all have wheels and they've got uh, fenders and they've got headlights and steering wheels and upholstery and camshafts and blah, 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 but they're all designed by minds. Yes, but they're not designed by the same minds. That how do you mm -hmm. know there was a single designer? And that's the fascinating thing is that every one of these designer ones really have a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Jesus Christ is the designer model, not the idea that there was Marduk designing penguins and well, Quetzalcoatl doing dinosaurs, the feathered serpent. I mean, why not? <laughs> let's let, let's be a little bit more ecumenical and say the, the Abrahamic God, because Let's not forget, there are um, Jewish and Muslim uh, creationists who would not accept yeah. the Jesus design answer, but they would say that exactly. the, the God of Abraham that can, that can is... Make, by the way, the person I was doing on that was Bill Dembski, who has explicitly used that argument that it's Jesus Christ in person who was doing all this designing. Yeah. I mean, look, Yeah, I'm not here to tell you what religion to have or anything. However... <sighs> From a strictly scientific standpoint, even if you could demonstrate design, it would be very hard to differentiate between single designer versus multiple designers multiple who get design. to copy from each other. The designer of the dinosaurs is the same one that did the Ediacara biota and the Cambrian arthropods and all of the, the Cenozoic mammals. I mean, they look, they, they, they're, the, the disparity there is far greater than between the 59 Cadillac and the 59 Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> and or yet between no one's the claiming that they're all the, the time by the same people. Yeah. 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 Because well, uh, we, get, we get a lot of problems. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, because the uh, 59 way. Cadillac cannot, cannot evolve into a 2020 Cadillac. Well, certainly yeah. not. However, on. and here, here's the other big issue here, because this is the Paley watching analogy. The, where it breaks down is the moment you have reproduction because no automobile mates. Your Toyota is not going out and boinking the Honda next door. That's never going to happen. Know that. 
<laughs> you don't have a little, well, yeah, well, let's put it this way. You'll see the little, that's where the lawnmowers come from. If the, the moment you have reproduction with genetic modification that can be inherited, you are now in a Darwinian worldview. And yeah. this is the thing that creationists, they don't realize, or in fact, to some extent, they do realize because they have had to adopt at the higher level theoretical end. The modern day young earth creationists are well aware Yes, speciation happens. Yes, natural selection happens. Variation within a kind. The problem is they can't mark off carefully. Where do you draw the line down where things are? How do you avoid getting into those? And when you look into their baromenology, you discover in every case that they're leaving out the edges so that they don't have the overlap. Because there's so many almost this and nearly that's. Try to furrow your way through the dinosaurs. Dapper Dino knows about this. Try to work your oh, way yeah. through any of those lineages and, and demark where the nice, neat, tidy lines are. Yeah, tell, tell me the, the big difference between basal ornithopods and, say, basal thyreophorans. Uh, good luck. Yeah. But then look at, uh, say, you know, the difference between Ankylosaurus and, uh, say, Edmontosaurus, and it's gigantic. But you go back down into the early Cretaceous, or sorry, Jurassic, and it's like, Hmm. So remind me again why Scutellosaurus is so much different from, say, Heterodontosaurus. Yeah. And the answer is like, yeah. I, I oh, mean, Creo it's not. Up there, they, they claim the curse and degeneration caused inefficient design. Yeah, that's their get out of thinking free card uh, in the creationism game that they can just, uh, it's the fall. Yeah, that's why yeah, there's the, malaria or fill in the blank. It's all, although the Michael Beebe didn't exist Michael until gets into a problem with that malaria issue because he is actually arguing in his more recent books that the mutation that's preventing our antibiotics from working might have been designed, which means you got a sadistic designer coming on there go, no, 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 don't you go curing that malaria. No, no, no. That's kind of creepy. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I've had the discussion about um, sickle cell and malaria numerous times with creationists. And it seems very hard yeah. to get them to understand that uh, there's two things that it seems hard to get them to, uh, to understand that one, <laughs> your preference doesn't matter to evolution. The fact that you don't like sickle cell anemia does not matter to evolution. It like not even a little bit, but the other one is that um, whether something is beneficial or not is entirely context dependent. What is beneficial in environment a is detrimental in environment B and neutral environment C. So, yeah. If you were in an environment with like super oxygenation where your blood oxygen levels don't, don't matter much, sickle cell anemia wouldn't be much of a problem. Okay. But in the real, in the current real world, in most places that aren't, you know, don't have a lot of malaria, even being heterozygous for sickle cell anemia is a slight detriment because you're going to have a slightly lower life expectation. But if you're in an area yeah, where I one of the most it, common causes of death is even, malaria. There's even a term. There's a term for that category. It's called the scorched earth defense. That that a deleterious mutation can be selected for if it protects you from something that's worse. And so malaria kills more people than the sickle cell anemia gene will do. So mm -hmm. it survives because the downsides of it, if you're in a malaria environment. Now, Africans where this developed initially came here involuntarily now they're in an environment where there's no selection pressure for the malaria because there isn't malaria here the way it was in Africa. Now that deleterious gene is on its own and people who get the two alleles to where both parents have it have a serious problem with the anemia, whereas overall it's not a problem. And by the way, there's a, that, this has cropped up independently in various humans. I think there's another bunch that have got um, a, uh, a, a sickle cell mutation that performs... A comparable function and it's a different spot of the world developed independently but uh right. and there's uh i think there are a couple other illnesses that are thought to be scorched earth defenses because they insulate you from something else a weird irony here for example is that uh the the efforts to clean up measles in the early 20th century produced a polio outbreak because Getting immune to the measles, surviving that, immunized you from the, the polio parasite, the polio thing. And so hmm. when they cleaned everything up, suddenly you have this burst of polio because the selection pressure has been removed. There's another scorched earth defense issue. Yeah. And 
but what frustrates me the most is when there are these things that are they're not controversial at all and don't even necessarily contradict young earth creationism like it is accepting the standard definition of fitness and accepting why malarial resistance from um yeah. sickle cell would that would that ruin young earth creationism no not on its own but because it it feels too evolutiony and it concedes a little bit more ground than they're used to or, or yeah. we're comfortable with. They're just like, no, it's like, you know what guys, if you guys want to make yourselves look stupider than you have to, I'm not going to complain too much. You have fun. That's with that. why you still get a, 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 another one of the buzzwords that, that everybody who has dealt with creationist hits over is speciation. And whereas you're serious anti-evolutionists, have pretty much thrown in the towel on speciation. Yes, mm -hmm. speciation occurs, new species originate in nature. You find this all the way through. It's ubiquitous in modern creationist literature. When well, you but, get but to grassroots anti-evolutionists, they, they still right? dig in the heels and refuse to accept speciation. Is that where they say, but there's still flies, or there's still bacteria, or there's still this, or, or there's still yep. that? They'll always just pick whatever yeah, that, that's, that's part they're of the most dog. familiar with. Yeah. And the thing is, and, and there'll be invariably what, what you want to have in the back of your head. And there we get back to the how to use in a debate context is um, whenever they bring up, well, the dogs are still dogs. And I go, well, what about myocids? Where do they fit on this scheme? And they've never heard yeah. of that because their creationist literature has not discussed it. Are, are they dogs dogs too? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, when I had my. Or rather, when I was trying to have my debate with Mr. Batman on dinosaurs surviving with human beings, and of course he doesn't know, he literally didn't know diddly squat about dinosaurs, I was trying to bring up the spectrum from Cetacosaurids to Protoceratopsids to Ceratopsids and their biogeography in Asia and the New World. Well, boy, I was operating way, the contrail was way above his head at that point. And it never never even landed on it because he was still wandering around in, in philosophy and all that. But I was trying to bring that up because that was yet another example of those almosts and this and that. Yeah, like recently, like, I did not know until really recently that hyenas that look like dogs are more related to cats than they are to dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have fascinating sex lives and all the other kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> um, the, yeah, they, <laughs> fascinating is one word for it. But actually, in terms of the, the dinosaur yeah. thing, it's actually a, a, a recurring thing that I see with creationists who like to talk about dinosaurs is they don't know what a dinosaur is. They can successfully identify certain genera as dinosaurs. Yeah. But when you ask them, but no better what if than you your average six-year-old. Right. What if you found a new fossil whose genus you didn't know or was... Uh, newly discovered you're, you're the first one to find this genus how do you know if it's a dinosaur before you go and give it a name and talk about its life yeah. history and whatnot and but they have no clue in fact um I, famously, that's why certain bones would be more diagnostic than others as to identify that because some of them are related to the things that allow you to identify it as a dinosaur and that's how you right. got your some ankle crazy. bones or a femur or a skull you, or a hip bone, yeah. you can tell yeah. that's a dinosaur. You get some bones like, are an important yeah. issue to deal with, and and this is a way for anybody that wants to do debates with creationists. Here's another helpful hint: is if you see a collection of, of bones in a graphic that you can, and you've everybody that that searches around for stuff, they can see them. You can see them with human evolution. You can see them with critters of all types. When you see those, ask yourself how many of those can you identify specifically or at least generically. So if you look at a skull, can you go, oh, that's a mammal, isn't it? As opposed to, oh, that's some reptile or dinosaur maybe. And if you can't perceive a lot of that from your own familiarity, you're probably not going to be able to do very well in dealing with the creationist who may or may not know any more than you are. But if it's a, if it's a matter of everybody flailing around, not knowing one thing from another, you're in trouble. So that's an, an yeah. area that I think can be really quite useful on that, that, that at the very least I play the game. I, there's a lot of paleontologists I follow on Twitter and every once in a while, some of them will throw up uh, various uh, fossil information and they won't necessarily go out of their way to, to say what they are because they're talking to other paleontologists. So they're just putting this, this is neat. And I will go, okay, is that a so-and-so or not? And that's helping me refine in my own sense as to, am I, 
familiar enough with the material in the same way that if somebody is shown um, the, the tail light of a vehicle, could you go, oh, that's a 1959 Cadillac. Yeah, there it is. That's the only one that looks like that. Then you know your cars. If you're looking at it and you can't tell that from an F-15, then you are in the wrong line of analysis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I, can I mention one of my pet peeves in terms of uh, comparative anatomy with creationism? It's mm. it's creationists who pretend that reptiles have diaphragms. Please, Ooh, if you're yeah, a creationist, yes, I just heard that one. The one that you were. Oh my god! Look, no. creationists, please no, no. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me right now. Any creationist who watches this, if you think that reptiles breathe with a diaphragm the way that mammals do, one, you are wrong. Two. You are too ignorant about comparative anatomy to talk about it. And three, that's okay. Just stop talking about it and actually read up on how reptile respiration works. Then yeah. you can come back. But please stop. I have heard it from too many people. Like, how do you go from having a diaphragm to having an avian style of respiration? It's like, well, first of all, you never had a diaphragm to, be to begin with. So I don't know why it's an issue. Hi, brain bug. Hey, brain bug. How's it going, man? Brainbug was the first human organism that was guest on Evolution Hour after I got back on with the laptop mode there. And his picture mm -hmm. looked better than mine, damn it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope everybody is catching the fact that you should never feel intimidated by this stuff. You should feel energized. You should be delighted at the accessibility of the information. You should mm -hmm. be inflamed by the delight in it. It's so much fun. You learn yeah. so many interesting crap. It's just, the, how can you not? It's like a, a, a candy store on steroids. We're living in this yeah. wonderful time when we can get everything at our mouse clicks. Wow. <laughs> but I will say that doesn't mean jump into a debate before you do those mouse clicks. You need to know exactly. what's up before you jump into the debate because i've seen it's not terribly often but i've seen a few people try to debate creationism yeah. who have not adequately researched both the actual science and the creationist nonsense you need to have a good handle on both if you couldn't give a lecture where you're pretending to be a young earth creationist and have it be accepted by at least lay young earth creationists you're not ready to tackle the 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 discussion at from that standpoint. And again, you should have a clear if you idea can't... of what your opponent is going to be saying on that topic. If mm -hmm. you're if there if your opponent has a track record of written or online material, for Look heaven's sake, research it, be mm -hmm. familiar with it. First of all, from a practical aspect, the odds are that person will be repeating the same stuff over and over and over again. So a, a familiarity, a sampling of their work will probably familiarize yourself with that. And if you haven't, aren't even willing to go to that level, why should anybody take you seriously? I, uh, um, Dapper and I and everybody else that I know of in the network take that obligation to be on your game seriously because you don't Very want to, so. nothing is worse than looking like the, well, I don't know anything about that. Well, yeah. then why are we listening to you? And, and conversely, though, you should, I would say before you want to debate a certain topic, try to reach out to someone in that field and have a conversation with them. And if you can have, you don't have to be on their level, but if you can have a conversation where you can feel like you're holding your own, they're not using terms that you've just never heard of and things like that. And that's one of the things that I've done. Like when I do debates about, and say, like dinosaur terms, I talk to Clarify. Sorry. I talk like, yeah, and I, you, I the thing last is like, thing you ever want to do is to be thrown off. You don't ever want to be thrown off by terminology. Don't be intimidated by terminology. Um, uh, make it your little friend to where you are yeah. able to deal with it and, and be able to explain it. Uh, the, the, I felt very happy in my debate with Kent Hovind when one of the questioners in the live chat asked about baromenology, and I could explain it better than Kent Hovind could. So I know. Yeah, it, that that's a big win. topic better than the creationist does. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, that's that is always a, a big one, and that's actually one of the things that I find 
Creationists are super deficient at it. I have yet to meet a creationist who could adequately describe the scientific consensus on evolution or any other topic that they discuss. And I, even to the point of like a well-informed layman, like none of them can adequately describe the mechanisms for evolution or uh, any of the proposed theories of abiogenesis or the nebular hypothesis of, of planetary formation, well, the solar system formation or nucleosynthesis or the Big Bang. None of it, not even relativity. Like none of them and even the get close is, to a basic understanding of those things. Each one of us has what I would call a litmus test item. It's things you know really, really well in all aspects that when you target a question on them, you're going to be able to know whether they're bullshitting or not. So everybody yeah. who knows me by now knows how long is it going to go before RJ is going to bring up the reptile mammal transition, eh? Yep. Because or, that's or, one that I know really well. Or if the debate at all touches on other birds or dinosaurs. Yep. It's like, what is a dinosaur? How would you find out if something's a dinosaur? And of course, the answer is wrong. Yeah. And, that, and that's where you got your famous uh, now open sequence for your videos. Exactly. Yeah, that comes from my debate with Kent Hovind because it, it, all of my videos start out with uh, a, some music by Bent Hovind, my co-host for Kent with Bent. But there's yeah. an audio clip that plays of me asking Kent Hovind how he would des decide if a skeleton he found were a dinosaur. He's like, well, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. It's like, well, then you're not equipped to have the discussion. And this, that's I think, is the supreme failure of anti-evolutionists across the board. It's that, can't you come up with a detailed model of what you think happened? Don't blither blather about why evolution can't explain X, Y, or Z. You come up with a model that accounts for all the data better than the evolutionary model and la-di-da will be impressed. But don't try to end run it the way that they tried to do. Well, as it, it also comes back to your whole, like, um, RJ, that when you say that, you know, we're just going to run to the origins or bust thing, where it's just like, yeah. let's just go far as far back as until we, everyone is a little bit uncertain. Because I don't want to deal with any of the stuff that's, you know, really well understood, because all that yeah. stuff ruins everything I'm saying. So we'll go to the one, we'll, we'll go to the first place where we can find uncertainty on both sides, and we'll just stick there. It's like, you're, you're look, racing... You're racing past all the exclamation marks until you can find a question mark. Yeah. And the thing is, um, even if, let, let's just say, right, just for the sake of argument, that the answer to the puzzle of abiogenesis is there is no naturalistic explanation. It has to be a miracle. That's all miracle. there is to it. Let's, let's go with it. Sure. You know what? Fine that doesn't invalidate any of the genetic data for universal common descent. It doesn't invalidate any of the fossil data for that tracks. Evolution the through the, away. The one right. of the little go away. None of this changes, but yet, but yet it's the go-to model, especially for grassroots creationists. It really takes, um, and th this in the debate context, you're way more likely to be bumping into somebody that's trying to play the origins or bus card than you will the natural theology G whiz card where they've deliberately gone overboard on some little minutia example of biology that cannot possibly irreducibly complex system that cannot be explained by the godless evolutionists. Um, that's would be rarer to find uh, a dapper. You can tell on that and, and uh, of Vandalia, you can put it from your perspective that, I'm way more likely to be somebody that's just running on about where life came from. Nephilim used that dodge. Uh, Mr. Oh, Batman yeah. was kind of flipping off in that direction. So even <coughs> though it's a, an open question mark, you're more likely to have to have a position on it because origins or bust is so common. And if anybody will watch the debate that I had uh, over origins or bust with Nephilim, I tried to defuse that by pointing out why he was so obsessive about it. It's because it's that let's run to the question mark thing and it's an evasion mechanism. And yeah, that I, and, I, and because it's, it doesn't change anything, I don't care. Yeah, I, I so, think someone made it, I forget who it was, but I think I, I heard a good example of this was, is um, how a baseball glove was made doesn't have any, any uh, reference in how good you play that baseball. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. a favorite analogy for this, which is um, my favorite analogy for this is let's say that you're, you're driving down the road and you see a car run off into the ditch, right? 
and it's crashed. Oh, okay, so you get out and you investigate, and it's it's snowy out, and you can see tracks sliding off the road, and you can see you're on a downhill slope, and there's a patch of ice right before the tracks go off the road and into the ditch. And you say, well, I think this car was going, wasn't paying attention how fast they were going because they're on a downhill slope, and they hit the patch of ice, lost control, and slid into the ditch. And then your creationist friend who was in the passenger seat comes out and says, yeah, but I don't know what address this car came from, so who can say? It's like, well, what, what or, do you mean? No, it's worse, worse than that. They'll say, but where did the iron isotopes of the car come from? Yeah, it's it's the, it's just like, yes, if we go back far enough, we will get it's to a cool. point where I'm just going to say, I don't know. But yeah. that doesn't negate the stuff leading up to that. You don't need to know and it's where no literally everything... That but then both the French the, uh, anti-evolutionists in Darwin's time, and for that matter, Ernst Haeckel, the evolutionist, was obsessed with origins issues. He thought that you have to nail down where life came from, otherwise you have an incomplete model. Whereas Darwin and Wallace said, who cares? We don't even know how life originated. Let's look at what happened afterward and they could start figuring it out that way. And it's no coincidence then that that's the model of evolution that really began to pick up because they were looking at things you could observe now and test now, not keep on obsessing about where nucleotides came from. Um, but, but back to De back to Depper's uh, car thing real fast. The, the, the other thing that they say too, obviously, you know, it's coming. It says, you see all the evidence there, the, the tires, tracks, you know, but they say, you weren't there. You don't know what happened. Yeah, well, that's that's another thing. Yeah, is, this, this is forensic if you take science. Yeah. yeah, if you take that seriously, all of forensic science goes out the window. But no creationist wants yeah. to go there. None of them want to say, oh, we should overturn all murder cases that were based on forensic science. Because That's why um, I called, but Jackson and I called our book, The Rocks Were There, because that's the perfect answer to this. Is, I wasn't there. No, you weren't there, but the rocks were there. Exactly. And it's it's very frustrating because the thing is, we know how certain processes pro progress through time. And um, granted, in certain areas, it's a little bit harder to extrapolate. And I'll even admit, geology, it's a, it's a little trickier because um, we can't watch all of the processes from beginning to end. So we have to look at little slices here and there and try to fit them together. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean it's impossible. For instance, I can explain the entire life history of a giant redwood tree on the basis of current redwood trees, which I can only observe for the span of a few decades. In tiny because slices, can, yeah. Even though right, the tree so itself the is going to be thousands of years old. Right. But because I can I can look at trees of all different age categories all through, I can explain how the life history of a single tree will progress. Astrophysics does the same thing. You can't exactly. sit at the telescope long enough to see a star born, form a solar system, and then eventually go supernova and blast its remains. I'm afraid that's a little longer than your butt's going to stand. But you can see stars in every phase of those processes as a series of still pictures. And that's another reason why, uh, although there are young Earth creationist astrophysicists, they don't do much, that hmm. astrophysics is the one discipline that is literally time travel, where 100% of it is looking backwards through time. And all you have, nobody has the foggiest idea what's going on in Andromeda Galaxy right now. But I can tell you what happened two and a half million years ago because we can see it. Well, actually, that's an interesting thing. Because, um, yeah, you're aware of Jason Lyle, right? Yeah. That's why I was so, thinking um, I was the one who doesn't really do much. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, reportedly, and I'm trying to see if I can't track this down, but reportedly, he actually said that at, at one point, an interesting proxy for his um, to test the one-way speed of light that he has, because his idea is light travels instantaneously towards us and at two c away from us. Now, ignoring the reason that there's no reason at all to think that there's some weird yeah. isotropy in the speed of but light, how like does that? the light know which direction it's going? Right, and wouldn't it, that alter the e equal m c squared thing? It would not actually. It would. would, that, end up, would, it would end, the math ends up working out perfectly. But the problem is that it's it requires a huge violations of violation of Occam's razor. But then again, Occam's razor is just a guideline. 
But apparently, and like I said, I'm trying to figure out exactly where he said this. I'm trying to look into it. But apparently, he actually said that a reasonable proxy to test the one-way speed of light would to be test to test whether or not galaxies at distant at great distances look the same as nearby galaxies. But the thing is, they don't. The farther away you get, the older galaxies look as predicted by the isotropous speed of light. So we do actually have a proxy. We can't directly measure the one-way speed of light, but we have a proxy by looking at astronomical distances and seeing that very distant galaxies look like our predictions of very young galaxies. For instance, they're more likely to have active nuclei. Uh, nuclei. They're less likely to have well-defined spirals. What spirals they do have tend to be differently shaped as predicted. Uh, all of these things. They're more likely to have a lot of uh, high mass stars. Another one would be how long does it take for galaxies to collide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, wouldn't if all the light coming to Earth have to mean that they believe in a geocentrist or something? The Earth is the center uh, of everything? Ken Hovind does. Well, he's he's a heliocentrist. He thinks the solar system, or maybe the galaxy, maybe he's a, a Milky Way centrist. Well, I think he so, put the throne of God over in uh, Vega or somewhere. I can't remember where he decided that that, that would be. I, I mean, he's I way too literal, that. way too literal for its own good. Well, one thing that's interesting is Nephilim Free has shifted from oh, an explicit. Robert saying that. Oh, okay. One one interesting thing was watching uh, Nephilim Free go from being a, a legitimate geocentrist where the entire universe rotates around earth specifically to being sort of a, a heliocentrist slash milky way centrist where he thinks that there rather than the whole universe revolving around the milky way that there are these quantized red shifts which was an actual hypothesis that was i think in the 80s where there was this data i think show. his main problem is he's in the nephilim centrist well <laughs> yeah but so there, there was actually a period in time where the, the latest data on redshifts actually did seem to indicate that there were these, like, not completely quantized, but there were these, like, shells of galaxies emanating from around the Milky Way that were receding, which indicated the Milky Way could have been the center. But as it turns out, that was simply a sampling error, and further samples have completely erased any sense of quantization. But it, you still get it occasionally in sort of, like, low-level creationism, like Nephilim Free. But... That's still a step up from Kent Hovind, yeah. who is just like, oh, well, I don't I think we can even measure these now, distances. Years ago, it must be true because nothing ever changes in science. Yeah. Oh, and you know, oh, by the way, that's another important issue is that although you get paradigm changes in uh, of the way we approach data, the one thing that don't go away are the data. So uh, right. um, objects fall so that, that even though our understanding of falling objects is different uh, in an Einsteinian frame than in a Newtonian one or a non-Newtonian one before that, uh, hammers would have fallen exactly the same way for Aristotle as now. None of the f data of falling hammers changes. It's our yep. interpretation of it. The problem is the creationist is leaving out big swaths of the data field and trying to end run their argument by just parsing it down, and if we trim it off and trim it off, there we go, no, yeah, that looks the way we want it to. Yeah, that, you, you can't get rid of all the data field that way. We can't take you seriously if you are doing that. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's one of the things that I, I pointed out in my, um, my uh, Academic Fraud Defined video that I released, I think, last Thursday, where I was like, look, the people who obviously deal with the full data set are not the creationists. Yeah. And you know, and also the people who offer corrections are generally not the creationists. A number of my videos, the pinned comment is me correcting errors and even just minor ones. Like at one point um, in, I think one or two of my videos, I have a pinned comment saying, hey, I said for Raymond, I meant Finestra. Like no one to cares. To err is human, to correct requires sound method. Right, but the thing is, like, who who really cares if I said for Raymond versus Finestra? You know what? Yeah. I do because one of them is wrong, and if I get it wrong and it it comes to light, I want to correct it so people know that I'm being honest. And I and have no more skin off the thing. You just go. Uh, I yeah. I can make a statement and go. Oops, wait a minute. Uh, I was making a joke about uh, 
a science fiction thread that was going on there. And I, and I said, Klaatu Barada Nikto, and it was about Forbidden Planet. And, and I immediately realized, wait a minute, no, that's David Yersted still. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, corrected on it. Well, that's what you do on even the trivial things. And if, if somebody takes umbrage at the idea of correcting something or being corrected, well, excuse me, you need to go into another line of area because truth is never going to be your friend. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's one of the things that really bugs me is just, and it came up in that video, and things like stealth edits of videos or just pretending that you never said something or pretending that after admitting that something was wrong that you never thought it was wrong and now you're going to say it's right again. And this stuff, it, I'm not going to say that it doesn't occur in the mainstream scientific community because it does, but when it's brought to light, the people who do that are just ostracized and they're not yeah. it, it can be a career ruiner to do something like this and the same but thing occurs creature. in in history in any in any discipline where you have that precision yeah. that there are some standards of primary evidence that the the requirement in legal facilities and others that the lines you just don't cross you can't yeah. get a rigorous discourse if you're not doing that and so that's why uh, I've never been intimidated by science fields or anything else because it's all the same set of rules. Scholarly methods is the same thing for everybody and everybody gets to play and everybody needs to play by those rigorous rules. And if you don't use them, the thing is, is that the people who can believe twaddle, their brains just are bad at those things. And it shows in their work that they can easily slide around error and they just dig in their heels on nitpicking stuff. And at that point, you realize life is too short. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> also, I, I want to address this Creo debunk thing yeah. real quick. So, yeah, there is there is an apologist, a creation apologetic that's like <clears throat> everything at the beginning of the universe was in like a white hole, essentially. And that in the white hole, because of this it being a singularity, time essentially does not progress. And then as everything spreads out, time starts progressing for it. And then Earth was the last thing to emerge from the white hole. And that's why the universe is effectively 14 and a half billion years old, but the earth is only 6,000 years old. And look, it is utter nonsense. And I actually, um, mm -hmm. my, my 1,000 subscriber special, uh, we did a thing about that. And um, it was me, uh, Bent Hovind, and Cheshire Vic, if I remember correctly. There might have been another, another person, I think... Uh, Duke Ellington might have been there, who you probably don't know about, but he's on my Star Trek Adventures game on Saturdays, so check him out there. But anyway, um, I think I, I think I know the just, rationale of why that's attractive to some, and that's it, uh, I think Hank Handegraaff falls into this, where he's a young Earth but old Universe guy, and that's because so mm -hmm. many of those anthropic fine tuning things are dependent on the standard physics that has the Universe old. Right. If the universe isn't old, then it doesn't matter. God is that where they came up? That was that movie, that Interstellar movie. It was where they they were on space. They went to that planet, and then they ate the people up on the space station. Ate like ten years where they were only there for like ten ten minutes. Uh, are you? It, they, they, it makes fun science fiction episodes. Uh, time dilation and the, the the bit that you get into because time travels differently. Technically speaking, everybody can experience time dilation. Just run around your room real fast. It's a not a lot of time dilation, but technically speaking, you're slightly younger than anybody that didn't move around that fast. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nonsense on multiple levels. And in that, that video that I did for my 1,000 subscriber special, uh, all of us were just like, this has got to be the one of the stupidest things that any of us has heard. Like, this makes no sense at all. Um, it's it's one of those extremely Ooh, post Creo just I asked a, Creo just asked a question like, whoa, we're going to solve that question. What is your most plausible abiogenesis scenario? Uh, oh. I, I, I see it as an interaction between uh, basal RNA and uh, DNA fragments and proteins moving along in a metabolic cycle that eventually gets uh, encapsulated in membranes. And it's probably a training wheel living system that's unlike a lot of the stuff that we see in the last universal common ancestor, which was the one that eventually won out in the Darwinian selection parade over the first hundred million of life, hundred million years of life. There, does that answer the question? 
<laughs> uh, for for me, I think it's some combination of um, metabolism first, along with RNA world. So I think that there's probably some, perhaps as separate, slightly separate entities. We've got um, metabolizing hypercycle like entities, and also RNA, which can you know auto catalyze its own formation as well as the formation of proteins, and then at some point the um, the RNA gets encapsulated in these uh, metabolizing hypercycles, forming now, a to genetic be fair, material for them. We should not rule out the major alternative, which is that the noodly appendages came down upon them, and there was the tomato sauce, and there was the garlic, and there was the meatball, and it was good, and it was tasty. Oh, and Creole also asks, uh, do you see a problem that the membrane must have a, uh, a tense, trans, sorry, ten, trans membrane protein? Uh, your, your spelling's a little off, so it's, it's, it's throwing me. I'm sorry. And I, I realize I think yeah, they're, these, they're are hypnotized, these are hypnotized membranes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, re I, think, I think Creole's, I think Creole's <laughs> native language is German, and so I think some of that spelling is, is coming through. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, I, it's actually, I don't think it's a problem because if you look at hypercycles, which are essentially non-biotic uh, metabolizing structures that have a, a lipid bilayer membrane, they actually don't need that. They would be more efficient if they had it, but not having it doesn't prevent them from having a metabolism. Things can still get and through I the membrane. It's not very efficient. There's a, a mounting literature looking at the pieces that make up membrane proteins and the dynamics of what they do in a pre context uh, that they're just, it, it, it's not, it, it's an immensely intricate task to do. And it involves a whole bunch of stuff as to how you can trim it down to make it explicable. But yeah, that's um, uh, it's probably not as big of a problem as you would think, because you've got these, these components that are ion exchanges of stuff that are occurring in an environment before it really settles into the cellular framework that we're used to in that last universal common ancestor thing. Oh, and I was right. said Salvador Cordova who presents it as a problem. Oh, Salvador presents almost everything as a problem and he understands even less. But uh, I, I want to point out that I was right. Creo is in fact German. I could tell just based on his spelling. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> But uh, that means that my, my linguistic like shop remains intact. The Cretaceous spelled with a K. Yeah, the KPG, yeah, yeah. It's because the same thing is true with uh, EKG, electrocardiogram. Yeah, it's <laughs> in but, um, so, so the same thing with EKG, which is electrocardiogram, because cardiogram in English would be spelled with a C, but in German, it's spelled with a K, and it was the EKG machine was invented in Germany, so there you go. My favorite hey, word, 42. word is psychiatry, which is not a German word, but they pronounce it. They just took the word over. But in German, the PS is pronounced. So it's Pizukiatri. Nice. So, I want to say, so Zemmour42, one day discovered my channel. And next thing I know, he, actually, I, I think it's he, but I don't actually know. Sorry if it's not. But um. Uh, let me know. But he then went on and like watched every and commented and liked like every single one of my videos in the course of like a month. And I was just blown away. I was like, how are you even possibly doing this? This is amazing to me. Like I'm like no complaints, <laughs> but like, my goodness. Thank well, you. At least I it was recently, but a lot of us had a lot more free time than we did before. Cause we can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's true. I suppose quarantine helps with that, discovering a new uh, YouTube content. But no, uh, Zemmore42, he like showed up on my channel and now he's one of my favorite uh, followers because my goodness, he is he is a prolific commenter and I love it and he always has good stuff to say. So yeah. yeah. So, Never be thrown off by a question, even a loaded one. Only be disturbed by people who don't have good answers. So uh, yeah. Speaking of... Uh, Going the, what's your what's your guys's favorite or least favorite debate that you personally have had? Um, I would say, okay, so my favorite in terms of I had fun doing it and afterwards and whatnot has to be the Kent Hovind debate. Um, 
Now, least favorite. So uh, there was, I think my least favorite is a debate I had with a, uh, someone who I did not know at the time, but it was a kid. And um, mm. when I set up the debate, I assumed, which is not something I continue to do, but I assumed that this person was, you know, an, an actual adult. Because even though a creationist, they were asking reasonably good questions in chat and whatnot. And so I set up this debate, and the debate was, uh, is there support for evolution in the fossil record? And I gave my spiel. And then he just didn't have a follow-up for his opening. He's he Because I brought up all sorts of stuff. He was like, I thought we were going to talk about synapsids. I'm like, okay, you can still talk about that in your opening. Why do you think synapsids aren't good evidence? And he, he just didn't say anything. And so um, I yeah. actually took it down for my channel for quite a while until it would not it would no longer be um, something that people would see when they click on my channel. Basically until it was buried deep in my, my video history, I, I did eventually bring it back just because, you know, it's content and it's not, I, I just didn't want it to be the first thing that people saw was me picking, essentially picking on some kid. And I really wasn't picking, I was trying to help out and like, Hey, you can, you can, you know, ask questions, please. And that was rough. And that's one of the reasons why I have become much, much more careful about um, who I bring on. Because I'm not here to pick on some kid. That's not my goal. Yeah. And I, I would, I feel I would wager that. a kid in the creationist framework online who's bringing up the synapsids, I would wager the odds are high that they had been drawing off of that Woodmore app article at Answers in Genesis. As there, because that would be the go to thing, and that probably had inspired him, and then he never quite got around to it. For me, the favorite was clearly Kent Hovind because I had been wanting to debate Kent Hovind for a long time. <laughs> and when it finally came up as an opportunity, I wild horses couldn't have prevented me from wanting to get at my whack, and I felt that I handled myself with aplomb and finesse on it and that I did acquitted myself quite nicely on it. For discomfort, probably it's a toss up between Nephilim Free and Mr. Batman because they're just presuppositional annoying people. Uh, Nephilim yeah. is a little more frustrating, frankly. I was kind of enjoying my thing with Mr. Batman because I was just holding the camera really? up thing with the timer going off. Oh yeah, because he was just blithering on and I was going, do, 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 waiting for him to finish his spiel oh, where he was repeating like, the same can I, thing. Can I talk, please? Over, can over, I talk, yeah. please? I was can actually I having fun with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then no, Nephilim, no, that, that Nephilim is, is... Yeah. Uh, Nephilim is a Dwayne Gish Gallup person who is pompous and he dribbles stuff that he doesn't entirely understand, but he does it at speed. So there's an annoying factor about him that's very uh, frustrating. Least, Whereas Mr. Batman was just floating off into the distance. And so I was kind of actually enjoying waiting for me to get a word in. <laughs> Here, here's one thing I will say about Gish. By most accounts, he was reasonably personable and polite. Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah. Not something we can say for Nephilim Free or Mr. Batman. No. They are rude jerks. And the thing is, sometimes the people they're debating are also rude jerks. And you know what? Sometimes, okay, you give what you get. Fair enough. I get it. But like, I'm not a rude jerk. I am I am polite to a fault. I have people You're complain. To me nice. Really, I am. I have people complain to me about, you are too nice to these creationists. I'm like, Eric, I'm sorry. sorry. The same I'll can be said out. about er Erica gets it given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so I, I've had people like, oh, Dapper Dino was way too nice to Mr. Batman. I'm just like, sure. But it it bugs the heck out of me because it's like you get Nephilim free and he is so arrogant despite being so unbelievably moronic. Yeah, it's like, he's, how he's can so you know this little and be this? You should never be certain with and And, and that's, that puts him in a different category. There's a triage level that I look at it from a source methods point of view. And you don't really bump into many of the higher echelon creationists, uh, either on the intelligent design side or the young earth creationist side, because they don't really do dates and they don't do engaging at that level. 
uh, you have to come down the pecking order quite a ways before you start bumping into ones that will do the, the grunt work. Uh, and then Dwayne Gish probably would be one that would be classified up there because he's a detail fiddler as opposed to the kind of debaters that are secondary parasite types. Dwayne Gish would do his own research. He was scavenging yeah. around on his own in a way that Kent Hovind, no, he's just copying stuff down from Walt Brown and from websites and all this kind of stuff. So underneath the Dwayne Gish level of detail fiddler, you've got your uh, Kent Hovind bottom feeder types who are slavishly copying the material. Standing for Truth falls into that area. A little bit below that is your Nephilim free types because they're still bottom feeding copying, but they copy badly. They misunderstand what it is they're copying at a level that you're not seeing for a standing for truth or a, a, even at a Kent Hovian level. And then below that are your Mr. Batmans that are just a pile of vapor <laughs> and there's no nothing there to deal yeah. with. Uh, well, I, I think the reason that, that happens so much is that from the standpoint of like most. OK, let me back up a little bit. The target audience for young earth creationists is not non-Christians. They are an entirely inward facing thing. No one is yeah. being convinced to become Christian because of young earth creationism. Some people are being convinced to become Christians and then later becoming young earth creationists as a result of having previously been convinced by something else to become Christians. But the idea that you're you're fighting the fight against the secular worldview and you're bringing Christ to the masses through your young earth creation, no. I'm not, I mean, yeah. liter is it no one literally? Okay, there are probably some people who are already very ignorant of science who are convinced, but by and large, all of this material is inward facing. And the thing is, if it's inward facing, it doesn't matter that much if you're checking primary sources or secondary sources or just making it up. If it sounds yeah. good to the masses who don't care, they just want to have their preconceived well, notions in, reinforced. In the, in the Christian apologetic preaching tradition, is one where parasitism is okay. Martin Luther King would pirate stuff from people's speeches and no one would bat an eyelash about it. It's just part of the tradition. And then a somewhat more insidious side is Wait, the idea Martin Luther King that or Martin Luther, Luther King, is, hmm? uh, Martin Luther Martin King Luther. Jr. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the I have a dream, Martin Luther King. Uh, that, yeah, he, uh, there he was fair. a wonderful he, analysis. Bit of plagiarism noted there, huh? This, yeah, it, it's part of that uh, Bible tradition of uh, how preachers deal with a good line. They just go ahead with it. And, and the idea that you need to attribute it is not something that plays a great role in the tradition. But then there's also the insidious type that you find where they will be OK to lie in order to get at the important truth. To misrepresent is OK if you're getting them to the right area. And there's an aspect of creationism that falls into that category. I think Andrew Snelling, to some extent, is operating there. There's a, there was a tactical manipulativeness that was happening with uh, Philip Johnson and others that I find very distasteful because at that point you're in uh, an entirely different vault to where yeah. you're, you're wanting to get them to the right answer and it doesn't matter how you get them to do it. And to some extent, spiritualists, uh, uh, as some spiritualists were just do, uh, overt frauds, but there were others that said, okay, I'm doing a little trick with this table turning here, but it's for the important cause of bringing them to uh, uh, the spiritualism thing. And there's that same dynamic that's happening there. Two things real fast I want to bring up that Dapper uh, talked about too. One, uh, the being the being nice thing to your debater things, which reminds me of something uh, – I think it was Paul Gia said on his channel. He tries not to cuss or anything like that on his channel. So, because 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 he's, I think he said that once you once you go mean or something, they can stop. They can stop listening to yell. He's he's just yelling yeah. now. No, no point. Well, plus he's by nature amiable and mellow. So, <laughs> well, okay. I'm, well. I'm an arrogant bastard, and and, and, and <laughs> if if confronted with a nephilim type, I have lost my temper with yeah. nephilim. On, on yeah. and I'm also it's did with Mr. Batman because he was so so here. Here, here's the thing. I have a similar stance when it comes to, to meanness and profanity on my channel to, to Paul and Gia, which is to say, I don't want anyone to come to my channel and reject what I'm saying because of the manner in which I say it. And while I know that it's not fair that people would do that, I also know that people will do that. And this, this goes back in my, my sort of life story to being a, a kid growing up with a Boston accent 
and realizing that people didn't take that accent seriously. And so right now, you can't hear a hint of Boston accent in almost anything I say. But that's because I spent years getting rid of it and realizing while I was doing so that it wasn't fair. My accent had nothing to do with how smart I was or how accurate I was being or whether I was right or wrong, but it didn't matter because people didn't perceive it as an accent used by intelligent people. So I got rid of it. And similarly, there's a group of people who I would like to be able to reach, namely actual creationists, who if I go around dropping lots of F-bombs and cursing all the time and being mean, yeah. will tune me out simply because of my style. And you know what? It's not fair, but it doesn't matter. Life isn't fair. And that is why I do that. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that there isn't value in having the more um, aggressive or vitriolic or even uh, vulgar groups. Because there are also some people who respond to that strength and forceful uh, rhetoric. And I would like both groups to be reached. But I realize that that is not my strength. I'm not a good cursor. I'm not naturally very good at being arrogant. If anything, I'm humbler than I should be, which yeah. a number of people tell me, but I never believe them, it, except so many people have told me it. Maybe it's true. I don't know. It, it takes a, it takes a, yeah, it takes a lot and very specific things to, to get me to like really angry. Yeah. But that's what, one of the reasons why I think it's nice that there's a there's a variety of people. So, like, um, for instance, Paula Gia and I can be the uh, the more polite and uh, maybe demure or um, he's the Ron Howard humble. of uh, creation anti creation apologetics. Right. Whereas RJ can be a little bit more hard edged and a little bit more combative, and then we Carl can go to Aaron Richard Dawkins. Yeah, we can get to like Aaron Ra or Richard Dawkins or something, and they're they're uh, much much more. They say you're a fucking, you're a fucking idiot, <laughs> right? So I, I think there's value I'm in having the full spectrum. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I think there's there's reason to have that spectrum there because different people need to be reached in different ways, and if if I can reach the people who would be turned off by those things great. If, uh, say, RJ can reach the people who are a bit in the middle, amazing. If, say, Aaron can reach some of the people who can, who are most convinced by people being, you know, forceful and really coming out of the gate. Yeah, with no our, one you know, size fits all. There never has been. Different right. people react in different ways. The one thing that I do always as the universal is the source issue which is if you're making a claim and somebody challenges you to document it, you should be able to do it. And an inability to come up with that is a dead giveaway. You got a problem. Yeah. And also I just want to say, Maya says, consider the venue. A lot of people just want to see a dumpster fire. You can reach more people with being cordial slash professional. In a lot of cases, that's true. But also I want to say Maya Atkinson has been one of my like most longstanding uh, supporters on my channel. And she is amazing. Thank you so much, Maya for, for being such a big part of my channel since basically the very beginning. I don't, I don't know how you even found me. It's just amazing to me. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I love about doing this stuff on YouTube is there are so many people who just somehow stumble across my content and it's, they become avid viewers and supporters. And I just, yeah. it is strange to me to have yeah, people who I can channel. say, yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing. I yeah, I, I still know. I, I found you because I was I was interviewing uh, Eric Verhauer. He says, "Can I bring it? Can I can I bring the Madrid?" And I'm like, "Sure." Oh yeah, Eric Eric Viertaler is great. He's actually the the first and so far only person that I've met from doing YouTube that I've met in person. Uh, he and I went to see the uh, the Victoria T Rex specimen in uh, when it was in Arizona. I guess it's still here for a little bit. But um, he was visiting some family down in Arizona, and I went and hung out with them and him. We went to see the T Rex specimen, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I had a really good time, yeah. and um, yeah. But I would love to meet a lot of other people. Uh, I've been trying to coordinate meeting other people, but 2020 is kind of a dick, and it's ruining all those plans. So, 
Yeah, the other thing I here would be a long term plan. The idea that if and when uh, the uh, Ark Encounter ever goes bankrupt, that a network of GoFundMe anti creationists would buy it and turn it mm. into a museum criticizing creationism. <laughs> Just that would be amazing. I would love that. That would be that would be spectacular, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, the other thing you brought up is about the, the, you debating the, that kid thing. Was I, I made a post about on Facebook recently that I'm trying to fight against too? Is they try to start them young? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, okay. Coming back to Maya, guess who was my moderator for that debate? Maya. Yep. No idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maya's been on my channel. She she was awesome, actually. And she was so nice to him. I was, oh. Thank you, Maya. Well, there's there a level in which you have a, a kid that they've soaked up information in their frame. They're, they're, a creationist is defending the truth with the capital T. And mm -hmm. the idea that they could be coming in, that, they, that there's an important, it, it validates them. Uh, in terms of their elders and their connections, there would be an enormous incentive on this area. The problem is, if you're really young, I look back on what little I knew when I was 18, uh, and if you're even younger, it's even worse. And you you can be ones where you might regret the kinds of stuff because you just didn't have the experience and knowledge and method to be able to come at a, a, a legitimate thing. So you can't feel um, too cruel on uh, people that are just coming up from an environment where from their standpoint, they're just purveying things that are absolutely certain to them. They just don't because realize that it isn't. Because they trust the people telling them that the, the, the right parents or whatever, they, they say, they won't lie to me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So guys, um, we've been going almost two hours and I'm going to have okay. to get going pretty yeah. soon. All right. so, um, okay. So, all right. So let's wrap this up. Any, any last words you want to say about this before we go? I think um, we beat a lot of dead horses. Okay. And, and I want to say thank you to Meyer for that. Um, I still feel pretty bad about that debate either way. <laughs> but um, I will say uh, if anyone here is watching, uh, tomorrow should be Eric with Erica. I did get last minute confirmation from Erica. She's been a little bit hard to reach in the last couple of days, but uh, Eric with Erica should be a go. Um, I did invite Cheshire Vic to be on my stream tomorrow. I don't know if she's going to join. So, you know, maybe, um, which I think would actually be my first Eric with Erica guest appearance of anyone. So uh, that'll be that. Um, Thursday is going to be um, my uh, starting a new series. Saturday, hopefully will be a game review where I'm going to review uh, two games on my channel. It's Dapper Dino, not the coding one, the one with the anti or anti creation and stuff. Um, and yeah, that, that sums out me and, you know, come check out my channel if you like good counter creationism. All right, Jake, you think I your channel? And everybody in the network of, um, uh, YouTube and Zoom the way we have now, uh, Walker did a wonderful debate, uh, and, uh, a, a bunch of us had helped him prep all of that, that make use mm -hmm. of all the tools people have available. Uh, don't think that you have to do it alone that you want to actively seek out a network of people that can help you prepare and up the game because in, in strength, there's numbers uh, in, uh, yeah, in numbers, there is strength in the ability to pull information together and speed up the process. Because if you're trying to depend entirely on you learning everything about everything before you can do this, you, oh boy, that's time consuming. Build off Absolutely. of everybody else. Yeah. yeah. My last, my previous series that I did, I relied heavily on uh, Corporal Anon, and then I got a whole bunch of help from uh, Vice Rhino, who provided me with his data analysis that was just invaluable. So, yeah, don't oh, go it alone. The Vice Rhino stuff that he did on Chadwick's. Uh, That's what or, I used, I think yeah. Either Vice Rhino or the, uh, just absolutely spectacular material, which I confirmed when I looked at the main spreadsheet myself. So I, I could did find too. out uh, Chadwick is the one that was putting all these silly little arrows to try to argue that the flood was, they could literally see in the, in the rocks, the rock, the floods coming in and then draining back out. No, you aren't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what, what I drew on was vice rhinos analysis. So that backed up by me double checking, not every data point, but sort of checking the sort of yeah. general trend of the data points. And yeah. that's what everybody can do that, that look just what we did here. We don't take anybody's word for it. 
You don't need to take anybody's word for it. You shouldn't take anybody's word for it. Yeah. But you should be able to test out by looking at the material yourself. And there's that ring of truth where, yes, this is solid. Mm -hmm. uh, well, All right. Well, thank you I, very much. Very okay. much. Well, yeah. well I, if you uh, check out the link to the description below, if you haven't subscribed to them yet, because I'm pretty sure and, and no one here in the chat has, has subscribed to these two are by now. But if you haven't, do that and click their bell if you haven't either. Anyways, as I always say, never stop buy my book. Not <laughs> <That> you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Time with Caffeine, the only podcast where we do stuff like this. This is my first after show debate debate after show program. Had happen sooner or later, I guess. Yeah, I hope it's fun. I think it will be. Uh, I and, think it will be too. And and Dapper. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yes. I get. I get. I'm getting. Get, get, sorry, I'm getting an echo right here. There. I'm get, you're right. getting an echo for me. No echo for myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> My my YouTube channel turned on automatically. And oh right. <laughs> so, um, so, so, any, so you, anyways, you, you, you don't think it's my fan at all? I can't hear your fan. Anyways, okay. um, I was saying, oh yeah, uh, Eric's been on my channel before, mm -hmm. but Dapper Dinos, new guest for new guest for before we talk in the so introduce yourself, new guest for. You guessed. So uh, I'm the Dapper Dino. I run a YouTube channel by the same name. Um, <clears throat> my content is mostly counter creationism, especially young Earth creationism. Um, I go into a lot of stuff like paleontology. Uh, there's geology. There's astronomy in there. There's some uh, sprinkling of physics in there. Uh, I would say that the area I'm strongest on is probably <clears throat> uh, Mesozoic ornithodirons is probably my strongest area, followed by sort of a general, a pretty good internal cladistics map that I you know, still double check every once in a while. But yeah, those are probably my strong areas. Uh, so if you like that kind of stuff, check out my channel. There's links somewhere probably. Uh, so was this, being, was this your first moder moderation, being a moderator? Uh, yes, it was. Actually, not just on air, but ever. <laughs> Guess that had to happen sooner or later. Yeah, exactly. And um, it was, I, I had a lot of fun. I, when it was over, I was, I was a little tired. <laughs> I can understand why. Yep. Um, and I, I think both debaters did a pretty good job of not talking, not talking over. I got a little bit less well behaved during the Q&A, but you know. Yeah, I would say I got a little heated then. And uh, yeah, and what's funny, originally who I asked to be the, the moderator was actually Michael, but then, you know, Michael said that he didn't really know what to do, you know, as the moderator. And so, and then um, my, my friend Michael's very, very passionate about his projects. And so, and then after that, I thought that, hey, maybe a way to bring exposure to his projects is if I bring him on, you know, to, you know, to do the debate with me. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I think, so I've had a, a day or so to sort of reflect on it. I guess now I've had almost two days to reflect on it. Yeah. Um, and I think that <clears throat> overall, I think Cody probably would have been convincing to other young earth creationists. And I don't think he would have been terribly convincing to people who aren't young earth creationists. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was pretty slick in terms of his opener, and um, <clears throat> I feel like he did a little bit more uh, prep work in terms of coming up with how he was going to say what he was going to say. Not necessarily the research part, but just the <clears throat> sort of writing out a script. Uh, from from what I I, I, I rewatched it this morning, part of it at least, but from what I, I remember of it is that he didn't really get any evidence of the actual thing he just said all he did really was was make the, the talked about how the bible is the authority 
Yeah, and he tried to use dragon legends as evidence for some reason. Yeah, and the thing about biblical authority, that even was something that I pointed out to him, and like that's not an issue on biblical authority, it's an issue on interpreting scripture, and I even point out to him like that flat earthers, dinosaur deniers, they all will say the same thing, like that you're undermining biblical authority. Oh yeah, and uh, Cody left a comment saying, I wish I could join. Um, I, yeah, like this like just popped up. Well, I'd say give him the link. I, I'm I'm perfectly happy to have him in. And Joseph Grant said, "Too bad, Dapper Dino is great." Uh, well, thank Joseph you. Grant, uh, too bad for what? I'm not sure actually what the too bad part is. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm not sure either. But I will say, I think uh, Cody definitely lost at least the audience who was in the chat when he said, um, "Oh, what was it exactly?" He said. I think he's, it was when I, <clears throat> I believe it was when the question of, because I was trying to get it back on topic because we were going on to Adam and Eve and things, and the chat was saying, hey, we need to get this back on topic. And so I tried to push it towards what evidence would you present that doesn't depend on the Bible? Mm -hmm. And the answer was none. I think he lost anyone who didn't already agree with him at that point. Yeah, and uh, the thing about, you know, uh, you know, what? Oh, no, I just... <clears throat> Oh, sorry. And so, you know, like I said during the debate, it's not like that I am, uh, it's not like that I'm anti-young earth creationist or anything. You know, I have friends who are young earth creationists and that's fine. You know, we agree to disagree. It's just the issue that I have is when, you know, young earth creationists will then say, oh, well, it's either you interpret it my way or the highway. And what I was trying to point out to him uh, is like that that's actually causing a lot of uh, Christians to leave the faith. It's because when they go off to college and learn about evolution and, and so, and then they feel like that, Oh, well, I, I have to choose either the science or my faith. And uh, when I talked with Mary Schwartz on the phone a year ago, she actually told me like that a lot of her students like will come into her office, you know, bawling their eyes out, feeling like that they have to give up their faith. And um, I've had a lot of Christian parents come come out to me telling me like that they're horrified of taking their kids to the museum of the Rockies because of evolution. And I've had a lot of my uh, Christian friends come up to me telling me that, Oh, well, you know, I don't know um, if I have to give up my uh, faith because of evolution. And, um, and you know, and even the majority of atheists actually were once Christians like Richard Dawkins, uh, Hugo and Jake, Heath, and et cetera. Um, most of them will tell you like that they were once Christians, but then, you know, but then when they're presented the evidence for evolution and old earth, they felt like that they had to give up their faith. And so. Yeah, I went from like old earth creationists. I think I, think I was ever a younger creationist. I, was, I think it was the old earth for a while. Then I went to <clears> the, <throat> the, the, the theistic evolutionist. <laughs> And uh, Cody, maybe I you did more give more than Dragon Legends. I seem to remember that being a large portion of it. But um, did did we give Cody the link? Um, I also remember like that Cody even mentioned like the T Rex soft t tissue. Yeah, but has Cody been given the link? Uh, I have no idea. I said kind of. Well. Uh, he said, I kind of wish I could join. I assume I won't be sent a link. I would like for him to be sent a link. I'm not sure how to do that on my end. I'm not sure either. You just uh, copy and paste the link and send it to him. Like, I, I, know, I, can't have, I have no, oh, I have no the, way to the contact him. You sent us in Discord? All right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Eric, I assume you have the uh, his uh, Cody's contact info, right? Because I don't. Uh, I, I do have his email. All right. Could you email him that link? Uh, yeah. Uh, hold on. Okay. Because, uh, Cody, I would very much prefer that you have a link sent to you. <clears throat> That's That would be my strong preference. Okay, uh, let me... Okay. Uh, Although, so, I, yeah, so I, anyways... I, have, um, oh, what? Sorry. I was going to say, one. I have to admit that one of the areas where I sort of broke the whole moderator role thing is um, 
I have a bit of a pet peeve, which is when people try to use their understanding of the quote original language of a text when it's a language they don't speak. So <clears throat> yeah, um, like when someone starts going on about the ways that you can use the word yom in Hebrew or what the Greek word that's in most uh, Bibles translated as faith actually means in Greek and they don't actually speak Hebrew or Greek. And so that's where I, I lost a little bit of my complete neutrality there because it's, sorry, it's just one of those things that gets me because I see a lot of people do it and it's just, <clears throat> it leads to people making bad arguments without knowing it because they think they know more than they do about the language. Yeah, and the thing about the Hebrew word yom, and I mean, you know, there are some times in the Bible when it does mean a 24-hour day, but there's also times when it can mean a lot of things. It can mean a go, always, and et cetera, and so and then. I mean, even I, they, you know, I can't what? speak. I, the, the closest I come to knowing much about the Hebrew word yom is that I know most of the uses for the Arabic cognate in Arabic. That's what right. I get. It's so, Without before Cody gets on here, uh, Eric, was there any, any part of the bit you thought you, you, did, you did that in? Like any part you let you, so you could well, do over again? Because it got off top of it with Adam and Eve, I kind of felt like I should have done a little bit more research on that. But at the same time, though, afterwards, I uh, um, I did do the research and, and you know, and it actually did back up like my claim. Um, it actually says in First Corinthians and like that. Um, like that, um, like that ball of man, like will be uh, like the, the dust and like to represent uh, human mortality. And uh, man, it also backs up, you know, like my whole claim about how, uh, like about how, uh, like about how uh, you have to be cautious about taking some things in the Bible to literally. I um, mean, you know, Madam and Eve are pretty much are supposed to represent all of humanity, like for like our sinful matter. And even um, in the original Hebrew text, when I've done some uh, research, I mean, actually doesn't even mention rib at all. That, that actually is just something like that was just uh, matted in and like through uh, English translations, probably because I, I just don't think they had a word for that. Um, it actually says that uh, Eve was made from Adam's side. And uh, the word side in uh, Hebrew is actually... Uh, Hela, and uh, which is supposed to represent, you know, like the Eve is, um, like the Eve is uh, Adam's other half. And see, the thing for me is, I, I have no way to evaluate that argument, but I'm also not sure if you do because I don't think you know very much Hebrew. And that's the kind of thing that gets me is like, you could be right, and you could actually have sources that say this, you know, like sources that are Hebraists and things like that, but. <clears throat> to me, it's sort of one of those things where it's like I, you saying that about the Hebrew yeah. word means yeah. as much for me I, 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 as you know, just some guy who wandered in off the street, and he's like, "Hey, did you know that the Hebrew word for lie is NASA, and that means NASA <laughs> tells lies?" Because I've heard that one too. It's yeah, not, I have. So, yeah, and I what? So to me, unless you have a working knowledge of classical Hebrew, it's like I don't, uh, I don't know how to evaluate arguments from someone who doesn't speak Hebrew about Hebrew. Well, I can understand where you're coming from, but uh, oh, uh, hold on, Cody wants. So Cody, there was a link in the general uh, chat channel for, or sorry, in the uh, podcast videos and information. So yeah, and on that, <clears throat> that uh, chat channel, the uh, StreamYards link should be in there. I I guess I thought if you sent the StreamYards link directly, but yeah, if yeah. you put uh, uh, podcast yeah. videos and information, sorry about but, that. But yeah, but uh, what I was also wanting to say is like that, uh, um, you know, the, the reason why that I say all that uh, um, is because I have... Uh, I have went and looked up, you know, the experts and like who actually have, you know, uh, like who actually have studied, yeah, you know, I, the original I, Hebrew text, right, like, right. Like, scholars and all that. Right. And that's fair. And in those cases, I would say, you know, like if you were to say that in a video or something, I would expect your citation for that to be in there. Cause right, like, exactly. Yeah. And um, it's kind of like how when Chris and Al Claire would do some, I think that this is Cody. Cody, is that you? 
Hello. Oh, oh hey. Hey. What's up, Cody? Hello. Welcome. How's it going? Good. Good. Oh, good. I'm, I'm uh, sorry. I don't have a camera. Hey, you know what? Okay. I I actually just got a new camera. One of my uh, fans bought me a camera. Wow. Well, that was, fans. Yeah. Nice. That was very nice. I'm gonna I'm gonna be thanking her in um, not the video I'm making now because that's all re-recorded and I don't want to go back and re-record it. But um, I'm gonna put something. <clears throat> uh, thanking her in my next video. But yeah, uh, yesterday I went to go uh, take out my trash and I opened the door and there's a little uh, package from Amazon. I'm like, what's this? I didn't order anything. And it says, uh, yeah. to the Dapper Dino. And I'm like, well, that's not normally how I address things to myself. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, sure enough, turns out that uh, it got purchased from my Amazon wish list. So that's really awesome. So nice. since you're new here, you're, you're a new guest. Introduce, introduce yourself, new guest. Introduce myself. Yeah. Um. I, I'm the same guy as from the debate. So. <laughs> hi. <laughs> but but my well, this is my audience, so they might not not know you. Oh, I, I see. I see. So um, uh, I did a debate with Eric, and mm -hmm. his friend Michael, and my name's Cody Sorensen, and um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, you also have a, a, sort of a ministry called Spirit Filled Apologetics, or is it a channel? Yeah, yeah, that's um, well, the YouTube channel is Cody Sorensen, but okay, yeah. So, are you trying to make uh, we'll see, I see Spirit Filled Apologetics. Is that the name of the ministry you'd like to get off the ground, or what's, what's the deal? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's basically it. Okay, and I also but... am assuming, like, that your ministry is something that you recently uh. I'm assuming that this is something what you recently decided to start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I thought so. What's the? Uh, is there going to be a particular focus, or is this general apologetics? Or um, basically, just like in the um about section on the YouTube channel, I just put that I'm defending uh, the reason for the channel is to teach. Christian apologetics and defend the Christian faith by accepting the biblical authority of the Word of God without reinterpretation or compromise. So it's pretty broad, honestly. Okay. <laughs> I think that'd be what most people would say, anyways. But, hey, I mean that's that's a perfectly reasonable description. I mean, not everything has to be a laser focused. There's a good reason to have breadth yeah, in your content. I don't want to get too focused. I want to stay broad with it, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I asked Eric what he thought he, he could do better. What you? Cody, do you think you could have done better at the debate? Any, any particular part of the debate you could have done better at? Yeah, definitely. But I'm, but, I'm not going to say, but yeah. <laughs> do I show your hands? But I also guess to be fair, you know, um, I can imagine like that probably a lot of, I can imagine like that a lot of debaters like would feel that way about every single debate. Oh, yeah. That, See, uh, all my, I thought no. of a million good responses after the debate, but not... <laughs> You know what I mean. Yeah. yeah that's, that's always how it is. I, I should to. have said, or I shouldn't have said. Yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. In, in fact, my uh, my debate with Kent Hovind after I finished, even though I thought I did really well, there was like a, about eight or nine points where I was like, oh, I shouldn't have gone here, or I should have done this instead, or... Yeah. It's the heat know. of the moment and the pressure, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And... Um... And, you know, and that's completely understandable It's because um, through research, I, I have seen and I like that the biggest fear that people have is like to speak in front of a, a, a large oh, yeah. group oh, yeah. of people. And even though that we technically weren't is because we're talking in front of a screen, but at the same time, though, mm -hmm. but at the same time, though, people were watching you and <coughs> felt that in a way, yeah, you were talking in front of a large amount of people. Yeah. That's why I, I, I didn't ever look at the chat. I do have a question about your debate. Uh, this is, you, you did it on, uh, you did it on uh, StreamYard too, right? Yeah, it was StreamYards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you guys ever think about using like the share screen to like share like notes and like do notes and stuff like visual aids for your debate or just was this talking debate? I thought about it. I thought about sharing pictures, but I didn't really want to accidentally share my notes on the screen that right. I didn't want to be seen. So I just held back from it. And uh, that was kind of the problem that I had. I, you know, I was trying to figure out a way how I could, you know, like, so uh, like uh, slideshows 
uh, you know, why I wouldn't be in live. I was trying to figure that out, but I just couldn't figure it out. And so, and then that was why I felt like I had to resort to, you know, putting yeah, on yeah. pictures sure. on my computer. One thing I can suggest is um, get like a cheap second monitor and then you can screen share from the main monitor yeah. and then you can have things that you would rather not have revealed like mm -hmm. your debate notes or whatever on the other monitor. And then unless you slide them over to the first monitor, yeah, well, here's revealed. the problem for me. I actually do have, I have three monitors, but they don't fit on my desk, so I can only use one. <laughs> so it doesn't <laughs> really works. work. That's that could be a problem. Well, in that case, it's time for a bigger desk. Yeah, it is. So, but uh, yeah, that that's a problem. I can see that. Um, Excuse me. I guess the only other thing I could think of would be like, if you had like a tablet or something, and you could keep like, if you had like your your notes or whatever in like a Google Docs or some kind of uh, oh, yeah, cloud based thing, you could just have them on that, and that way there's even less chance of them showing up on screen. But yeah. I. With one monitor, it's it's tough to make sure that you're screen sharing exactly what you want and not other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, even every time my desktop absolutely shows up when I'm uh, streaming, and it's not like there's anything embarrassing there. It's just a bunch of games, some pictures, and yeah. a, a background of Godzilla. Like I'm not embarrassed by it. <laughs> but yeah. whenever I accidentally reveal it, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, that's unprofessional. Shouldn't yeah, be I've up. seen some games that they have like three or four monitors. <laughs> oh yeah, I have. I only have one monitor that I really use for games. The other one usually has like, well, my primary monitor is mostly for games and animating because most of my, or a lot of my videos are fully animated. And uh, the other one tends to be there for other media or reference pictures and stuff like that. Yeah, and I uh, think that you told me what you use for animations in your videos, yeah. but I think I, but I'm just not sure if you told me or not. I can't really. Uh, so I use Blender 3D. Um, it's a free open source. Um, it's a very full featured uh, 3D application. Uh, it has, yeah, it has modeling, texturing, uh, physics simulations. It has uh, an editing timeline for editing video or audio. It's not great for editing audio, but it don't edit audio in, in Blender. Just, just no, watch. don't do but that. If you if you need to edit a video that already has the audio figured out, then it's fine. Um, yeah, it's it's a uh, pretty good. I use uh, a render farm called Sheepit, which is a free sort of crowdsourced rendering so solution where there's an executable that you use and uh, you render whatever frames there are that people need rendered, and each frame that you render gives you points. And then when you need friend frames rendered, each frame that someone else renders for you costs you some of your points. So, okay. Yeah, and that's how I get that done. It's still a fairly involved process. Uh, this video is going to be about 22 hour, hour minutes long, and I think it's going to be, when all is said and done, probably 15, 16 hours of work. Hmm. So, But actually, speaking of the... Um, Cody, you had brought up the, uh, the soft tissue in the Tyrannosaurus. Um, yeah, soft tissue and a lot of dinosaurs. Yeah, well, that actually is going to be a part of my next video because, and this was actually yeah. not a plan because of the debate. This was already in the works days beforehand. Mm -hmm. Coincidence. But, um, yeah, so I actually have some, uh, a friend of mine actually did an on-air interview with the uh, the woman who made that discovery in the first place. Yep. And so um, I'm going to be having her, her own words from her own mouth as part of that, that video. There's a little two minute or so slice where she talks about uh, the discovery, what she can and can't say about it in terms of what the data will and won't support, um, as well as uh, things about dating. So, so like so dating I'm, walks, not dating, like finding a romance partner. Don't, don't use eHarmony, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll-, I'll Or even, uh, or even like match.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guess you know I, I'm I uh, guess you can say it. Hey, it wasn't a good match. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and uh, and uh, Dapra didn't they also find soft tissue in uh, Leonardo? So <clears throat> it's one of the things is um, there's a difference between finding soft tissue preservation at all and finding soft tissue where we can do things like get protein sequences. I'm not sure if that recent find involved that, but 
there are more cases where soft tissue has been permineralized. So for instance, uh, there was that, um, I think it was Borealopelta recently found in Canada. I know it was an, or I know it was a notosaur, and I think it was Boreal Pelta, but my uh, my notosaurine memory is not great. But anyway, uh, that had extensive preserved soft tissue, but they were per it was permineralized. You couldn't get any original organic material out of it. But then there are also uh, exceptionally unusual circumstances in very high iron content bedding, where uh, there has been the discovery of um, of proteins that have been sequenced, as well as chemistry consistent with DNA, but we don't currently have the data to say that it is actually 100% for sure DNA, or that it's 100% sure from the animal whose bone is preserved. So uh, it's... Yeah. Oh, nice. I have a question about the debate real fast. Uh, so whose idea was it, and how did you find or pick your opponent well what happened was um after when i re uh sorry when i re-uploaded the my debate with ken hoven on my channel i um i can probably safely assume like that cody typed in uh ken hoven debate or something on youtube and then he came across mine and then he left me a comment saying that he wished that he debated me and i and i'm like well if you want to have your your chance we you know, if you want to have your your chance, we certainly can arrange that. Yep. So, I was like, I wish I could have debated you, because I didn't think Kent Hovind did very good. He usually doesn't. Um, and so, um, and so Cody, I could probably safely assume that you found my debate, but like by typing in Kent Hovind d d debate or something like that. Yeah, I found it on his channel when I typed in Kent Hovind debate. I saw it on his channel. Or no, was on his channel or yours? I don't. But I, I don't think he ever re-uploaded it on his. Um, I know it was, on, it was originally on praise, uh, praise that I am or something like that. Oh, praise yeah. that I am. That I am. Yeah. Um. It. You know, like that. That channel has a a name that just rolls right off my tongue. Yeah, you know? I, I get why it's named that, but like, uh, it's not. It's it's not the most wonderful name in terms of like yeah. comprehension and. and yeah, and did, yeah, you ask, did you ask Dapper Dino to be the moderator or did he volunteer? Um, so, um, I believe you asked on Twitter, right? Uh, yeah, I believe I asked you on Twitter. And so uh, originally, I, uh, originally I asked Michael to be the moderator, but then Michael said he really didn't know what to do. And um, I mean, since that my friend Michael's very passionate about his projects, and you know, Michael and I have been good friends for about a year now, uh, you know. I just wanted to be a good friend, and I just kind of thought that you know maybe like that, you know him debating with me and like would bring exposure to his projects, and so yeah, I, I mean it kind of sucks by the fact that you know like that the tech nickel side didn't work on his part. Yeah, that was frustrating. Oh, yeah, was. I really liked Michael's questions too, but mm -hmm. oh well. Yeah, it, I, that's one of those things where maybe next time if Michael's going to come on something, there needs to be like a the previous day iron out technical stuff. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I, I had a little trouble, technical trouble at first. Um, I'm on my laptop right now because my desktop just wouldn't connect to StreamYard properly, like at all. Do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna go grab my laptop. Oh, yeah, my last, room. yeah, my last two uh, things with Tony Reed, he had to use his cell phone for, for StreamYard because his computer broke. So he was oh. always looking, he was always glitching in and out. And he, he um, Eric problems. was there. He had some problems with his um his debate with Kent Hovind, didn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. M my, I mean, you know, that whole debate like got uh, like like I guess pretty much delayed, I guess you could put it, or put off or whatever. Like for half an hour more at least around there, because of all the tech heck you know, problems and uh Oh and Joseph Grants, um from my understanding, and it's been a while since I looked at the paper on this, uh, that the proteins that were found in the T-Rex femur were collagens, and they were sequenced. Now, one thing is protein sequences aren't as useful as DNA sequences because uh, multiple codons will code for the same amino acid, and so you cannot get a one-to-one 
DNA sequence from a protein sequence, even though you can always get the protein sequence from the DNA sequence, sort of a one-way th thing. But uh, they were compared to uh, the proteins of living diapsids, and they were closest to birds and next closest to crocodilians, which is what would have been expected according to the birds or dinosaurs uh, taxonomy. Yeah, and also, um, and um, I mean, with Schweitzer's original d d discovery, um, they actually found, and like that, the collagen in it is identical t t to ostrich collagen too. I hadn't heard that it was identical, although it wouldn't. Oh, oh well, me. um, maybe not a hundred percent, or or at least like ninety-eight or ninety percent. You know, pretty close to it. Yeah, and also, um. Mary Schweitzer, as far as I know, still has not made the claim that the the round red structures are definitely uh, red blood cells, but they are morphologically consistent with uh, archosaur blood cells from living archosaurs. Yeah, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. From my understanding, uh, uh, she actually found like preserved heba globin and not blood cells. Well, she found heme groups which mm -hmm. is one of the constituents of hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So um, heme, glu heme groups are a part of the oxygen transport chemistry, and they're not quite the entirety of hemoglobin, but hemoglobin is composed of heme groups. Mm -hmm. um, a heme group, a he hemoglobin itself is not the sturdiest of molecules, but mm -hmm. the heme groups that can help make it up are more robust. So it's not too surprising that uh, hemoglobin itself wasn't actually found. Right, and uh, when I was on the, the phone with her a um, little bit over a year ago, uh, she also even brought up and like that um, there actually were some people like who um, who assumed, and I can uh, and I can understand why, um, thinking like that. Oh, she found you know this from a T Rex, um, and so then that might mean. It's a possibility. Then you know he could pull a Jurassic Park and, and bring back a T Rex, but unfortunately, you know, yeah. just there just there just wasn't anything to work off of. You know, man, that the discovery for that. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, Cody, what was the name of the article about a Cretaceous rabbit? Do you remember that? It wasn't. It, actually, it wasn't. It was a video. Um, by Creation Magazine Live, and they were going over all the animals that supposedly were mistakenly dated to be, you know, millions of years old, like a rabbit. I could just send you the video if you'd like, like a link to the video. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Or uh, you can yeah, send it. I just, I was just actually gonna email it to you today, but oh, okay, well, that would be cool. Because <laughs> um, actually, who was it? I was, I don't remember who it was, but it was so, it was a viewer sent me a comment about um said something like oh there were there was a rodent found in supposedly cretaceous soil and i said well yeah that's you know gliers diverged from our contents about in the sort of the middle period of the cretaceous even though the cretaceous is only divided into late early and late which i hate but um and then you know rodents diverged from gliers at, towards the end of the cretaceous so that's that's pretty much when I would expect you to start seeing rodents in the fossil record based on both the fossils as well as molecular studies. So uh, I don't know. I think one of the things is that um, I think people don't understand the timeline that is proposed by evolutionary biology for uh, mammal evolution. Like, I feel like a lot of people have this idea that according to the theory of evolution, mammals started 66 million years ago. The dinosaurs died and then mammals appear, but that's not true. In fact, uh, a lot of the very early divergence of mammals happened towards the later part of the Mesozoic, like um, the split between uh, Lorisotherians and the rest of mammals, which includes like the Afrotheres and stuff, that happened in the Jurassic. And then, um, you know, bats were around during the end Cretaceous. So at one so, point, there were three lines of flying uh, tetrapods flying around the air. So, so I, I, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you've been, have you been watching the Aaron Ra's video, this 
the wine thing. The, 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 uh, the systematic classification of life. Yeah, the twenty videos yeah, of he's, mammals. I think he's on something like twenty three, and he's only now getting up to hominini. And I think his first video included something like six clades. So if he'd taken a video per clade, it would have he'd still be somewhere around like theriaforms or something. So yeah, it's. It's certainly an interesting uh, video series, and I also appreciate the giving the anatomical traits associated with, with each clade that he's going through is nice. Yeah. yeah, I did not realize until I watched that the, the scientists that there were so many lines between just like the the amio split and mammals themselves. That like the, 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 the I knew about cytodonts and stuff like that, but how many different little. Individual oh, yeah. things there were, or, or between uh, what else was there? Yeah, a lot of different things. I had no idea how how vast it was. And well, actually, that that uh, phylogenetics and cladistics thing is actually it's something that I'm always curious what the creationist take is on it. So actually, um, so Cody, would you you would say that there are like perhaps all of the equines or the canids would be related to each other, and maybe that. Like Explain to me no, what those are, and I'll give you an oh, answer. <laughs> the, the equids, uh, equidae is the family that includes uh, horses, zebras, donkeys, as well yeah, as. they're all related. Species. Okay. And like maybe all they're the, the canids, same, which would be like all the same horses. sort. Yeah. And then maybe all the canids, like uh, foxes and uh, dogs and jackals. and. Yep, they're all related because they're also the same sort. Okay. But where, where do you cut that off? Are horses and rhinos related to each other? No, can they mate and produce offspring? Well, not all dogs can do that either, or all canids can do that. No, but my point is, can a can a rhino mate with a horse and produce offspring? Well, no, but you. So does that mean that foxes and uh, the African painted dog aren't the same sort? Because they can't either. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure. Neither can I never... a and a chihuahua. Yeah, well, also, they're and genetically and compatible. I, I, I mean, yeah. they're not going to do it, but what I'm saying is genetically, can if they can genetically do it, they're the same. Well, okay, it's it's more about baromenology, and that's a whole like whole study within itself. And so it basically comes down to how did the ancients classify animals? And some of it was very similar to how we do it today. Of course, they didn't believe in evolution and all these ideas, so it's there's a lot of differences, obviously, but... From, um, and from what baromenology shows is that basically they would classify animals how, kind of how we have canine, feline, you know what I mean? Just the basic family classifications. So what about groups where within a family? So I guess my, my question then is there are most families of animals include genetically incompatible species. Well, yeah, of course that's going to happen. So it They're so distant in species. I'm not saying that you defined a sort specifically by it. can they mate and produce offspring. I think that's just one of the main factors, though. Oh, Lamont where? left. Lamont, if that's... he leaves, does our stream end? No, oh, I, was, I, was, He's back. I was just going to get a, a drink. I was going to be off. I was going to oh, okay. drink of water. I don't want to be off. No, no. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We, we were a little worried there. <laughs> so, yep. yeah, I was like, are you all right? <laughs> so then I guess the question then would be, okay, well, if that means that your reason for why rhinoceros and the rhinoceros and the horse aren't in the same kind, it's very, it anymore. It's very, very self-evident that a, a rhino and a horse are nowhere near the same family of animal. I would agree that they're very distant if you only look at modern forms, but there are fossil horses and fossil rhinoceros that look almost identical, except for details of the dentition that I can barely even notice. And the only other big difference that I can see in the fossil forms of rhinoceros and horses are the horses tend to have longer nasal bones. So okay. what about those animals? where it's, there are places where it takes an expert. And that, I mean, someone who spends- Oh, I know, that's, the, that's what the study, that's, that's, I know, that's what the study of trying to figure out how to classify animals 
because sometimes it's really, really difficult. Like, how do you classify a platypus? <laughs> Good luck. You know, I mean, obviously oh, they uh, do, but it's it's sure not easy. It's a it's a monitor. I know it has been. What I'm saying it's it's difficult because what is this animal? You know, but I'm saying there's the whole study of classifying animals. I'm not saying that it's super easy to tell. What I'm saying is that um all the species of canine and dogs all in the world came from two two ancestors. Right. But the and reason that I'm saying this, it seems like the reason you're saying that is because they tend to be very similar animals. So, well, so the but, reason I'm saying that is based on Genesis. So, Cody, do you think that horses, rhino, you, they, yeah, I'm on, do, you think, do, you think, do you think horses, rhinos, and humans, and all of them are, are, are all animals or, or mammals themselves? They're all animals. Well, humans, I wouldn't say are directly animals. I mean, mm -hmm. technically, but not biblically we're very what different mean, what does that mean technically technically if you were just to get someone to just look at like someone that's completely ignorant with everything they would probably say that humans were just an advanced animal but biblically humans are not animals they have dominion over animals but they have a spirit which no animal actually has plants have plants are just biological machines they don't have a soul Animals have a soul, but they don't have a spirit. People have a soul and a spirit, and they are made in the image of God. So they're very different from animals. But scientifically, just trying to classify, well, I guess you would say, even Christians, I would say, humans are kind of animals, you know. I, I think you might have gotten the soul and spirit swapped there. No, no. Animals, um, animals do not have a spirit because they don't go anywhere when they die. A spirit is what, where you go. Is what is you that goes to the afterlife? According I to was, I thought that was the soul that went to the afterlife. No, no, no. A lot of people don't understand the difference between a soul and a spirit, and they're not the same thing either. A soul is like personality, like you, like kind of like what you think of someone when you're thinking about them. Like it's really the soul, but the spirit is you. Like what happens to you when you die? Like where you go your spirit goes to heaven and everyone mixes up they think it's soul it's not the way it is you know what i mean well the reason that i say that is because the word spirit is usually uh used to trends actually it even in latin and it's it's ultimate derivation including where it's used to translate is usually things with to do with the breath of life which is a term that the bible uses and the word spirit itself comes from the same root as respiration and aspiration. I mean, the New Testament makes it clear there's a difference between soul and spirit. So I agree. I just yeah. feel like we might be mixing those two up. But then again, I'm not really an expert on that matter either. And I don't yeah. really care which one is which. Is uh, Sorry to borrow, Jim, but uh, Joseph Grant left a comment saying that this, this uh, discussion is going way off track and he said goodnight. And I kind of think that 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 implies that he left. Oh well. So I uh, I didn't realize there was a specific topic. Yeah, I didn't either. I thought it was we were going to hang out after the debate and chat about yeah. stuff. So, uh, uh, but I yeah, mean, if it's not uh, interesting then, to you, then thinking that he said that probably because he was expecting we were going to be talking about the debate itself. I mean, the debate. I thought I this kind of was. To to some extent, the debate can kind of stand on its own, and I. I feel like, you know, this is a chance to talk about things that in a less formal setting that have to do with the topics around the debate. And I think this is, this is still that, but yeah. um, so, I also, Cody, there was so. something, there was something you said, and it was the reason that you said that these things were related was Genesis. But the thing is, no one's going to be able to read Genesis and then go out into the world. And on the basis of no other evidence than looking around and holding Genesis in front of them, determine whether the African painted dog and the maned wolf and the gray wolf... I didn't wolf say we determined. I didn't say we classify animals based on Genesis. I said that because of Genesis, I know that all of... there's All canines are from two dogs. That's my point. But baromenology and how the ancient way that they would classify animals, or modern, is its own thing. I'm not saying we use Genesis to classify animals. I'm saying... I believe that animals are don't come from are not all related. 
because of Genesis. Right. And what my question is, as I'm trying to understand what it is that is the reason that you would say, okay, canids are their own kind of, of animal, but borophagines, which differ from canids basically only in a few minor ways having to do with the jaw and ear, aren't. And why horses would be a kind and rhinos would be a different kind, even though some examples of these animals are so close to each other that it takes decades of study to figure out which one is which. And so yep. I don't understand what the reasoning is behind where you pick that line. And that's what I'm trying to get at, because if you just take modern animals, you can kind of just lump them into a few categories. But if we take into account all of the animals that we have evidence of, it becomes a little bit tougher. And it's not easy to see why, why is it that rhinos are one group and horses are another, even though there are horses and rhinos that are almost identical to each other and look more like each other. What are you talking about? Are you unaware of the fossil record for equids and rhinoceros today? Well, if are you talking about like, like a theory of what they would look like if they were related, or oh, like we've taking the bones, found? taking the bones and figuring out? Okay, I have a, a dentary bone. I know it's the dentary bone of a parasodactyl, but I don't know if it's the dentary bone of a rhino or a horse. They're both the same size. They both have molars used for grinding plants. And the only way I can distinguish them, and this is a real world problem that happens in actual paleontology, is that you have to go in and do things like <clears throat> carefully measure the molar cusps and count up the cusps very carefully and sort through them. Because at, in the smaller, and I know you would dispute the dating, but according to the mainstream dating methods, earliest horses and rhinos, are, their fossils are essentially identical. The only differences are in the teeth and the nasal bone. They're both three hoofed ungulates that ha carry the majority of the weight on the middle hoof, which is, I think it's digit three, but I would have to double check. They both are about the size of a large house cat or a small dog. Well, a little bigger than that, but still. I mean, they both have the same everything the only distinguishing feature is slight differences in the shape of the molars. And so I don't know why it is that we can say, oh, this group clearly couldn't be the same group because they're so different now. I didn't say they could cl clearly, I, again, I never said it was obvious. This is why we have to do a deep study about it. They've been doing this for thousands of years okay. and they do it very differently. The way they did it then was very differently than it is today. I mean, right. did you ever think maybe that what you're describing in the fossils, if it exists, I'm not even sure. I'm not saying you're lying. I'm saying I think what you're saying is actually just theories of what could exist based on evolution. But what I'm saying is that that maybe what you're describing in these fossils is actually a whole other kind within itself, and they're just not under. They don't understand it because it's extinct. And maybe it was alive um, only thousands of years ago, but it went extinct and it died in a flood and it was deposited into fossils. So it's a kind that didn't make it on the ark? What's No, a kind that could have made it on the ark. I'm saying it probably could be a different species or something we just don't understand. It doesn't necessarily mean therefore it's it's <laughs> therefore it's the ancestor of a horse and a rhino. I think that's a I'm not even making the claim conclusion. I'm not even making the claim that it's the ancestor of the horse or the rhino. I'm just saying but that your whole thing is that well we see that in the fossils that rhinos and horses are so similar we can barely tell the difference. Therefore, how do you know what a kind is? What I'm saying is how do you know that that's the ancestor of those two animals to begin with? I'm not making you're, the claim that it is. You literally made the claim that because I can't you're saying that I can't how can you know um, what a kind is if we don't if if we see in the fossil record that apparently these animals are so similar there's no way to tell what a kind is well my my point is if we're going to say that similar animals because we've already said that just breeding isn't enough because we yeah, it's not enough right so it, I can accept if they can breed, then they would have to be the same kind. Okay. Yep. But we also have examples where most people who are creationists say, well, these animals that can't breed are still in the same kind anyway. 
So that means that breeding yeah. can't be our determiner. It's yeah, it's not the determiner, but it's a big indicator. It really helps. Right, it does. But for in Cody, cases where there's no breeding, you have to go with some kind of similarity. Yeah. So, so Cody, what's your opinion on this? On like similarity again about the the similarity of the DNA, how close some, some things are to each other. Well, that's pretty obvious. See, DNA. What DNA shows is that um, it shows when you see similarities in DNA. For some reason, people make the assumption, well, then they're related. But no, the reason that there's similarities is because there would have to be similarities. That's how code works. And of course, code shows intelligent designer, in my opinion, but that's another topic. But um, so when you have similarities, for example, a chimpanzee and a, or ape and a human, well, of course, based on how they're built, they're going to have to have similar code or similar DNA. It would have to be that way. But it doesn't mean that they must be related. Therefore, it's not really it's because same designer designed like here's a really cliche generic um overused yeah. um example but powerpoint has code microsoft word has code they're coded by in general the same people and they have very very similar code but it does not mean that therefore they're related to each other they came from the same designers so cody i have a question do you have you ever heard of the protein preston yeah I, I'm not super, super educated on that stuff, but I've heard of this. So Preston is a protein that's used to facilitate echolocation in both bats and cetaceans. Well, microcoroptera, since megacoroptera has no... So I think you're going to say because they both have that, they must be related. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay, okay. So cool. if you do, a, you know, uh, you know what a protein sequence is. It's basically just a protein is mm -hmm. essentially a line of amino acids. And if you write mm -hmm. them all down, that's the protein sequence, right? Yep. So if you do a protein sequence for Preston in both bats and cetaceans, it comes out to be essentially identical. Okay. Actually, no, it's 100% identical if I remember correctly. But if you look at the neutral variation in the DNA, because as a result of the fact that each codon can, or sorry, each amino acid is uh, coded for by multiple codons. And as a general rule of thumb, the middle uh, base pair in a codon doesn't actually affect which amino acid is used. It's essentially a spacer. So if you look at that neutral variation where it can't actually affect the proteins or the, yeah, the protein sequence, there is essentially no similarity between the gene for Preston in uh, chiropterans and the gene in Preston in cetaceans. So why is it that in places where we can say, okay, well, they need this protein to be functional to survive, and that's a good reason why they're they have this genetic similarity, okay. But why is there this big lack of genetic similarity in the neutral variation? But on the other hand, there isn't that similar lack of variability in the neutral um, parts of the genetic code when you say just restrict it to, if you look at only chiropterans. If you look at all the chiropterans, they all have very similar neutral variation in that gene. And if you look at all the cetaceans, they also have very similar neutral variation for that gene. But when you look across, there's essentially no similarity. How does this, how is this a problem for me though? Well, because I would expect if there's two options, if God is simply copy pasting genetic code because similar designs, similar code, similar design or similar code, then I would expect all animals to either have for the same gene, either similar or non-similar neutral variation across the board without any particular statistical groupings within smaller groups. Okay. And? So, <laughs> and that's not what happens. The statistical distribution of neutral variation strongly contradicts the possibility of separate descent for neutral variation in genes. Because it's true. If you're looking at functional genes that are coding for proteins that various organisms need, there's a strong conservation bias to keep those things the same. It's why you can look at um, genes that are universal in vertebrates. And almost every vertebrate has a nearly identical copy of this gene because it's vital for, for uh, life to continue. Mutations that are functional mutations to, this, to these genes are very detrimental. So they, they don't persist. I, I have a question for you then. Okay. So how does, how does code evolve over time? Because code needs intelligence. Pretty simple, but I'd expect an answer. 
Well, so DNA is only a code by analogy. DNA is in fact a molecule. And it's a molecule that we know <laughs> when it reproduces can change. And the fact is unlike computer codes or most ciphers or things, there is a large number of mutations which will still result in something that can be sequenced during protein sequencing. You can change a gene very significantly and still leave it as something that can be sequenced. So the genetic quote unquote cob or code can't even talk code is really not very analogous to computer codes or human language codes. And so it can develop over time simply because we've observed it doing so. It's, it's not a hypothetical thing. This is a thing that occurs. De novo gene production. So the code, I'm not saying that we can't observe it changing, but so we, so you think that we have, well, I know, I, you never said this, but do you think that code or DNA started from very, very, very incredibly simple to what it is now all on, on, all on its own by, by chance over millions of years? Well, no, I think the most likely explanation is that uh, RNA, which can spontaneously self-assemble, that's a thing that has so also you do been think it so, it so it all came together by chance over millions millions of years. Um, um, evolution does um, evolution does not uh, say at all whether or not if it was by chance. It does not say that at all. I would. That's true. And also, all known all current hypotheses for abiogenesis do not involve it being a chance process. The and, universe, I'm sorry. Yeah, so DNA in general, though, it is chance because if you don't believe anyone put it there, why is it there? And to have it be the way it is, it's only chance. Not not having been put someplace by a person is not the same as chance. No, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is that just the fact that there is DNA the way it is now, without any sort of design, and to have it build up to be bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more complex over time. There is obviously the possibility that, well, it's not going to happen, but I'm just saying that right. it is indeed chance. <laughs> when, when predicting something like that in the future, it's certainly uh, statistical estimates of likelihood are useful. But the fact is that as something is happening in the physical world, if it's basically at the scale of molecules or bigger, it's not a chance phenomenon. It is governed by very non-chance laws of physics and chemistry but see so you guys here all of you think that that code can essentially create itself well with no like initial said, cause dna is not itself actually i know it's not an code. actual code but it is indeed code well in it general. currently codes for things but when and dna I will try to finish the thing that I had started earlier, which is to say that RNA can self-assemble and RNA can both catalyze its own reproduction as well as catalyze the formation of DNA. And so the most likely scenario currently is that RNA self-assembled and then because it can catalyze its own reproduction and it can also catalyze protein synthesis on its own, it's very inefficient at it compared to say a ribosome, but there's a reason that the center of every ribosome is a small piece of RNA. So because, from, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Take over. And from my understanding of RNA from the research I have done, um, uh, um, it's, um, it's the um, RNA world hypothesis. Um, they're not sure 100% for sure if it is RNA, but, but at the same time, though, uh, scientists are just saying like that it is the most likely candidate. For it, it's from my understanding, it's because that they find a lot of like RNA cells in every single living uh, creature, and so and then that's why that they say that is the most likely candidate. And uh, with me uh, being a uh, a, a theist and uh, and uh, and whatnot, I don't have a problem with learning about RNA or, or any of that. It's because of the fact that you know. Just with me as a theist, it's uh, just that, you know, I just don't see any problem like with the fact and like that, you know, and like that God could have been the one to start all that, you know, kind of like what I said during the debate, you know, um, you know, um, God can, uh, you know, God can create the universe any way that he wants to. And, and I also understand and like that Cody's not going to agree and th that's fine, too. Yeah, think about. I was think of RNA and DNA as the. I was studying it. You know, it's like there's only one letter differences. Like three of the letters in both DNA and RNA are the same. There's only one 
different letter, what letter it is, but only one, like one, there's only one well, letter that's different. In terms of the base pairs for RNA and DNA, that's true. But the um, the the so-called uh, sides of the ladders, as opposed to the rung, if we're going to use the ladder analogy, uh, have a different chemical basis. Um, RNA is less stable than DNA, and um, it's it's generally the, the biggest difference is that it's less robust. But it also, unlike DNA, can catalyze its own uh, replication as well as catalyze protein synthesis which is why the RNA world hypothesis seems to be a pretty good hypothesis. Also, uh, RNA can catalyze the formation of DNA, which is based on the code already there in the RNA. So because RNA molecules can self-assemble, and which case, at which point they would have an essentially random set of base pairs, they can then, using those base pairs, catalyze protein synthesis. And if some of the RNA happens to uh, synthesize proteins, that help the RNA do better at making more RNA, then you have the start of an evolutionary process. And then eventually, if you have a system where RNA can be real reasonably enclosed in some sort of stable environment that can maintain itself outside of thermodynamic equilibrium for the short term at least, then you can do things like get DNA synthesis inside that system, which will then allow for uh, the DNA to take over the function of storing genetic uh, material for later reproduction. And then the RNA simply becomes what it is now, essentially a messenger and a DNA duplication enhancer. And so, yeah, that's, that's sort of the basis of the RNA world hypothesis sort of taken down to a very simple level. So the answer is the quote unquote code would actually have pre-existed DNA because it would have been in RNA, which only later then would have synthesized DNA based on the pre-existing base pairs in the RNA. And RNA base pairs do come into existence spontaneously without the need for any um, living organisms to create them. Oh, so, was that to me? Well, that was just in general, the idea behind how it is the genetic material. And I'll use the word code because even though it's not super accurate, it's it's way easier than saying a full long explanation. And that is how the genetic code can start out initially. And after it does, then different differential ability to reproduce or to survive to reproduce will allow beneficial changes to accumulate. And of course, since these systems would have had fairly low resistance to lateral gene, gene transfer, since, I mean, they wouldn't have had time to develop such things, um, things that are beneficial can spread quickly throughout any given population of organisms, even that are distantly related. Because initially, it seems like life probably had a very low resistance to lateral gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer, as it's also called. Is that, is that that's when pro, prokaryotes transfer genes? Well, it doesn't right? just happen with prokaryotes. Um, actually, uh, so a significant part of your genome as a human is actually uh, has its origins in retroviruses. Oh yeah. So in fact, actually, um, it's been reasonably well established that um, the genes encoding for uh, uh, metatherian or not metatherian, but um, placental, uh, the placenta in placental mammals, yeah, actually, a lot of those genes actually originated as part of a retroviral insertion into the genome. I, I heard about that. Yeah. So it's. It's not just to do with prokaryotes, although that's the place where it happens the most frequently is in prokaryotes. But yeah, um, there's also, um, there's a butterfly species that has taken bits of the DNA of a fungal parasite, actually a parasitoid fungus that infects the caterpillars and have been able to use that to help uh, increase their resistance to that fungal parasite. So lateral gene transfer does happen. It's not very common and it gets less common as you get um, multicellular life, but it's still a thing that happens. Or it's also possible that when creating a butterfly, the creator copy pasted fungus DNA into one species of butterfly, but not others. Yep. That's also possible. I mean, that's how and that's when then natural selection takes its course. 
So then what can survive survives, but whatever didn't have it pre-existing in it will not survive. Right. But then we also have mechanisms for horizontal gene, gene transfer. So it's one of those things where it's like, at a certain point, the, the natural world looks so much like one that evolved that if we're going to seriously entertain the idea that it didn't, we have to invoke a deity who is essentially tricking people. Not necessarily. Uh, yeah, it really is, though, because... Well, how do you know everything evolved? I, well, it depends on what you mean by no. Oh, sorry, Eric, no. you're, you're quiet. Uh, oh, oh, it's I, all uh, good. It was, uh, you, you know, it was uh, just that you all look like we're uh, talking, and I didn't want to... Oh, no, I, I just meant you were audibly quiet when you said something. Polite. Uh, I do have a question for Cody O. So, a two-part question, actually. So... So you believe in a literal 6,000 old Earth? Yeah, just about Don't that. Be so, evolution aside and stuff, how, how do you explain the, like, like Native Americans crossed, they, they, histor historically, they say Native Americans crossed the land bridge 10,000 years ago, or, or and like there's settlements of North America way back then. So how do you well, explain I guess that? My question would be to you, how do you know that? Archaeology? Yeah, but how do you know maybe it wasn't actually as long ago as people think? I question you. I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not an archaeologist. Okay, well, that's a cop out. <laughs> so I think that, yes, the world is about six to seven thousand years old. To answer your question. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I would say is that there are, in fact, numerous archaeological dating methods which tend to do a pretty good job of cross-confirming each other. So there are things like... Um, it's all based on assumptions. That's, that's yeah. called historical science. That's not observational science. There is no one outside of creationist pseudoscience groups that makes that distinction. Yes, I know, because they don't like that. <laughs> no, because there isn't a distinction. There is. There are really things you can well. observe, and there are things you cannot observe. Yes. You have to assume. And I, and I can observe They're things. assuming the date no. of... Yes, they, they are. They that. are absolutely, because they don't know if their dating methods are accurate. Yes, they do. Yes, they do how, because okay, they Eric. Do okay, Eric. Eric, how do they know that these Native Americans were really there that long ago? Well, like I said during the debate, there are there are multiple different dating methods. You just have to yep. use the, you, you you just have to use the correct one, like for like a certain layer and whatnot. And so, man, so say for an example, I'm going to say I weigh. For an example, I, I say I'm going to say that I weigh 200 pounds. Well, and then after that, I had experiment weigh myself and all these different machines. And, and if I get the same result, like which intertwine with each other, they all say um, that I'm 200 pounds. I then can be confident in that. Yep, that's observable oh. science. Ten thousand years ago is not observable. That's historical. Uh, yes, it is. Um, you cannot observe ten thousand years ago. Like I said in the debate, get a laser beam and point it to the moon last Tuesday. You can't because last Tuesday was last Tuesday. It's the past. We can only observe what we see now. And I know they say, oh, well, starlight, we're seeing into the past. Well, we're still seeing only one time period. It's not like we get to see like T1. There's T1, T2. We're only seeing T1 in that case. But for most cases, what we're observing is T2. So still, you cannot look into the past. I know they don't like this. You're only making assumptions. And even if your assumptions are correct, you don't know if your assumptions are correct. They're only assumptions. There's a huge difference between what we observe and what we think is right. It's only based on theories. So you're right. There are only assumptions. And one of the biggest yes, assumptions, there are assumptions is that the, is simply the assumption of science, that the laws of physics are not going to vary greatly across time. That is the yeah. only big assumption. And in fact, it's no longer just an assumption because now we can observe various periods of time uh, astrological. How, 
No, you're only seeing one time. No, we're you're seeing not many seeing, times. Because you're not seeing the present it, because you're looking into the past. But then again, you're not seeing what the past has done now in the future or in the present. Do you see how if there's no way out of it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try this again. Because astronomy looks at things of very different distances, each of which would have required the light to travel a different amount of time, by looking in different places, we can see structures in the universe from different times. And in every case, all of the observable laws of physics that we can get from that are temporally consistent. There is yes, no I agree. time change there. That is the one assumption of science that we can't actually really provide much evidence for. But in fact, we actually now do have a whole bunch of evidence for it, even though it's still a fairly big assumption. But the thing is, if that assumption weren't true, science just wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to develop technology. We wouldn't be able to if develop medicine. assumption wasn't true. The assumption that the rules of physics are essentially consistent. I, I never said they weren't. <laughs> but that is what is required by creationism. No, it's, creationism it's not. It requires the laws of physics to have been broken repeatedly. In what place? Well, just the flood, for example. The flood? Yeah. How, how does that go against the laws of physics? Um, I mean, it goes against the laws of hydrology, geology. There no, isn't it, actually enough water existing on Earth. Yeah, paleontology. Um, it goes okay, against. But the give laws me no, no. That's, that's, that's way, way too broad. You're saying, oh, that's like saying, oh, it just goes against science. Tell me, it how does. does it specifically? No, there. Okay, no. It, there has been enough means time you, in the past four thousand years for the genetic diversity of all the various quote kinds that we there still can't absolutely define has been. Better. There's been enough in two hundred years for just for enough what we see in the canines. They're absolutely no. Yes, there absolutely has, and we're not. We're talking for about the four thousand. Yes, four thousand years. Now. There's absolutely enough time. No, not there's enough time to get that amount of morphological diversity from organisms starting with a pair. But there isn't enough time to get the genetic diversity that's going with it because most of the genetic diversity that exists in life doesn't show up as gross morphological features. Yeah. If you look at two animals that are almost identical, so if you look at any two gray wolves from the world, they're almost certainly much more genetically distinct than you are from any other human because humans have an unusually low amount of genetic diversity as a species. But we still have so much genetic diversity that current mutation rates couldn't possibly account for that much genetic diversity from essentially six reproducing pairs, half of which yeah, were talking were about siblings. four thousand years. As it is plenty of time for the speciation, is absolutely enough time. There, it's not any scientist will say, "Oh yeah, it is enough time." It's it, enough time if, for that number of species to occur. It is not enough time to accumulate the current number of alleles in all of the populations that we have extant. How do you know? Because and don't just current don't. mutation rates are well studied in numerous lines of organisms and they do not lead you back because for if we assume unclean animals, so we're only taking a pair, a male and a female, and we assume absolute complete heterozygosity for every allele, we're still only starting with four alleles per gene per group of organisms that are a so-called kind, if you go with observable rates of mutation, they would have had to have been exponentially larger to get the current amount of genetic diversity in 4,000 years. It simply doesn't follow the laws of science because it requires that genetics have worked very differently in the past. But oh, once we can look at it, once we can see it, now it doesn't work that way anymore. That is fundamentally pseudoscientific and anti-science. That is why the believing in a literal global flood 4,000 years ago is contrary to science. And that is not the only case where it's like that. It's like that across the board. Every single thing that we could look at and we would say, if there were a global flood, I would expect X. Instead, we find not X. Okay. So what would we expect to find from a global flood at any time period as long as there is life? We'd find a, we'd find we'd find hundreds of sedimentary layers with fossils deposited into the layers. Yes. What do we find in the world? Layers, what, so what we find in the world? What do we find? We, we find, find all these all these sedimentary layers without erosion marks. And what do we find in them? We find well, we find these dead fossilized creatures all deposited into it. It kind of seems more like a flood. Even even a lot of scientists are well aware of this, so they say, well, it was just a bunch of local floods. I'm not talking about Christians. I mean. People that just 
they they're trying to figure it out on their own. You know they how think they a bunch of local a floods. Flood as such, what do you know? A, how does a geologist look at a place and say this is this this layer in the rock is the result of a flood? Because they see they see differences in layers that it's it's sedimentary particles yes, sorted. Specifically, why do they say this is a flood layer? Because it's. It's obvious. It was obviously formed by water. <laughs> well, that's a large number of sediments. But the uh, reason that geologists say that this particular layer is from a flood is because floods leave behind graded bedding. That's the only kind of strata that floods have ever been observed laying down. They don't lay down evaporites. They don't lay down aeolian sandstone. They don't lay down schist. They don't lay down shale. They don't lay down siltstone. They don't lay down limestone. They don't lie down, lay down, yeah, lay down, any of these things. They only have ever been observed laying down graded bedding. And when we find graded bedding in the geological column, it's consistent with graded bedding formed by floods now. So if there had been a global flood, the obvious expectation and requirement according to geography or geology is that there be a relatively consistent worldwide layer of graded bedding or several layers which represent a flood of global proportions. There is no such layer, and many of the layers that are fossil bearing could not have formed in a flood or even underwater. Do you know what an evaporite is? It's things like salt mines. Salt doesn't mm -hmm. just precipitate into thick layers underneath water. It's called an evaporite because it forms as water evaporates, leaving the non-volatile components of the solution behind. Okay, so what would be your... Th of these fossil bearing strata that are supposedly evidence for the flood. Okay, so what would, what would be your, another one of your theories for, um, for the lack of erosion marks? There, first, there are erosion marks. It's simply not true that there are none. Second, the okay. fact that... Un and I'd like to see that. Well, that's one of the problems. What does it look like to have an erosion mark? If you're looking at it from a cutaway of stone, which is what most people can see when they go to see strata in places like the Grand Canyon or similar places. Not that. That's like outside the layers. I mean, like within the layers, you see erosion, like intersect. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about like yeah. just land erosion. I mean, like within the strata layers, yeah, you can see have, that. We have ancient stream beds. That is erosion. No, no, no. I want to see where, where there are a bunch of layers that have individual er erosion marks within the layers itself, proving that they're time periods and not formed by water. I mean, look at any Aeolian sandstone deposit. They all have ridge marks that are the result of wind erosion eroding away. Do you know? Layers of it. Okay. okay, never that's mind. That's one, of the, that's one of the actual ways that you can tell that a sandstone happens to be aeolian sandstone is because it has characteristic cross threading as a result of wind erosion but again it's, it's all you i'm not, never mind i shouldn't say it but like again all these things you these are all still you're missing the my, the bigger picture is it's all based on assumptions and assuming no it's not it is absolutely all, every kind of rock that has been laid down with the exception of very few igneous rocks from the very lowest layers can be observed forming right now. It is not an assumption to say that the process that formed, and in many cases, we understand the physics but of how these rocks are formed. No one ever, well. ever, no one ever saw these rocks forming. Yeah, and no one ever saw that car in the that is now in the ditch with the tire marks on the road actually drive into the ditch because now the driver is dead. But you know what? I still think it's a reasonable assumption based on how the laws of physics work and how cars crash that that car skidded off the road and crashed into the ditch. But all of your arguments are based on the uniformitarianism assumption. It's not again. What it's is all the assumption. uniformitarian assumption. Assuming that it's always it's always happened um, without any sort of What's uh, it? catastrophe. Well, like well, rocks first, forming, no. they're slowly, gradually forming over millions okay. or hundreds of thousands of years. That is not what uniformitarian geology says. Uniformitarian ge it geology... It absolutely is. is. No, you it's just not. don't like that. <laughs> what it says is that... I would like to talk to Eric. I feel like you've been taking up most of... Um, like, you've been talking for, like, most of the time. I'd like to hear more from the other two people here. All right. And so what I was wanting to say earlier, but, you know, but uh, you and Dapper got a little bit uh, busy, which is fine, you know, 
both, both of you are allowed, you know, to have your time to talk. And so the bottom line job of a scientist is to observe the physical world. And most, um, most scientists do not think about God. And I mean, true. There are some yeah. scientists who are atheists who are trying to de, like, who are trying to de destroy God. But yet it's also not like that the whole entire science community is trying to do that and so um one of the key character um, so one of the most important aspects of science is that it needs to be repeatable if it's not repeatable if it doesn't have any be if it doesn't have any be uh, if it doesn't have any mm -hmm. uh repeatable uh capabilities well then it's not science. You know, it kind of goes back to what I said about, You're you know, the only evolutionist that's ever admitted this. I really thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah. you know, it's one of the things that I do what I do. I mean, th th there are some a atheist scientists and I I'm not saying that every single one of them are like this, but you know, yeah. but there are some and like who say that, Oh, Oh, uh, Oh, evolution uh, disproves God, but it, it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that all. I mean, none of the data says that. Yeah. Man, if it, man, if it makes you feel any better, I know that I may not convince you. But you, you also could even look into uh, something called process structuralism, which is mm -hmm. which actually like was advocated by Simon Conway Morris, who you know, who is a Christian. Uh, he even debated with Richard Dawkins, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, kind of like what I said during my debate on Saturday. You know, scientists, the whole scientific community as a whole, their whole job is not to take you away from God. The bottom line is. Uh, the job of a scientist is to observe the physical world. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I agree. I, I'm I'm just glad you actually you're one of the few evolutionists that will ever admit like what when something is actually scientific because that's be repeatable, demonstrable, observable. You know what I mean. And so, thank you. But um, yeah, for sure. And. And, you know, after all that testing, after all that repeatable testing, sorry, okay. and, after, and after all that, none of that, and I repeat, none of that has ever shown like that there is no God. Yeah, none absolutely. It. None. Absolutely. And anybody who says that and anybody who says otherwise... Um, you know, as respectful as I could be, you know, people are entitled to their opinions, but, yeah. but having an opinion is different than a yeah. fact. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought there were two different. I always thought there were two different subjects myself: belief in God and belief in. I would say, I would say belief, but you know, create like no versus, no, cre creation versus evolution debate and belief in God are two different things, in my mm -hmm. opinion. One has, to do that. one has nothing to do with the other one. And, um, and you know, I always wanted to emphasize on this. Uh, a year ago, when I went on this big, um, I mean, of course, Lamont and Dapper know about this. It was because, you know, of the podcast that I've done with both of you. Um, a year ago, I was, I had like the biggest question of my life was the Bible say about dinosaurs? It's because when I was a kid, I was really into, you know, Jurassic Park. I had all the toys and everything. So who can say that that was the planting of the seed for me, you know, for me wanting to be interested in science and all that. And uh, when I became a Christian in 2014, because of, I don't want to get too personal, but because of a very dark event like that uh, haunts me to this very day. Um, I guess you could say that that just led me to the inevitable question, what was the Bible say about dinosaurs? And so, honestly, throughout the whole entire investigation, I honestly wanted it, I I honestly wanted, you know, it, I, I wanted it to honestly lead me um, to the conclusion. I, I thought that I should decide 
for myself. Um, and honestly, and, uh, and my thought, I should decide truth for myself. And, you know, mm -hmm. people can d decide it for th themselves. Like say that there are disagreements about uh, baptism in some religions. There are some where they say, um, like, like they shouldn't be baptized as a baby while others don't, you know, and th th that's fine. You know, they can decide that for themselves. And, um, I mean, honestly, during the whole time, it wasn't like that I was, it wasn't like that I was like trying to prove evolution is right or wrong. I just honestly just wanted to look into it myself and see for myself, okay, is it true or not? And, and obviously, you know, uh, since I, you all know my stance on it now, um, I decided for myself, which I think is very, very important for people in their, their lives. Decide for yeah, yourself. Yeah. But at the same time, though, I also do think that be, being open-minded, I also think that being open-minded can definitely be a g good thing. Yeah. Like that, well, you know, say that, for example, say if I'm at the gym and if I'm doing something wrong, you know, say if I'm not doing my squats right, if I'm, if I like say if I'm not in the right position, well, and then say if a trainer comes in and shows me, hey, you're doing this wrong, and I just want to show you this, and and of course with being open minded, you, you and then can learn from what you did was wrong. One of the ways how I see it is that failures always are biggest teachers in life, and I'm also not saying that Cody like that you have to believe in evolution either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I personally, I think is once you try, once you try, I'll, I'm always trying to learn new things. I, I think once you stop trying to learn things and you and you you can't really grow anymore. You, you, you always gotta try to learn new things, even if not not agree with it or not. Like keep on moving your expanding your mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a I have some just a question for Eric, just like about okay. like interpreting. Genesis specifically, because how do you, how do you go about getting the creation account to, um, kind of like describe evolution? Like I pointed out in the debate, I mean they're backward in every detail. I mean just like from what evolution says to what the clear text of Genesis says, they really are backward. So, but how do you go about it? Like just interpreting. Well, there are many different ways how to interpret it. And I also know that people like Ken Hamill will say, oh, well, they're just trying to force millions of years into it. And, but, you know, but the ways of how that I personally look at it, kind of like the whole thing with Copernicus about the immovable earth, the pillars on the earth. Um, it basically was just people just uh, trying to, you say, okay, maybe there's something that we're missing from this. I I'm in, I actually would personally argue like that they're trying to understand scripture better I mean, it's because science has actually helped us uh, better understand some parts of the Bible before. And I also know that people like Ken Ham will say, oh, well, you know, the uh, virgin birth. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, you know, to be perfectly clear, no theistic evolutionists, no old earth creationists will, will ever, you know, and none of them like will ever will argue, you know, and, and about that. Um, it's because of course, like with us being a theist and, you know, with God being all powerful, God can, you know, God can intervene whenever he wants to, because he's so powerful. I don't think that he has to necessarily all the time. And there's so many different interpretations like that. Honestly, in our lifetime, we may or may never even know now. Mama, now you could take one interpretation of it, but you don't have to. And, and so that was what that they learned from like Copernicus and uh, the earth being the center of the universe. And now just me personally, Mama, now, like I said, I decided for myself. I personally think that biblical scholar uh, John Walton actually makes a lot of very, very good points by the fact that we have to understand the Bible in its ancient context. We have to 
you have to understand their whole culture. And you know, from all the studies he has done, back then, the ancient people during that time, they weren't thinking about where matter comes from. And they weren't thinking about any of that. They weren't thinking about you know material creation or anything. Back then, they were more so interested in, in how things functioned. Uh, um, and so um, basically, John Walton's uh, uh, Cosmic Temple inauguration is uh, pretty much, um, it's the seven day uh, temple of, uh, it's a seven day temple of like God assigning function to everything. And I even brought up no sun till the fourth day. Well, just by this particular interpretation, um, it's just that that particular interpretation uh, pretty much indicates like on the fourth day, like was when God assigned a function to mm -hmm. the sun. And um, now and then now and certainly, uh, of course, I'm not saying that you have to take this interpretation, but it's just that one of the reasons why that I, I guess, got convinced of it is because that he makes very, very good points about how we should read it in the ancient context we we, we we like shouldn't just rely on english translated versions of the bible and now of course i'm not saying never ever read a english translation of the bible i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that don't strictly rely on, yeah, i'm yeah. just saying just don't rely on that it's because if you rely on a plain reading of the bible well like i said on saturday night like because it mentions unicorns and uh, psalms you know, one of the most important aspects of interpreting the Bible, study the context. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, when you look, look, look into the context, when it, when it mentions unicorns in Psalms, it's actually talking about a rhino. And so, and... Uh, Something and like a rhino, rhino, yeah. yeah. Um, I know it was a particular rhino. I forgot its name off the top of my head, but... Uh, has to have one but the, <laughs> right but, but it's just but it's just like that the bottom line is it's talking about a rhino it isn't rhino talking about what rhino 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 yeah right yeah and so that you can say that in a way the unicorns do exist kind of yeah it's uh yeah it's just that i know that there's a lot of disagreement with age of the earth uh, within christianity and you know and you know, and people are allowed to have their interpretations, but it's just that, you know, mom, in order for you to be saved, you don't have to go with this particular inter interpretation. And I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of like with all the differences within Catholicism and Lutheranism and et cetera, you know, you know, all of them may have their differences uh, about some things, but the bottom line is we all believe in the same god yeah um so kind of interesting i guess though because like in genesis um it's uh it doesn't really say god it says elohim um which actually is plural you know would you be against someone interpreting that it was actually multiple gods that created the heavens and the earth because well, you know well i mean I mean, the bottom line is, um, it's not really any of my business, like what other people's b beliefs are. Uh, I would actually say it's probably not reasonable to interpret that as support. Well, I policy. agree. And, I agree. Yeah. And my reason there is that, um, if I am remembering correctly, and it's been a while since I pulled out my Hebrew Old Testament, but if I remember correctly, the verb forms used when Elohim is the subject are still singular. So while Elohim is morphologically plural, it does not seem to be grammatically plural from the standpoint of the text. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've heard two. I've heard two different theories, uh, hypotheses, or theories about that. One, one of them, like in like like in the like Genesis account, one or two. I forget which one what it is, but like when he said, "Let us go down and create men in our image." One of them, he, God's talking to the one person. God talking to the angels, telling them to do this, and then one uh, other theory is God's talking to Himself in the Trinity version. Yeah, that's the two main interpretations. The um, in Judaism, they really hold to the angel, like talking about the host of heaven, like let us, like me and the angels. And then the, the more the Christian view is, it was well, just Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us go down. And then um, 
we see um, he stops referring to himself as us once the Holy Spirit is with Abraham, which is pretty good evidence, I would say. But this is only, I've never heard anyone say that. I'm just saying, I notice like once, a, once God is with Abraham, he stops referring to himself as us. And so maybe it's because the Holy Spirit is with Abraham and um, now they're kind of separate, so to speak. I mean, not separate, but you know what I mean. So now it's, we would stop saying us because us isn't really all together. <laughs> I've never heard anyone actually give a a reason for why he stops referring to himself as us. I've just heard for why he refers to himself plural, you know. I think Trinity is the best answer, but um, yeah. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the hermeneutics are pretty clear in um, I mean, I saw this person says that's easy. The Bible isn't meant to be taken literally, but like just that, I've heard that probably like twenty-four million times, and I agree. The whole Bible isn't meant to be taken literally. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah like, 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 do you, do you, like, like that reminds me. We talked about this earlier off before something started, but like the, like, do you think the Bible says the Earth is flat, and you think the Earth, you think the Earth is flat? Um. So, no, I don't think the earth is flat, and I think it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, the That's Bible's not teaching a flat earth at all. But especially in Job, when it talks about the horizon setting the separating the, the darkness from the light, which would only work on a sphere, but, yeah. I have, I've heard, oh, sorry, well, Eric? Uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, Cody, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, didn't you ask me, uh, like, uh, um, and didn't you, uh, didn't you or somebody in the chat on Saturday um, ask uh, me like wh wh what I think that the Bible says about the age of the earth in general? I don't remember. Sorry. Um, all right. Well, you know, let's just say that I should say that my memory is correct. Um, yeah. Let's just say theoretically. Um, you probably might remember in my opening statement with my to debate with Ken Hovind uh, after that whole year of after the whole year of research about dinosaurs and the Bible, you know, just being honest, um, it just led me to the conclusion like that the Bible was more concerned, like with the more am uh, it's more concerned like with like the more important as uh, aspects of Christianity it is a fact that you know is to tell you. Essentially, like uh, who God is, man. It's to set up the relationship between. Humans yeah, and I God. remember. You, or I think I remember on Age of your video with Merrick Kaiser. You were talking about the Bible is more for getting people saved. Yes. Well, I mean, I think I think that's how I think we think it's more important to get people saved. I mean, Bible itself. I think on every topic, it's equally important. But like. For salvation, which is most important to humans, that's where we think it's definitely most important, and that's what most of the New Testament is about, you know. Um, but I think I think on topics of history, I think it's perfect; it doesn't get anything wrong. I think on cosmology, it never gets anything wrong. Um, I know a lot of people say, well, "What's like?" It talks about has flat Earth passages, but then they always point to like Psalms, and then right after, which is poetry, and then right after poetry, where it talks about pillars of the earth, and it talks about God having wings. It's like, well, no, this is poetry. It's 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 you're not supposed, you're not supposed to take it literally. This person says, so so we just take the convenient parts literally, or well, no. What I said was, I don't take the whole Bible literally because if I did, I, that would I would need to take an English class again. So I take the literal parts literally, and I take the poetic parts as poetry, and I take the prophetic parts as prophecy. And I take the um, just like the instruction parts, like you know, like proverbs, like wisdom, which is also poetry. But like stoning you know. somebody for working Saturday, you don't take that literally either, probably. No, I I do take the Old Testament law literally. But when you study Christian theology, as Jesus said, all those laws were fulfilled through Him, and He gave us two commandments afterward. Now we only live by two laws: love God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we don't we don't actually do those Old Testament laws, but before the Messiah came and fulfilled those laws, then we would have done those, but those aren't for us today. So I do take them literally, as everyone did, but I don't actually do them because they're not for us. And I was want to chime in like about what you said eh, about like the cosmology in the Bible, but yeah. what we have to understand is like that the ancient people's cosmology 
like has a heck of a lot different I like than our cosmology now. Mom oh yeah. Mom. I mean, so the thing about science, um, you know, a key characteristic about science is like that it's willingness to change when new evidence arrives. I, I, I'm a so, and then what might have been accepted as the scientific consensus back then is, of course, different now. Men also will be different in the future. You know, there are some things that we accept now that may not be true, but at the same time, though, you know, just because I say that, it also has an automatic mean that <coughs> we accept now is not true. Like, of course, you know, gravity has been something that's been accepted for mm -hmm. the longest time, and it's pretty much 99.9% .9 impossible that gravity's ever going to be dis disproven. Um, and so, yeah. so it kind of goes back to what I said, you know, you, you have to hook into it the way how they viewed it. I don't actually think so when it comes to biblical cosmology. So I, I, I agree that I think the authors of the Bible, yeah. like Job, probably thought we lived on a flat disc, even though, um, you know, a flat disc with a dome, you know, that cosmology. But even though I was actually watching an interesting um, episode of like a Christian apologist talking about like the firmament and stuff. And he was actually saying how there's actually a little evidence that the um, ancient Babylonians and people in the Mediterranean area actually believe in a flat earth. But even if they did, I'll gladly accept it. Like I, I'm perfectly fine if the psalmists believe that earth is flat. Here's here's what here's where I, I differ with a lot of apologists. I don't think what the Bible itself is describing is a flat earth dome cosmology i think it's describing accurate and so far it's been accurate but i think the authors themselves probably thought they were writing down under the inspiration of the holy spirit probably thought they were writing down like flat earth cosmology but it's obvious that it couldn't be flat earth it, it, con it would contradict itself but you know so i don't like there's mike what's his name um michael heiser is that his name yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, michael he, yeah he thinks that the Bible really did write down just erroneous cosmology, even though not in Job, that's for sure. But um, so he says, just accept the erroneous cosmo cosmology, but then the rest of the Bible isn't erroneous. Well, if that's true, then like the Bible is wrong just just within um day two of creation. <laughs> so I mean, when it talks about the firmament, right? So I mean, no, I definitely don't. I don't think that at all. I think it's entirely accurate. Um, even if it goes against what what modern scientific community says i think that i mean like all the science in seven in the 1700s by the 1800s it was all like 90 percent of it wasn't even accepted. it was disproven i mean cosmologies come and cosmologies go it's not like you just accept one thing oh the bible's wrong because the bible is really good at correcting people and on the in science and history and theology you know what I, mean? I mean you're christians you already know that but um but i mean that's why in my debate, I'm always saying make the Bible the standard. And for someone who doesn't do that, it's going to sound like circularity. But, you know, make the Bible the standard because science comes, science goes. But um, not the Bible. I actually have a little question about that. If, sure. If it turns out that you're wrong about your interpretation of the Bible, and mm -hmm. it's an interpretation that's cons – like I, I would say that in many cases there are interpretations of the Bible where there's more than one – uh, interpretation that conflict with each other, but that don't necessarily conflict with the text. If you were in a situation like that, and your standard weren't judging it based on reality, then how would you ever know if you were wrong about the Bible in a situation where more than one interpretation could be viable? Man, I was want to chime in on that. It kind of goes what I said during my opening with Ken Hoven a little bit. You know, I, I was saying that you know, like that it's a false dichotomy about the age of the earth. And it's kind of like when people in the 1980s, I forget their names, but yet, yeah, you, you know, it has happened. At, and if you're curious, who can do the research yourself? People said that, I believe 1984, saying, that, oh, well, Jesus does not return in 1984. Well, then Christianity is not true. But, you know, but the thing is, what I'm a Christianity... It depends on the absolute most. I mean, I'm sure that Cody will, will agree whether or not if Jesus really did rise from the dead. Christianity holds by that we to be the string. If yeah. Jesus did not rise from the dead, 
the yeah, that's definitely the main, the, definitely the main thing. Yeah, Honestly, I guess I, I would say it's the only thing. No matter what else is true, if there's a guy named Jesus who died in Jerusalem on a cross and then on Friday and then Sunday he wasn't dead anymore, that's it. Christianity is at its fundamental point true. If it's not, then no matter how else, no matter how true anything else in the Bible might be, then it's Christianity at its core isn't true. Yeah, I mean, to me, inerrancy of scripture is also a big deal. You know, like um, how Jesus um, said that his law would never, his law meaning the scriptures, would never, never go away, would never be lost. And so to me, if there, if we did, and I study textual criticism, and I believe in inerrancy of scripture. And I know that there has been things added by scribes, and we know what they are, but um, like we, if we were to lose and know we've lost scripture, I would say Christianity probably isn't true. But that's probably not enough for some people. I'm actually thinking about trying a. Uh, I'm planning a video involving textual criticism because it's yep. uh, it's a very interesting field about doing things like uh, manuscript families and tracing scribal errors through copyists and things mm -hmm. like that. I love it. So actually, if you have any particularly good books or anything you recommend, I would love to get recommendations Just, on that. I have a person to recommend. I have oh? a person with that wrote a hundred books. He's um massive um in textual criticism he's translated bibles he, he's amazing so his name's um it's dr james white i'm if, familiar with him okay I just, lived, he, he lives before, pretty close to me oh yeah really yeah i live very close oh, to dr. James this yeah, interview he, him <laughs> oh i i have thought about it um because the the textual criticism angle is a very interesting one and um but one of the interesting things is the way that we reconstruct um, family trees for Bible manuscripts mm -hmm. is the same technique that's used to reconstruct genetic family trees for different organisms. Because they both involve copying errors being carried forward. Well, yeah, well the um, tracing Bible manuscript families and all these things, it's a lot more. It's really, really like unique it's its own total study um it's not oh, like it it's is. yeah it's not like it's just parallel with um, it it's actually very strongly parallel though because in both cases you look at where you can see evidence of in certain groups or areas we have yeah. changes I, i'd probably agree are inherited with that. by daughter or child lineages if we don't want to sex it it's actually it's a pretty that's a pretty good example of yeah. i never thought about it like that it also happens with, we also do a similar thing with language families. Like the reason yeah. that we know that uh, English and Hindi and Pashtun and Latin and Greek and French and German are all Indo-European languages is because we can <laughs> sound, yeah. certain and certain sound and lexical changes through time in different locations, just even without having uh, written examples of older languages, we can still do it just with the modern languages because we can trace back those changes. And so yep. we can reconstruct the most likely form of Proto-Indo-European uh, words in a similar way that we can use textual criticism to trace yes. back the likely uh, original form for various texts. And of course, just like with biblical crit criticism or textual criticism, sorry, uh, with linguistics, uh, and with doing the same thing with genetics, there's always going to be some cases where it's like, it could go either way on the, the initial reading of whatever this is. Yeah, there's so a I, lot of stuff like that in textual criticism. Yeah, and I think that the, the thread that connects all three of those things is um, oh. it's genetic descent. And by genetic, I don't mean in the sense of DNA. I mean in the sense of like, all of these things are growing by being reproduced in an organic fashion. Like, uh, languages grow and change organically as populations of speakers move around and slowly change the way they speak and split into mm -hmm. separate groups of speakers and they start changing differently in different places. And the same thing is true for uh, texts. You know, if you look at the Bible, these yep. scribal additions or errors or deletions or whatever start to accumulate as the Bible is copied and certain copies are based on other copies and a different copy is based on a different copy. And so that's yeah. an organic change and the same it's, thing actually, it's like like organisms. yeah like um because the the manuscripts they're all they all go their own separate ways and they become different things so the, the text the criticism involves 
what did the original writer write, you know? So right. you're, and, so it's like looking at all those textual variances that, that right. have been spread out through all the continents and you're seeing, it's like, it's really hard, <laughs> but and, it's uh, cool. And uh, that was why that on Saturday, I, I thought that I should uh, present uh, uh, this article in my opening about interpreting uh, Genesis. Um, I mean, if you, um, hey, you, uh, you, you want, to, you, can, you, want, you can screen share that if you if it's on your computer. Or just, you, let's just have a paper of it. Uh, yeah, um, it's. I don't know how well you, you guys can uh, see it. Yeah. I, yeah, and so um, I can't really make that out, but maybe if I were on my bigger screen, I don't know. Um, um, if you want Dapper, um, I, I actually can send you a link to the paper itself, like on Twitter, and I can even do the same thing for the rest of I you. Mean, I'd, be, I'd be interested in it. Yeah, uh, or look at look, 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 look in the chat, and I can put look in the chat. I can put in the description. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so pretty oh, much yeah. what the paper talks about it is pretty much about how we need to be cautious with interpreting Genesis. We have to understand. Uh, like that it was not written in modern day english and if we misread it it actually can my mom it actually can lead to denial of you know of science and and, and including evolution and, and i know that cody you know will d d disagree on that and that's fine but it's just well, but speaking it's just, of james white he he thinks he speaks hebrew and greek and german he thinks that the the hebrew in genesis is literal it's supposed to be taken six 24-hour days fundamentally because that's what the hebrew suggests with with yom and just the overall writing style of whoever wrote it right but um i don't know that you'll disagree but on um, the paper word yom can actually mean a lot of different things yeah. even though that mom and even though you could interpret it as a 24-hour day and you know and i man, i'm not saying like that you shouldn't because I say so. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like that also it also could mean always, it could mean a go, it could mean a lot of things. And now at the same time though, I'm also not saying oh well, you know, the Bible speaks of the earth being old. It's because, you know, just by me personally, by the the decision that I made, I don't think yeah. that the Bible speaks of how old the earth is at all. And I'm not trying to be redundant, but it's just that, you know, I, I, it's just not what the Bible is concerned about. Yeah, it's not. But um, with Yom itself, like I, I agree, it can be used in many ways, just like yes. day in English can be uh -huh. used in many ways in, in one sentence. But yes. it's the context that defines what it means. And mm -hmm. even, even in... I mean, in Genesis itself, defies that day is light and then the darkness is night, meaning an ordinary day. And it goes off to say there was evening and there was morning marking the day. And then with a numerical day and saying first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. And in Exodus 20:11, God says, because I made the I made the sea and everything in the world in six days. Therefore, you're going to work in six days and you're also going to rest on the seventh day. So, I mean, it's the context that easily defines Yom, and um, it, it's it's really not, like, that hard to figure out. But the reason that there's motivation to change or reinterpret that, that word Yom is because people don't like a literal his, a genesis. But the truth is, the Hebrew, from all I've done, I don't study, I mean, I don't speak Hebrew, but I've studied specifically with the creation. And it really does seem to suggest, and I know there's obvious, obvious presupposition, but it really suggests six 24 hour days just based entirely on context but then every time it's referenced in the bible it also means six days there's no way you get errors i would never say um six days meaning six years unless it was like prophecy but um like i i know they always say we don't know how i mean no one struggles with day and the rest of the bible jonah was in the whale for three days why does no one struggle with that time period? Joshua, seven days as well, he marched around Jericho. No one struggles with it because there's no motivation to get it to say something else that they would prefer it to say. But evolution and old earth and, and local flood believers, they want the creation to not be so, something so quick and miraculous and rapid, but they'd prefer it to be, um, they'd prefer it to be, something very naturalistic or just long ages time periods but i've this hebrew scholars are so divided on that topic that there's no way to reference scholars i mean for every 
every scholar that says it's literal days, there's another scholar that says it's it can mean long periods of time, but again, it's that context. In, in Hebrew and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and in the English and every language, it's very clearly meaning six 24-hour days. Um, and with me going with the Cosmic Temple inauguration, I actually would agree like that, that it was six like that that was six literal 24 hour days but at the same time though i would just say that those were days and like when god decided like to assign function but uh, mm -hmm. but you also have to understand and like that you know kind of like what i said you don't i mean you don't have to go with that interpretation and um, i mean you i mean you certainly can but and you also have to understand and like that these biblical scholars actually are studying the they actually are studying the uh, um, they actually are studying the context of it and uh, oh yeah oh yeah and I how that we're going off topic a little bit I'm sorry but, but, but there is this question I was wanting to ask you me yeah okay so you mentioned during the debate and you didn't clarify it and I was wanting to ask but you know but I got caught up with other things so you said that you were convinced by some of the dinosaur carvings uh which ones some of them uh i guess i would have to share my screen then like again i'm not convinced Mom by would, one of them mom and would one of them be like the alleged uh sauropod on the um, uh rock wall i mean honestly i can't really i think that i know what you're like talking about though for me. yeah Say what? um Dapper? That looks like a blue circle, not a dinosaur. Yeah, well, we can't really uh, see the. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I can't. I can't really see the thing, but I'm not uh, sure, honestly. Uh, maybe this one will be. That's the, the, I've seen that one. Yeah, I'm. I, I think it's Tiger. convincing. But when you look at the context, um, it all that it actually is is just a bunch of. Well, I mean, I have. Well, that's the the, the I, picture I, on the paper. Honest. I mean, I. I have the actual thing here, the actual picture, the enhanced, like, What's that showing. called? Um, this, uh... Like, what if I wanted to find an image, what would I search? I'm pretty sure it's found in Utah, I believe. Um, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but uh, I'm pretty sure it shouldn't be too hard. I mean, if it's from Utah, I think it's probably just a picture of a snake trying to eat some fries with fry sauce. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's but like I'm at, I'm looking at the actual picture of the wall, and okay, that what was on the paper is not it's not there. So, so it's just, no, it, and it's just the thing is, you know, on the original wall, you actually can vaguely see it. Um, and um, and uh, so and then like some uh, stuff under the dinosaur, but like it's very clear that there's a difference between what was on the paper and what's actually on the wall. Like it's very obvious that this is something. The looks if it's not a dinosaur it looks at least just like one long tail four legs under long neck little head but you also have to understand that a core in a sauropod anatomy uh sauropod's tails actually did not drag like that um sauropod's tail is actually like yeah i know they sway like a cedar <laughs> which i point out to well, you about actually no they, they they were much too stiff to sway like a cedar yeah i know well, and that's why like cedars are stiff Actually, no. You, uh, it's not Middle the branches. Eastern, Middle Eastern cedars are actually rather wispy and go back and forth a lot. American cedars are quite stiff, but they're not the same species, and it's very so, unlikely. Yeah, the tail tail is, to the American cedar. Yes, the tail um, of the behemoth. It, it's, it's like there's different ways to translate, but all of it simply just says sways or it erects or it stiffens like a cedar and then someone in the chat i didn't get to respond they said like in the in the debate they said that's just they were using the king james english translation without going to anything else and they were like see it's talking about testicles and stuff it's like yes that was the king james translator's interpretation let's look at the hebrew and of course the hebrew doesn't even i've looked at the masoretic text the septuagint sentinel apologetics is trying to convince me this on facebook i'm like dude i'm looking at all the hebrew it's not there, Ugh. but um, but again, I'm not necessarily trying to argue that the behemoth is a specifically sauropod, but I think it's obviously some sort of dinosaur. 
So if it's not a sauropod, um, since you said obviously it has to be a dinosaur. So if not a sauropod, what is it then? And then also, like I point out, did it, Mom, it says that it has a nose that pierces through snares. I don't know of any dinosaur that has a nose that pierces through snares at all. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I just have a better question. Step back for a second. What animal is this then? Uh, You're an evolutionist. That a question for me? Yeah. Well, um, because of the nose that pierces it through snares, I, you know, just, I just personally think that that's, you know, I just personally think it's an elephant. And, um, and um, you, you know, it also talks about how it has strong bones. Or, well, elephants have strong bones too. And, and they kind of have to is because of the fact that um, they weigh so much. I mean, then when they run, you kind of wind if they didn't have, Mom, if they didn't have strong bones well, when they run, you, you know, of course, their bones would break. And um, many, even like I said about the uh, tree being mentioned, um, it's not describing what, what the tail looks like. It's just describing the movement and the cedar tree that existed during the cedar tree that exists during Job's day is the Lebanese cedar tree. And the Lebanese cedar tree looks just like a tail of an elephant. Um, and mm -hmm. also moves like one. That they're also right, and it moves high like an elephant's tail. And there also are some people who say that behemoth is a rhino or, or a hippopotamus. <laughs> I mean, I can, I guess I can get where they're coming from, but you know, but just me personally, I, I know personally, where they're coming from. They're coming from Africa. it can only be some. They're coming from it can only be something modern or something that coexisted with man because they don't like when it says they don't like the idea of it being something that. Is like a dinosaur. Oh. Like, I mean, your description of okay, there, there's something animals. you said a whole bunch of times, and it's that so, someone doesn't like this, so they're interpreting it in a way that is. Yep. So hang on, hang on. With this, but I know, I know, is, but hang on. You can't Eric? impute yeah, whether what? or not these people like these things. I would much rather have sauro have behemoth be a sauropod. Right. No, I'm saying I'm not saying you literally like don't like it. I'm not saying you literally don't prefer it. I'm. What I mean by that is just in general, you you don't you. You can't have it that way. You need it to be something else. So the motivation is to change it. Hard I don't not need it to be anything. I'm just saying that there no, is. You would no not have. You listen, listen. You would not ever accept that being a dinosaur in Job's day because it contradicts your theory. No, you would not. I that, absolutely would. No, because you one, wouldn't. A sauropod, a late surviving sauropod, doesn't contradict anything about anything. It's just unlikely. And second, no, listen, yeah, in, it's order, to, in like order to come up with an unusual interpretation, you have to have good evidence. And the fact is that the animal described isn't clearly a sauropod. And we don't know that there were sauropods in the area at the time, whether or not the story of Genesis flood Could it be any dinosaur? It, it could, but at the same but time, no. Any dinosaur is the least likely explanation. Well, it's not the least likely explanation because if the young Earth interpretation is correct, well, then that would, it would why would God be talking about an elephant when he's talking about the chief of the way? Or like the description you describe for an elephant doesn't fit at all; it only fits for some things. But another time, it doesn't really work. Like, okay, let's assume young Earth creationism is true. Dinosaurs got off the ark. We don't know how long go. they lasted. We don't know exactly when Job was written, nor do we know whether or not there were dinosaurs there. If God wants to impress Job. With a big animal, he's not going to use an animal that Job hasn't heard of. We don't know. How do you know Job dinosaurs. hasn't heard of dinosaurs? That's we, that's all. You I'm just based a case. Do. Yes, you you literally just no, said I'm, Job probably doesn't know. Therefore, why would God say? No, I said Job. Job look at I said doesn't God know. Use a and I have a better. I have a better know. question. Why would why would God use use an no, animal? You know what? That's I'm really going to finish not... my point, and then you can ask your question. Since we don't know if there were dinosaurs around at the time and place that Job was written. But we have really oh good God, reasons bro. to say that we don't know, do know that there were elephants and hippos and rhinos at least nearby. We can say it's very likely that Job knew what an elephant was and what a hippopotamus mm -hmm. was and what a rhino was. It's less likely he knew what a sauropod was because we have no evidence of there being sauropods in historical times in the Middle East. Well, listen, listen. Okay. Now you can ask okay. your question. Well, I don't remember what my question was specifically. Sorry. I guess it would be for Eric. So, um, okay. Um, the, there's a lot of, Job 40 really describes this creature in detail. So first off, do you, so do you think this was a, like actual animal, was it mythical? 
So um, I heard that there is some debate whether or not if Job, the, the, the whole thing about Job was uh, like if it was just the whole thing is just supposed to be a parable or if it's something that really happened. Just my own personal opinion. I do think that it, I, I personally do think it did happen, but I just kind of think it's just described in just a metaphorical way, you know, like think, you know, say how that I'm going to tell you the event about when I woke up this morning. I'll say that, oh, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And uh, um, and so, like I said, with me loving dinosaurs, I would love Behemoth to be a dinosaur. Yeah, man, it kind of goes back to what I said. It's, the bottom line is scientists are, are not trying to, you know, they're, they're not trying to take it away from God. Um, you know, it's uh, not like that scientists say, oh, well, we have to have dinosaurs living millions of years before man. It's because, you know, we wanted to disprove the Bible. That's not it at all. The bottom line of a scientist is let the evidence bring you to your conclusion. And regardless what your presupposition is, you have to let the evidence bring you to your conclusion. And like I said, I would love, I, I would love Behemoth to be a dinosaur. Men out of all people, I would love it to be a dinosaur, but just honestly, after looking at the context and, and just examining like the creatures that lived, you know, like in Job's day, when it mentions the chief of God, I understand that some young earth creationists will say, well, it has to be a sauropod, but we also have to understand that in that area, the, the um, I forget the elephant's name, but um, in that area, there actually is a species of elephant like that was the largest in that spot. And so that's one of the reasons why that I think it's an elephant. And another reason, it also says that he lieth under the shady tree or some sort of tree. I forget the name off the top of my head. Okay, so if you were to say that it's Argentinosaurus, which is the, the, the largest sauropod ever found, I mean... No joke, a hike, just a vertebrae of an Argentinosaurus alone is about half the size of my bed. Um, so to think that if an Argentinosaurus were even to lie down underneath the, the shady tree or, or whatever, it just wouldn't work. It's because of just how enormously huge it was. But yet you wouldn't have that problem with an elephant rhino or a hippopotamus or or etc and uh and like i said a sauropod dinosaur or any dinosaur does not have a nose that pierces it through snares and uh and and you know and honestly does it bum me out that uh behemoth is not, not a dinosaur yeah but, you know, just honestly, after hooking the evidence of seeing when in the fossil record, when sauropods went extinct, we're not saying that, oh, well, it's flat. And, and, oh, well, we're saying it's possible. It's because we want it to be that way. That's not the job of, of a scientist. I mean, even with the coelacanth, people thought for the longest time like that the coelacanth like was done for. And hi, Simba. <laughs> And oh yeah, so, so I was to talk about the coelacanth. Um, sorry, it's just that my dog here kind of. <laughs> you want to be a guest star? But yeah, so um, God darn you, Simba! And that's how we got a hundred new viewers. The dog came on camera. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Simba, say hi. Story one, and so uh, moment. So evolution does not say. Oh, hell, a species has to go has to go extinct by this certain time frame. I also know that there are young earth creationists who actually use the coelacanth as an argument against evolution, saying, oh, well, it hasn't changed at all. Which it has. Yes, and it has actually. Um, there actually has been coelacanths found in the Paleocene and Miocene. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dapper. Um, I don't I'm know sure any Miocene coelacanths, but I know... I'm pretty sure there was a Paleocene or a Pliocene. So uh, the way I remember the fossil record for coelacanths, and I, again, my wheelhouse is more in Mesozoic or near the Dyrens, so coelacanths are a bit outside of that area. Right. Just a little bit. 
But um, from what I remember, uh, the last coelacanth fossils known were in the Cretaceous, and they do not occur hmm. above the KPG or the KT or whatever we want to call it now boundary. Uh, but that no fossil coelacanth is in the same family as the modern coelacanths. Right, and um, the current explanation is that the coelacanths that we have were all shallow water organisms, which preserve fairly readily, whereas deep water organisms tend not to preserve very well, and even when they do, because oceanic crust tends to be uh, subsumed under the mantle so frequently, we tend not to get very old fossils from uh, deep water marine sediments, because they're just rare in general, which is why deep water animals are the ones that are most likely to end up being Lazarus taxa in the modern day. Hey, um, hey, real fast, Cody, somebody has a question for you. Yeah, Chat. I wanted to answer um, about the gap theory. So gap theory is basically that there, there's, a, there's a millions or hundreds of thousands of years right. between the first and second verse of Genesis. And so then that's, that was, um, the idea came up in the 1800s because Christians were kind of concerned about what to do with all the, the scientists that are saying the earth is billions or well, millions of years old. So they are like, oh, well, let's just take the text and put those years between the first two verses of the Bible. And so, and it, the problem is, um, it's, it's a sneaky theory. It's a sneaky theory. The problem is there's not really enough biblical evidence to support it at all. I think all it is is really just uh, what Christians were doing. They were just really compromising the text to fit what they thought was right. And it was... They didn't need to do that. So just another theory. It's no different than framework hypothe hypothesis or day age or progressive creationism or theistic evolutionism. In my opinion, it, the Bible it was written truthfully. It was preserved, pre preserved without any errors. Um, in the Hebrew, there's no problems with it. Um, in general, I mean, <laughs> but um, so we don't need to put year. You know, put we don't need to put millions of years between verses that aren't there it's kind of ridiculous and the other problem is well with that theory you have death before sin um you have all these major theological problems which is another reason i don't really buy it i i will admit to this guy um nice. gap theory is one of them is one of the best old earth reinterpretations i've heard but it's it's not enough there's just it's one of the best interpretations i've heard but there's not enough biblical evidence to support it so I just don't buy it. I just think it's totally stretching the text to say something. It's not in any way saying. I think it's pretty obvious what the text is actually saying. But yep. And so uh, I was wanting to get back to the coelacanth. I know that we're jumping back and forth. And so people need to understand like that fish fossilize a lot differently than dinosaurs do. Uh, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot easier um, for dinosaurs to fossilize. It's because of their bones are a lot harder. Um, the, the, the harder the bone is, the easier it is to fossilize. And so then that's why that there are some spots in the fossil record where you don't uh, see some particular, um, where you don't see some particular uh, organisms like the coelacanth. Yeah. But then it was eventually found in some of the Cenozoic layers like that. There were some coelacanths found uh, Mom, I can say that there were changes, but but they were just slow changes. Coelacanths hey. are known essentially as the slow pokes of evolution. Uh, sorry, real real fast. Can you, can you two questions? One one for one for you and one for Co 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 think for Cody. For uh, Cody, me. we're both with you. For a second, Co Cody, if you want to pay to the chat, you can answer questions in chat without actually having to answer it. If somebody's talking, you can answer questions in chat if you want to in the chat, mm -hmm. chat, live chat. If you pay attention to that, people asking you questions. And two, uh, are, I forget, are seal can't seal uh, seal can't is is that the species or the uh, family? And Corinthians is like the, I forget which is which. Uh, um, I, I can help with that. If, if I'm pretty not. sure that it's a. I'm pretty sure that it's a family. I'm I'm pretty certain that there, you know there's not just one coelacanth and it's kind of like how you know like, like that there's not just one uh, uh, like any organism you, you know it branches out um so, um you, you know like what like what dapper said i think that he can yeah so can see, like, so first we got to remember that 
words like family, order, class are all sort of that they don't mean a whole lot. Uh, genus and species kind of mean something, but uh, coelacanths are, if we include the fossil examples, they're all part of the uh, coelacanthiform order. And there have been a number of families. The only uh, family that is extant is uh, Latimeridae, and but there were numerous uh, extinct families from the fossil record. And as far as I know, I don't know of any extensive fossil record for Latimerids. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, coelacanths. In, if we if you were to go with crown coelacanths based on extant coelacanths, then only one family exists. But I would prefer to go with a more uh, character-based definition, uh, just because the uh, the taxonomy for coelacanths internally isn't super well uh, figured out. In part because of a spotty fossil record. So um, I just want to ask uh, Cody something. Okay. Um. So. Um, so, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you say that in your uh, podcast about the flood? Why I like that your family is also young Earth creationists. My podcast about the flood. Uh yeah. Um, it was the one that you did with Merrick and uh, one other guy. Oh, yeah. The just that little discussion we had about yeah, yeah. like if Noah's flood is global or local. Mm -hmm. Um, so my family is not young Earth creationist. Or that well, most of my family's not even Christian or anything. My dad's older, so my mom doesn't have a position. My mm -hmm. my sister recently yesterday she just called me and uh she was she called me and she was really mad at me. She was like yelling at me for thirty minutes over the phone for being Christian and interpreting Genesis, you know, for literally and so yeah, and so I oh, and and she hung up on me. What? Um uh, sorry for barging, uh but um I know it's not my business, but I am kind of curious. Um, so and is so and is like she an atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, or what? She told me she basically. I think she's agnostic. Mm -hmm. She's just mad at me for for saying that. I am trying. She's mad at me basically for, like, that I'm trying to help people interpret Genesis in the way that I think is the right interpretation. That's what this apology. Yeah. Right, but um, but like I said during the d d debate, um, um, I mean, now I'm not saying the hunger of creationism is doing this as a whole. You know, I don't have a problem with, with people being a hunger of creationists. When I talked to Mary Schweitzer about this on the phone, um, she has told me like that she had a bunch of her students who are. D devout Christians who would come and ball their eyes out to her thinking like, that they have to give up their faith because of all the overwhelming evidence that they see in evolution and in old earth feeling like that they have to give up their faith. Um, and so, and, you know, and there have been um, in uh, the majority of atheists actually were once Christians like Richard Dawkins, Hugo and Jake, uh, Heath, I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name. Heath Heith or something like that. Vice, um, Vice Rhino, Godless Engineer. Right, Godless Engineer. Oh, you mean the, the, the person who spells his name H I I T H? Yeah, 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 him. I heard him try to pronounce that name in one of his recent videos. He can't do it either, so don't feel bad. Yeah, and so I'm assuming that he did that on purpose as like a gimmick or something. Maybe. I don't know. I think it's supposed to be from some other language that he doesn't actually speak, but he likes the word. Because I remember. Right. I think, if I remember correctly, he had old channel art with something in like Sumerian or something. So, I think that's the thing. Some, which I've noticed now in pop pop culture, Sumerian is now the language that apparently your fictional demons speak. Is that's the now now the new hotness, which annoys me because why? Why would demons speak Sumerian? And so, like I was saying, um, one of the main reasons why that these Christians became an atheist is because that, you know, I like that they felt like that, oh, well, I had to choose one or the other. And so because of the overwhelming evidence, they just kind of felt like that, well, I'm going to have to 
well, I'm going to have to reject my faith now, leave it behind. And one of the reasons why that I do what, what I do, and I'm not saying that, oh, well, people have to be theistic evolution because I say so. Mitz just said, I'm just trying to say that, you know, if a fellow brother or sister of mine in Christ feels like that they have to give up their faith, now, and if someone's happy with being a hunger creationist, fine. I know, and if they're happy, I know I don't want to come, you know, overstep my boundaries or anything. I've even had Christian parents come up to me, tell me that they're horrified of taking their kids to the Museum of the Rockies, knowing that I go out on dinosaur digs, feeling like that I am the one who they should talk to, saying that, oh well, I'm, oh well, I'm afraid that if I take my kids there, it's going to take them away from God, and so. I don't want to overstep my boundaries. I don't want to be too dogmatic about it. I'll just say, hey, here are your options. And um, and the majority of old earth and theistic evolutionists were, they actually were once young earth creationists. And one of the reasons why that they came to those positions is because at one point they thought that they had to choose one or the other. Yeah, I think I made a video about this. Top, top, same topic of, of, of a few few years ago, but there's diff, there there were different layers to this. There's there's young earth creationist, old earth creationist, theistic evolutionist. Then there's like the deist evolutionist, and then there's just plain out atheist. Mm-hmm. Um, Remember what I said um, in the debate. In the debate, I said I have like there, I said you can be a Christian and believe right. in evolution. But the right. problem is you're going to be completely inconsistent because you're. You're accepting Jesus, you're a Christian, well, that's great. And that's going to lead to eternal salvation. But the problem is, the main problem is you're, accept, you're, you're, you're not accepting the logical foundation for why you accepted Jesus in the first place. You know what I'm saying? Theology is inconsistent if you're going to add all these interpretations to Genesis. It just, it's more than just, well, how, what does the text say? Well, it comes down to what's it do to theology? What's it do to the rest of the Bible? And it messes it up if it's not fundamentally interpreta- interpreted, in- interpreted, I mean to say. But, um, uh, but like, I'm, I'm not saying you can't be a Christian and right. believe in, you know, I, I think that'd be ridiculous to tell someone you can't be a Christian if you believe in evolution or whatever. But, um, like Billy Graham, what he believed in theistic evolution, you can believe in evolution and, right. Well, some Christian, people but... don't think that, like some people like like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham don't think that literally say you can't be a Christian. They never said that. They never said that. But like, the thing is, what I've noticed about Ken Ham is like that. Ken Ham, you know, and like that, he will try to make you feel bad, like for doing it. And like I said during my d- 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 debate, Ken Ham can believe whatever he wants. What he believes is none of my business. But when I saw that series, Science versus the Ark Encounter, it definitely made me rethink. And I'm not saying, Cody, you have to. I'm just saying, I, I, know, I know. recommend that you check I that think, out. And I, yeah. and I just want to chime on the theology. Yes, and I, I do agree that you do have to change your theology. But, you know, but personally, I don't see that as a bad you have thing. To change, just, you have to change the, the foundation for why Jesus died on the cross. You don't see any problem with that. Well, it's just that we have to understand Jesus died for us. Yeah, he died. He died on the cross and because of his death, that's paying our sins because yes. the death pays the sins because the death was brought in the world by sin. But if death exists before sin, then the death doesn't pay the sins. Therefore, Jesus' death on the cross doesn't pay our sins if evolution is true because then there was death before man sinned. That's the inconsistent theology. But like I said... It says death came to all men. It, um, and then on that day, Adam did not physically die. I know. He spiritually died. <clears throat> and yeah. so then that would explain it. Yep. He spiritually died. Um, and also, he died. And then also, death was brought into the world. Therefore, he actually died. Death. No, he died spiritually on the day. It says, in the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. So right, he ate. but Adam did not physically and, die. So then... After that, then here comes his curse. God's saying all the things he's bringing in the world. He's totally changing everything, bringing in the curse of Genesis. Do you know why Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head? It's because the curse of Genesis, he's wearing it on his head. He, the, the curse of Genesis was out of the ground, 
thorns and thistles shall grow for you. That's why Jesus wore thorns and thistles on his head. It's so theologically significant. Even if even if evolution is true, it's Christian theology is messed up if evolution is true. What I want to say, say it's messed up. It's just that you just, mom, it's just that you just have to look at it differently. Um, and like I said, just because one interpretation of uh, scripture says otherwise, it doesn't disprove Christianity. What does, whether or not Jesus really was who he said that he was. So, so Cody, question for you. I, 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 I relate. So do you think, if Bible's literally and stuff, do you think, and, and Adam and Eve didn't sit, do that fruit thing, would, would everyone born from then to now still be alive now? Like the whole... Well, the, the Bible doesn't specifically say what would happen, but it seems to be from the interpretation of Scripture, just the general interpretation that they were made to live forever, and then they sinned, so now death was brought in, so now they're not going to live forever. Yeah. So we'd be hanging out with Adam right now if, on, on Earth. If oh, I'm sure. I mean, he lived, he lived like 900 years. According to the Bible, he lived about 900 years, and most of the people before the flood did until the genetic bottleneck from Noah when it change then but yeah so we if well i don't think we would be alive because god said to fill the earth he didn't say to overpopulate the earth and i never got to respond to eric on in a debate about that it's like yeah if they live forever the instruction was fill the earth he didn't say overpopulate it so if i was to be part of that population i would see adam yeah based on the what the bible says i hope that helps uh yeah but um um I think we've been going on with this a little uh, bit long, at, and I also am getting kind of hungry now. And you know, and, yeah, um, me too. Yeah, and you know, and uh, trust me, if it uh, wasn't for that, if it wasn't for the time constraints, I definitely could go on. But it's just that you know, I don't want to starve myself. Okay, so, so as we wrap it up, you you you, you, you guys want to like like what's the word uh, promote anything any of your future stuff on your on your channels and stuff? Who wants to go first? I'll go last. You can go, Eric. You can go, Eric. All right. Well, I've had my YouTube channel for 10 years now. Um, I started my channel when I was spiritual but not religious. And so then that's why in my old videos, I would cuss like a sailor and everything. And uh, um, my YouTube channel originally started up as a movie channel. It's because of the fact like, that I'm a big movie buff. And um, there's a lot of horror movie stuff on my channel. And I, and I know that there's some disagreement about horror films and Christianity, but just me personally, I don't see a problem with it. Um, um, I, I don't know if Cody will uh, agree or not, but that's a topic for a different day. But um, on my YouTube channel, I do still you know, do movie stuff, but I also didn't want to get redundant about it. And so then that's why I branched off. I have done a few philosophical stuff on it. And I have even, um, and I have even like, um, and, I, and I've even done like some comedy sketches, like, uh, things like you that. hate. Uh, yeah, um, I have this series called Things That Piss Me Off, and you know, I, many you know, I, the, the whole joke of this series is by the fact that, about like how you know, it, in the series, I. Uh, I actually play an exaggerated, angry version of me. And, you know, and the whole joke of the series is, it's like, oh, my Lord, like, this guy is getting angry over, like, the silliest of things. And, yeah. uh, and, um, and there was a time in, like, when I would, like, do, like, a bunch of prank call videos. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, the funny thing was, like, during one of them, I actually used a site, like, called Prank Dial. Mom, it pretty much is like where you can use like a uh, a fake number and like to prank call someone else and like where it's like a voice automated thing. Well, the funny thing is on one of them, I just by a huge coincidence, I actually ended up calling this guy by the same number as his girlfriend. <laughs> 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 oh man, that was funny. I was laughing so hard. And so um, recently, because of my debate with Ken Hovind, I've been getting into a little bit more stuff about religion, but. Um, but because of the fact that not the majority of my audience are um, um, are Christians, it's because that when I started off my YouTube channel, I you know it wasn't about religion at all. So that's why in my videos about religion, um, 
I try to be careful with what I say. Um, it's because, of course, religion is a big topic, just like politics, abortion, and etc. And so, uh, and so, uh, so yeah. So my channel is definitely a variety of, of things. Um, and so, um, uh, Dapper and I also even said that we should like do a movie talk podcast or something like that. Sometime. Yeah, I actually, um, I am a partner in a movie channel that's just recently started. Uh, nice. The C Bad Show, C B A D D. Uh, I am one of the four people there, but we are open to having the occasional guest. So, um, yeah, I would awesome. be interesting. Um, yeah, I, awesome. I, I can volunteer for that. Okay. For schedule. I mean, it's not entirely up to me. I am only one fourth of the team. Uh, the, the rest okay. of the team, actually, 75% uh, <laughs> of the team is actually either on the stream or in the chat right now <laughs> because uh, Ben Tobin and Amos Marcos are also uh, 25%. And then Cheshire Vic, who you may recognize from some of Steve McRae's streams, is also uh, rounds out our four person. Connect team. Network connections. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so that's one thing I have to, to plug is check that out. Uh, we are mostly doing riff track style things. So a lot of our, for movies that we can't play on screen, which is most movies, we have an on screen time code. So you can check the time code of the movie you're watching to sync it up. And uh, we also have Manos, The Hands of Fate, and Night of the Living Dead, which we do show on screen and do have the full audio for the movies. So, Mom, so. When you say Night of the Living Dead, I mean, there are so, so many versions of it. The There's original. The version, yeah. Yeah, the, the original one, uh, it's in black and white and all. Uh, the only other thing yeah. I have really to plug is my name. 2006, that one was. That one yeah, was. No. Yeah, we'll pass on that. I mean, we might do it to make fun of it, but... Uh, my other thing that I have is my main channel. Um, I do mostly um, science-related content, and usually I use the misunderstanding of someone of some science involved as a launching point to talk about whatever the topic is. So if someone says something silly about astronomy, and I'll put that in as a clip, and I'll go talk about astronomy, or someone says something silly about evolution, and I'll do that. Combo, yeah, Bob. Right. Samurai Cop, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, Space Cop and Samurai Cop. Yeah, that those are those are things we're gonna have to get to. Um, as far as coming up, I am in the process of animating and rendering part three of a video series about uh, some Genesis apologetics material. Uh, I also am at the beginning of uh, a video talking about the law of monophyly in as it relates to both the past and the future. And I'm going to be using a uh, website that I quite enjoyed uh, to do it. And I just got permission from the website's creator. So that's actually gonna work out. Um, and I was informed recently that one of my viewers specifically alerted Kent Hoven to my channel. So <laughs> there may actually be some response videos from Kent Hoven to me, which I may end up responding to. So that, that could be live stream fodder, because as you might know, I do a series called Kent with Bent, with Bent Hoven here, where we um, we go live, and I live respond to Kent Hoven videos while getting uh, exaggeratedly upset. It's, it's sort of a character. I'm not you know honestly that angry, right. but it's, it's for comedic effect, mostly. Mom, it kind of goes back to what I said about my uh, things that piss me off series. You know, don't take it seriously. It's just a joke. And uh, and uh, I actually forgot to mention this. On uh, the 27th of this month, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast with uh, – I'm going to be doing a podcast with uh, Inspiring Philosophy. One of the reasons why that I thought I should do the podcast with him is because of the fact that it will be really interesting how, that we would do a podcast about both of our debates with uh, Ken Holbind. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So, so on the twenty seventh, I believe six or seven p.m. my time, which is a mountain time. You can look forward to that. I Man, it's okay. not the first time he has been on my channel. All right. So Cody, anything you wanna advertise for your coming up for you? Um, I don't have a lot online, but my YouTube channel is Cody Sorensen. Um, if you just type Cody, then S and O, you'll see it. Um, yeah, can you, that reminds, that reminds me, can, you put, can you put all your links in the in the chat so I can put it in the description? So I, I, I literally just it. have the YouTube. So, like, okay. I mean. I'll, I I'll, I I'm actually, I just found uh, Cody's 
Um, no, the pro you're going to see a lot of my old music um, when it was released with labels and stuff when you type my name, but the channel should be at the top. Um, actually, right, I just linked it, to Cody's channel. Yeah, you can link I'll it or whatever. I'll listen to your intro. I... Uh... It's a nice. That's a nice narration. Yeah, like somebody put the links, all the links in the channels. I can put in the description later on. Yeah, I'll just um, cool. Thanks. This. Anyway, but yeah, I kind, right. of, kind of would like to. I kind of would like to finally have my meal now. So I got, yeah, I gotta wrap it up. I'll wrap it up real fast. Yeah, I'm. I'm just uh, adding links. Okay. I'm starving. Like, okay. Me, me too. But anyways, join me. Uh, thanks for everybody being here. Join me this Saturday with my guest from last Saturday as we. As we talk about the conclusion of the Dr. Nopa series with Dr. Nopa V3, as I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye bye. Now I can finally go eat. Bye.